Hello. Morning. How's everybody doing? A little bit early today on purpose. I did not play Kerbal yesterday, and we need to make up for that. And we will today by playing a lot of it. By playing a lot of Kerbal, we are going to play a lot. It's going to be nice. More furred things. <sighs> no, not until next week. That's when the new dash is coming in. I got in contact with the seller. They're going to... Yeah, he's going to send it to the right address. I uh, bought the right gauge cluster. So now I have a spare set of gauges just in case those ones go, which is pretty cool. Sawyer, thank you for initiating this whole thing, because, dude, I probably wouldn't have gone and looked for attack either way, so. It's all good, man. All good. Okay. Just popping through. Were you able to get the shipping address? Yeah, I got that all figured out. Yeah, the guy was cool. He said, yeah, I'll send it to the right one. I'm like, I th thank you. Sorry for wasting your time. <laughs> so, yeah, that's good. Okay. So. I need a bigger fairing for my space program. And we do have the shuttle pretty much. The shuttle's getting there. It's pretty dialed in. Yeah. It's pretty dialed in. She's pretty good to go. Uh, so we're going to, we got it. We got to get the SRBs dialed in. Then what I want to do after is work on a shuttle derived launch vehicle. So the hammerhead fairing, uh, kind of. No, screw shuttle Z. No, no, we're not doing that. I want to do something like Ares 5. We need something kind of like Ares 5. Just don't, just, Ares 4 doesn't exist. This one. But we don't have five segment SRBs. See how the SRBs on Ares 1, Ares stupid, and Ares 5? They're a little bit longer because they're the five segs. We don't really have five segment boosters. So eh, we can't in that. Oh, hey, baby. The hurricane's going around it, by the way. They're just going to tie it down and it'll be good to go. We could do four, four segments. Or there is another. There's another plan. Direct. We could do something like direct. This was a slightly different shuttle-derived launch vehicle that was proposed by NASA as one of the things to replace kind of... to replace Constellation. They didn't do it because they opted for SLS. So what I'm thinking is that we could do some type of hybrid. See, it, the beauty of this is that it's KSP. I can do whatever I want. I don't really have to worry about fairing shape. I don't have to worry about fairing size. I don't, you don't really have to worry about structural loads or anything kind of crazy like that. So we can go a little nutty here. Why don't we take direct, something like direct, and then put put the EDS on top of it. <laughs> The Earth Departure Stage, just put that on top of it, which the Earth Departure Stage was basically an S4, S4B on steroids. There's no particular reason why we can't do that. There is absolutely no reason why we can't do that. That's Ares 5's upper stage, guys, so. Because I can't do this, right? And honestly, I, I think even if we somehow made an equivalent of this, it would be like righteous overkill for KSP. I don't really think I need 
I don't, I don't really think I need this. Now, I know people are going to say, what do you mean you don't need it? Okay, so let's just do some basic math out here. Um, our shuttle stack, with its configuration currently, can easily move 36 tons into space. It did it. It moved 36 tons of payload. And guys, the orbiter's dry mass is like 40, 50 tons? Somewhere in there? So, we're, we're moving with the shuttle and the stack we're moving a nutso amount of payload we're let's see 70 80 tons into space and that's that's basically with no up no third stage if we put a third stage on there i could make something like direct move like 100 tons into space i could make it move 100 tons into space with like i don't know uh With like a, I don't know, we could go with a five meter fairing or we could make it a, you know, we could make it an eight meter fairing. We could go big with this. Like, I, I think that making direct would be perfect to go with our shuttle. Honestly, it would be, yeah, that would be really good. Uh, that would work really freaking well. And I'd be able to get it, we'd be able to move about, like I said, about 100 tons into space. It would work just fine. Um, that is honestly what I need. I don't think I need to move 100 tons of anything into space if, unless we're moving fuel. You know? So, with our clocked-in SRBs, right? Actually, I had one of my buddies help me out here. We do need to do some SRB testing today. We're gonna put put we're gonna build a test stand for this, and by a test stand I mean an SRB with some clamps on it. We don't need to build the whole stack or anything. I gotta sneeze. <laughs> Turbocharger, getting cold out. <clears throat> hey Nick, what's going on? There's some really cool ideas, like putting the shuttle engines in a pod-like structure next to the fuel tank. Basically, the shuttle... Th You're talking about Shuttle C. Yeah, 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 yeah. Shuttle C is not a bad idea. And it was very close to actually being made. Like, to the point where they were making full-scale mock-ups out of it. That would have been great for building space stations, dude. That would have been really good for building for building stations and having like uh, transfer stages and stuff. But I'm not sure how they would have made this work. But like, if you think about it, think about a shuttle C moving an external tank into space, right? And then it has those airlocks. Like you could put airlocks on it, and you can have an airlock that goes that'll go down through into the external tank, right? And you can make a big wet workshop with it. That was one of the things that they proposed. Like, if you had an airlock facing downwards going into the tank, you could do that. I personally think the aft cargo carrier is a better solution, but... What do I know? So we're scrapping Constellation again? No. Not really. We're going to do Dirextillation. Dirextillation. So what I'm going to do... So, okay, Hellfish, look at it this way. I'm taking Direct and I'm making Constellation out of Direct. Because of the part could because of the part constraints in KSP, the boosters. If I had five segment boosters, we'd be doing that. Now I could make a five segment. We could fake it and make a five segment. We could do that, sure. But honestly, there's a pathway to with my architecture that goes into space where we really don't need to do it. We don't need to do that. I'm basically gonna do. I'm gonna make constellation with direct as the first as the core stage instead. I think we can do it. Like, so I'm not going to if we're looking at all these different variants of direct, the variance that we're going to make is this one right here. And this one right here. I'm not putting people on direct. No, 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 no. No, we're not doing that. 
I will put my Orion capsule that we have to build. That's going on Gemstone 4. Modded in the craft file for the 5 segment. We could do that too, Weed, if we really wanted to, and then fudge the craft file. Yeah, we could fudge the craft file and then make it look like a 5 segment if we really wanted to do that. Sure, why not? I mean, it's we kind of already are fudging this a little bit because this shuttle has 8 degrees of gimbal on it, like the real shuttle motors, but who knows? I mean, that's kind of up to you guys. I'm down for doing whatever. Either one of these would be cool. I like the idea of using the parts in KSP. I already feel bad about modifying the gimbal, but to be 100% honest with you, it just, it flies so damn good. It flies so good. I really don't want to, like, it's so worth it. It's so freaking worth it. it I like, I, oh, the temptation is too much. Hey, Flagon, how are you? So, if we go into stack prototype 3, and there's our old thrust curve. I'm just going to, we're going to start with those today. And we'll load up proto 4, and then I'll get the music going, because I haven't done that yet. These thrust curves that we were using weren't really working. So we will start with the shuttle launch here. I'll show you. Oh, we, you see in this thing, man? Hey, Sneaky. I love that damn thing. It's, it's, it's not okay. It's like... Not okay. It's ridiculous, man. Ridiculous. Oh, hey, Ozzy, what's going on, man? Gesundheit? Danke. Sorry, a little late there. We did a good job with this one, dudes. We did a good job. Found out that the muffler was a universal muffler that was connected via welded J-hooks. Yeah, most mufflers are welded with J-hooks. Alright guys, let's, uh, I want to show everybody, we'll start with an ascent just to make sure that this is working right. D minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, Four, three, two, one. Ignition. Come on, baby. She slewed a little bit. Does this still have 36 tons in there? Oh, we're using the old booster thrust profile. That's what it is. Houston, we've got a little bit of a problem here. Compensate for me, baby. Come on. And there we go. Bring her back. Bring her back around. There we go. She's good. I kind of like the idea of using what we have here because that ends up giving us something that, you know, is not like an exact copy. I think that's cool. No, that's not. Nah, it's... <laughs> 
I slept. <laughs> I slept. Today is going to be, the next couple of days are going to be crazy. I haven't touched it. I did get my gasoline fuel tank selector switch, which is good. thrust tail off here yeah see the SRBs last too long we got to tweak the curves on them a little bit but I had a buddy help me out here and I'm, I'm gonna have to read it but I wanted to show you guys just the, where we're at with launching the SRB separation is still kind of a little See how long they last, man? They really shouldn't last that long. But, uh, okay, all right. This is now a test launch. Ready? <laughs> they kind of worked. The Separatrons would have need to have lasted longer. That is what the SRBs do, guys. They do separate them while they're still firing. Believe it or not. Yeah, they sep they sep them before they flame out completely. Not a lot of people know that. Okay, and it looked like the real one, didn't it? The separate separators needed to go a little bit more, but hey, Crossbounder, what's up, man? Shuttle's onboard computer's not commanding the main engine nozzle to swivel, aiming the shuttle for its precise target in space for main engine cutoff. Love the calls, short. Your two engine Curbria go for the pitch. Copy, go for the pitch. Two engine towel. Copy two engine towel. Orbiter control negative return. Copy negative return. Oh, that's so freaking cool. I love the shuttle so much. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm fanboying. I'm fanboying so hard, I'm possibly even fangirling right now. This is ridiculous. I love that thing so much. It's so cool. Look at that thing. I mean, it flies with a huge tank on the side. Who thought of this? Who who thought of this? This is ridiculous. Bambo, what's up, dude? We have Apogee established here. Pressed, A-T-O. Copy, press. Control, Orbiter, standby, press for Miko. Ooh, Apogee's way too high. Not, not bad, not bad. We have main engine shut down. Stabilization, no ohms one required. Hey, Manny. What stage are you on with the shuttle? Final testing? Yeah, we're dialing in the SRBs, Manny. And then, then the shuttle is good. 
We can work on payload integration and the robotic arm and stuff. Not before we do this. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Phoenix, what's up, dude? Glad you rejoined watching. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Oh, that looks right, man. That looks real good. Our apogee is way too high, though. But that just goes to show you how nuts this thing actually is. I think this is the first time we're seeing it in space with the uh, with the decals on it. Really does look good. You love the choice of the white tank? We didn't really have a choice, Jungle, but yeah, man. Dude, yeah, see? She's a beast. And we have the Kraken Tech points, dude, so we could hang it. We can integrate this tank if we really want to. I engineered it with the integration equipment in. Last, what's up, Chief? You probably would not believe that it is me saying this, but we need a launch tower. Okay, kill me now. You feeling all right? You sure? I have some coffee. <laughs> have some coffee, bro. <laughs> I mean, yeah, fellas, okay, here's the thing. I made it to be integrated. This, the tank and the boosters can be integrated. We, I, I made the necessary attachment systems for them to work and we know they work. I can hang the shuttle in the external tank on this thing, no problem. Maybe add a fuel drain to the ET so you can get the tumble. I'm working on it, Rocket Man. Yep, yep. The last tower, oh boy. I can't. Hey, Tarad, Tarad, no, 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 no. Take your low effort Kappa and take it, put it back in the Kappa box, all right? Chat wants to build the launch tower, not me. Not me. Not me. Not me. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. <laughs> I don't want to build it. I know that's going to take too much time. Okay, all right. To be to be 100% clear with you, I absolutely do. I would love to build the shuttle's the shuttle's pad. I will do it. That is the one that got away from me. I've never done it. I would love to do it. But we ain't doing it. Not until this No. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. We have we have bigger fish to fry. We could save that for KSP2. Bingo. There you go. Maybe in KSP2. Yes. This is what we're using. Till KSP2 comes out. We're using this and we're using its shuttle derived launch vehicle. That's what we doing. That's what we do. Fried fish like fish and chips? No. We're catching Moby's dick. No, Moby dick. Moby. Bigger fish. We're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> I did that on purpose. I got your attention, though, didn't I? That's right, Red. Huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> nah, Creeper. Yeah, I mean, maybe. Have you checked out the new Hierarchy Visualizer update? BX. Oh, hey, Direct. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, okay, all right, sorry, I needed to bookmark that page.
I heard... Hey! That's a nice background. I heard that coffee is expensive. I heard that coffee is expensive. Is, is coffee expensive over there? Please let me know. How expensive is coffee? Hey, look, it's the shuttle stack. Oh, this is great. Very nice. Chicago Auto Strut, dude! Oh! You legend! And it tells you what part it is. I love it. I love it! Love it! Oh, oh look at it. I have no idea, to be honest. Well, I bought you I bought you a coffee. I I heard coffee is expensive. Dude, you need to go buy more coffee. I just did. I just bought him a coffee. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> that must be that must be one damn nice coffee, Theix. Jeez. What craft is this? It's the shuttle, dude. Look. Oh, that's so legit. Dude, I love that you can show the grandparents' struts. Because it shows my grandparents' strut latticing mechanism. I built that into the hierarchy on purpose. You make ribs like this, you're going to get symmetrical auto strut. Auto strut picks up on symmetry. This is what I try to tell people. Look, oh, that's so freaking good. So, fellas, look, all right. I make the auto struts with the panels in a certain way to represent stringers. They're stringers. So, okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. Um, uh, look. If you look, oh, it's just all, it's not actually assembly pictures, dang it. Um, uh, that one might do it. There. I mean, that one is made out of wood, but. <laughs> Hold on. My spidey senses are tingling. NASA thinks they could throw that. That first gen Hilux passed me. Nah, nah, son. Nah, son. Can't throw a pickup truck past me. Not even that or that cat eye Chevy over there. Nope. But see, the shuttle is built like this, guys. It, only out of aluminum, not 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 wood. <laughs> that's resolution. That one, that's resolution is no longer with us. But uh, if you look, so check this out. I try to make the auto struts represent the stringers. So this is a picture of, I'm not sure which shuttle it is. This might be Challenger. It's hard to date the photo. It could be any of the orbiters. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's not Columbia though. Um, the, the dead giveaways, the black strakes. Columbia has black strakes or had, it still exists in my mind, okay? Shut up. Columbia has black strakes. The other shuttles don't, this one doesn't. So that tells me that that's Challenger. Judging by the ROMs that that guy has. Yeah, that guy's got ROMs. Hell yeah. Adidas. Anyway. So, I try to build the auto struts to represent the stringers inside of the shuttle. Um, so, see? Check this out. Look. That's part of the reason why I chose to make the panels go out over here on the shuttle's wing. And I, why I chose to build it out of panels because the auto struts end up connecting on almost the same axis as the stringers. So if we go back over here to the hierarchy visualizer, look, the grandparent part auto struts for those panels are making the stringers. That's why the shuttle ends up being so strong. And then what I do is at the end of the hierarchy, if we shut off grandparent part, at the end of that hierarchy of stringers, I tie the I tie the whole thing 
I tied the whole thing back into the main main line assembly right there. See it? See that blue strut? It's tied right back into the main line assembly, and that actually, well, that's actually the set of I beams right here. So structural beam, structural beam. And that goes back into the mainline shuttle assembly there. It's basically like a layered cake with a rib cage attached in into it. See that? Oh, Felix, I'm so happy you made this, dude. See? That's why this shuttle is so strong. Remember, we put it out and we thought it was going to break. Didn't break. Needed a couple of struts here and there, and now she's good. What work still needs to be done on the stack? We're dialing in the SRBs, Josh, and then we're good to go. Now I want cake. Yep. See what I mean? It's built just like that. I use the auto struts to make the stringers. You can do this with any plane if you want, if you know what to build. See? How did they... See, this is a CAD drawing, right? But they drew this. Somebody drew this up. The shuttle wasn't made with CAD, it was made with blueprints. Like, actual people drawing and stuff. How are you gonna draw this? How are you gonna draw this? Like a... Are those ladders? Where? No, 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 no. Those are struts. Actually, those are stringers. Well, structural beams. This part right here, my cause, this part right here is one of the strongest parts of the entire shuttle. That's one of the strongest parts. Look at how thick the beam is right there. You know, you know why it's strong? It's kind of obvious. It's in the picture. Which KFP save will you be playing going forward with your redone shuttle? Starting a new mission mode save. Or we could continue the mission mode 2 save just with old mission mode rules if you want. We could do that, but that has budget and stuff in it. Leading wing edge? Nope. That doesn't need to be structural. That needs to be thermal. Differences, dude. That's the strongest part because of the gear. The gear is the strongest part of any aircraft. Think about it. It's got to hold up the whole thing. And those two main landing gear are holding up like... Probably about 80 to 90% of the shuttle. And the shuttle weighs 60 tons. That has to be strong. It can't bend. I broke my back. Spinal. Yeah, see how beefy this, this panel of aluminum right there right there is? See how beefy it is? And this is where the entire wing subassembly connects into the main body of the orbiter. Right here. That's the strongest part. Actually see if I can find the picture. There are pictures of Buran, and Buran shares a very similar airframe to the space shuttle. And if you find the right picture, you can see the wing box of, of Buran, which is very similar to the shuttle, obviously. Uh, I'm trying to find the right picture. I think the Buran, the picture of Buran on the barge shows exactly what I'm talking about. There it is. Okay, it's a Reddit post here. Look. See? See right there? See what I'm talking about? Because Buran uses a very, very similar structure. It's, it's very similar. Because the Soviets got so confused by the shuttle. They got so confused about what the shuttle was supposed to do that they said, screw it. We don't know what that does. We're going to build it and then figure out what the frick it does. They literally did a Cal Naughton Jr. I'm a little confused by your tactics. I'm going to keep acting tough until I figure out what's going on. How much for a used shuttle tachometer? A tachom... I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. I'm a little confused by your tactics. I wanted to show off the new update quickly, but I gotta eat. All right, TX. Taco Spaleri. About 350. So, you see right there? See how strong that piece is? And see the strake is built into the airframe? 
That's cool, man. That's It's built just like the shuttle. It's very similar. Also, it really, really, really hurts to see this on a freaking barge going up the going up a river in Moscow, but hey, whatever. That, that hurts a little bit. It's literally on a trash barge. Don't worry, the, this thing never that thing didn't get scrapped. We two that's two zero one. Two zero one is actually being restored. A museum got a hold of it. Last time I checked. Yeah. A museum got a hold of it and they're they're doing a uh frame off resto for two zero one. On the outside at least. So that's good. Better than when it was sitting at uh Toshino. That really sucked. When it was sitting at Toshino, they, uh, or not Toshino, it was at, uh, Angles, I think. Look, they brought it out for the, the MAKS air show and literally just painted where the black tiles would be. They did a starship, man. They just painted where the tile, where they want the tiles to be, but not where they actually were. It's tough to look at, man. That's really hard. To, it's really hard looking at that thing. The nose looks more blunt than the shuttles. It doesn't have the RCC nose cone on it, Pop. Yeah. Buran, if we can find a picture of a completed one. Uh, we'd have to we'd have to look at the actual 1K1 orbiter. So the 101 orbiter, the one that the one that's no longer with us. Neither is the plane. Which really blows, but hey, whatever. It is what it is. There we go. See? That's what it should look like. It, guys, on the outside, it looks exactly like the shuttle. Just We just see them in uncompleted states. Actually, Buran's wings are a little bit more forward. The reason why they're a little bit more forward than the space shuttle is because you're not carrying three big engines in the back. You don't need your wings to be so far back in a design like this. Buran actually, because of this, has a lower ballistic coefficient. It's, not, it's, this, it's a similar shape, but it's not nearly as much mass. So it had way more cross-range capability when you think about it. It's actually not, it's actually pretty smart. I mean, it's really, really freaking light compared to the shuttle. You don't have three big honking engines back there. And then they took the ohms pods and just put them in the aft section because there's no engines back there, right? And then they designed it to go with Energia, right? I still think the shuttle is better because I like getting my upper stage engines back. Not, not dumping on Energia, but because that's a really nice lifter, but yeah, they did shift some things around. I mean, personally, I prefer to carry three Mack trucks worth of engines on my upper stage and, and bring that back. Oh yeah, baby. Now, the Russians actually did make an engine that was similar to the RS-25. Not a lot of people know that either. It's called the um, RD-0120. It's... It's interesting. The RD-0120 is actually a very interesting engine. It looks like a shuttle motor, doesn't it? The thing about this thing is that this thing is more like a regeneratively cooled RS-68. And it, it, it's designed to be expended. So think RS-68, less shuttle engine, even though it does look like a shuttle engine. Um, so they, they were designing an RS-68 style high-powered Hydrolox engine that's designed to be expended long time ago. How much up mass would they lost if they flew two engine shuttles? Um, honestly, I don't think the shuttle would make it into orbit hypersonic. I don't think it would make it. The shuttle wouldn't make it into orbit with two engines in the back. Not a ch no way, not a chance, not even close. I know because if the engine out protocol, if they lost an engine at at booster engine cutoff, you're not getting to space. No, you you do an abort once around, or you you tal abort transatlantic abort. Uh, yeah, there's no way you would not make it. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, yeah, dude. Okay, guys, the shuttle's ascent profiles, I mean, don't get me wrong, this did differ, this did change with missions, right? But the shuttle ascent profiles are, you know how like Ariane 5 with the upper stage, that upper stage kind of falls a little bit because it doesn't really have high TWR, but it has insanely high Delta V, right? 
We've watched the telemetry from Arion Space and Kness, right? The ESAB upper stage, when it separates, it's still going up, but it goes past the apogee and actually sinks a little bit. But because it has a crazy amount of delta V, right, it'll eventually make it. It'll eventually circularize, not, not before falling a little bit, right? That does that. The shuttle does that too. Um, the boosters, the shuttle coasts past the apogee. Oh, yeah. Because think about it, man. You're not. You have decent TWR with these engines here, but think about the amount of mass that that's moving. Even with the tank at lower fuel levels, you're still, you're not, <laughs> it's an upper stage, right? You're not, you're not, you're going to coast past the Apogee almost every time. Now in Kerbal, we don't have to do that because these things are really, 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 really powerful. But yeah, the shuttle actually coasted past Apogee a lot of the time. Oh yeah. And then circularized. Shame it doesn't get any use. Yeah, and it's shame shame that it's American equivalent. The R sixty eight does is on its way out too. That's true if we're talking about the shuttle we had, but what about a shuttle built around two engines instead of three? You know, it's funny you bring that up, Aquilux. Hold on. In hiding in my shuttle, in the shuttle pictures folder, I have some early shuttle concepts right there. And this concept was built around two RS-25s in the second stage. This was one of the shuttle concepts that was proposed. So, the external tank, there's no external tank. You basically have the ET, right? You have the external tank built into your first stage. So think about like if you took, instead of like having the twin SRBs on the shuttle, right? You had a new Glenn first stage that the shuttle was attached to. And that new Glenn first stage had shuttle style wings, right? No SRBs involved. And then the shuttle itself had two engines and half of the payload bay was fuel tank. And then it, a small, it had a smaller payload bay, about half the size of the shuttle. Um, yeah, that concept is just chilling in my in the folder here. But that that's basically what you're looking at here. This is basically a shuttle. It would be like if you took an S4B, like a Saturn V third stage, and made that into a shuttle, right? And then so like half of the payload bay was fuel tank, and then the other half of the payload bay is for payload, right? And then the first stage is like an basically SLS core stage, actually an SLS core stage, but it's more like New Glenn because you'd need, they would have had, um, I think it was a uh, eight, eight shuttle engines down here, eight SSMEs down here. So there's eight here and there's two there. I think that, I think that's right. I'd have to find more pictures of the concept. Keep in mind, it's just a concept that never got off the ground. Figuratively, literally, it was just drawings. It was one of the proposals for the shuttle program. I have another picture of it hiding in here somewhere. Um, scanning. There it is. See? Yeah, that's actually pretty cool. I like that. I think that's really neat. The once, once around external tank. Really, really cool idea. That's actually pretty damn smart. Dude, I mean, okay, so look at the launch umbilical tower. This thing, whatever that first stage would have been, it would have been as tall. Actually, well, the launch umbilical tower goes to 305, so that's 305 feet right there. So this thing would have been, yeah. Wow, that, that would have been bigger than super heavy. Whatever this thing is, it would have been bigger than super heavy and bigger than an SLS core stage. Yeah, this was one of the proposed shuttle concepts. Yeah, that's freaking huge, dude. And so this thing would have gone up into space, right? And 
it's basically an external tank. It's like, think SLS core stage, but like with new Glenn engines down the bottom, right? We haven't built that in KSP? I did build something like this. Actually, I did. Um, Yeet has the Kraken drives in a Canadian. I did build something like this, dudes. Chipstone 6. Chipstone 6 is a Saturn V first stage that's been energiad. You know where the payload's designed to go? This thing, believe it or not, this thing can move this. It can move this. And that payload rides right there. And it will it will move it into space. Yeah, I had to shift the Saturn V's engine section slightly off axis, and then it does what Energia does. A lot of people don't know Energia's core stage. It's core stage, the engines are offset. That's the key. That's how they were able to launch asymmetric. See the core stage engines? They look like they're in line. They ain't in line. Nope. They're shifted. They're shifted up towards the payload to compensate. Not a lot of people know that. If you look at it, and this might piss off people that like seeing things nice and symmetrical, the four RD-0120s are actually shifted up and the four RD, uh, the four Zenit boosters with the with the four RD 170s are shifted down to compensate. Yeah, they compensate each other. They don't have the gimbal range of the RS 25s. No, they do. They do. The RD 170s, dude, have eight, no, seven degrees of gimbal. And then the RD 0120s have 10.5, just like the shuttle motors. Yeah, just like them. Pretty crazy, right? So. We, when when Energia takes off, and you, it's really hard to tell from the launch footage that we have of Energia flying because it's crappy interlaced Soviet poo-poo picture, right? But the RD-0120s actually go this way, and the RD-170s go this way. They actually go opposite of each other, which is crazy. So they don't go opposite in the way that you think. The RD-170s, right, push towards the shuttle. So if, if Buran is sitting on the side, the RD-170s go this way, they, or no, they go towards the orbiter. And then the RD-0120s actually point away from the orbiter. Is that weird or what? You can't really tell. Yeah. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> so they break up yaw pitch and roll between the motors. These ones, well, yes and no. Yes and no. Remember the yaw problems that we had with the shuttle when we were trying to fly ours into space? What's the problem there? Well, the problem is the linear center of mass drain. We had a whole conversation about it. The external tank center of mass stays here, right? And then it moves towards the shuttle main engines, right? Between the shuttle and, and the... As it drains fuel. This thing does something kind of similar, right? But where is the center of mass going? Where's the center of mass going? Well, remember, Buran is very light. Look, look at how much bigger its wings are and look at its wings, they're shifted forward. Think about where the COM is going with Buran and Energia versus the shuttle. Look at how low that shuttle is mounted on that stack comparatively. Pretty crazy, right? Their fuel drain goes in the opposite direction towards the boosters. Weird, right? That's why those boosters are hanging down off the bottom right there. Because as this thing drains, right, the center of mass isn't going up towards the shuttle because there's no engines back here. There's not a lot of dry mass, but there's a ton of dry mass down here because these are hanging off one side, right? That makes it so the center of mass isn't going up like this as you drain fuel. It kind of just goes backwards. 
Weird, right? And then when the boosters separate, then your center of mass starts going up. And that's when the gimbals on this will compensate. But they'll compensate, instead of pointing them this way, they'll compensate by pointing down. They'll point that way instead. I, look man, you know, you could say whatever you want. I, personally, I like the American Space Shuttle. I don't like the idea of wasting such great engines like these ones. I really don't like that. Now, don't get me wrong. Energia did have reusable Zenit boosters. They were, they were looking for it. All this, this gray stuff that's on the side are landing legs and parachutes, believe it or not. They wanted to parachute the boosters back down and have them have crush cores. And the booster being so light would just land and the landing legs would get sacked, right? And But the, the main tankage on the booster would be intact, much like how Soyuz boosters come down basically in one piece. <laughs> Kim, you like the American one too? Gee, I wonder why. No, I mean, but I'm not going to sit here and tell you that this isn't a... That's not really, really smart. I mean, dude, it takes one thing to re-engineer the shuttle, or reverse engineer the shuttle. It takes another thing to do that. Now... Kem, we always talk about duplication and elaboration. That was the thing, right? Like, if you're just copying somebody, you're just copying them. That's not just copying someone. That is totally different. That is unique ideas to solve the same problem being incorporated with what you have. That is a very, very smart way to do that. I will say it. I still like this one better. I like the shuttle better. Because I think the SRBs, the SRBs are reusable. The Zenith... Could you have made them reusable? Yeah, maybe down the road, sure. But this is the one that was implemented and I just really don't like the idea of throwing really nice rocket engines in the trash. I, I really, really, really am not too big of a fan of doing that. I really don't think that's a good idea. It's probably more engine than the, N1, than the H1. N1? Could we take them side boosters of any gear and propulsively land them? Mm, RD-170s can deep throttle. I'm just not sure. <clears throat> See, that's one engine. See these four nozzles? That's one motor. That's an RD-170. It's an oxygen, Carolox oxygen rich stage combustion. You can deep throttle them. They do deep throttle. They deep throttle actually pretty dang well. Look at Atlas V. Atlas V has a has a cousin to that motor, actually half of it, believe it or not. An RD-170. No, we don't want the injector. I don't know why that auto-populated. So the RD-170 is uh, this thing. It's a four-nozzle motor. <clears throat> so the Russians, the, the Soviets came up with the idea, instead of building one gigantic nozzle, of making one power pack feed a bunch of different nozzles, right? They feed a bunch of different nozzles. Right? The RD-180 is just a scaled down RD-170 power pack feeding two nozzles instead. It's literally the same. It's almost exactly the same. Yeah. It just feeds two slightly bigger nozzles instead of four slightly smaller nozzles. That's Atlas V's first stage. And it's a good motor, dude. They make good engines. They do. Like, I, <laughs> I get current affairs and whatnot, but these guys make, they make good engines. They always have. I don't think you'd be able to propulsively land RD-170s like that. I don't think they can deep throttle like that. Because you guys got to remember, <clears throat> Falcon 9, right? It goes up on nine engines, right? It comes down and lands. Sometimes it lands with three. It, it lights one, lights three, turns two off, and lands on one, right? But for the most part, let's just say it's landing on one motor, right? Falcon 9, for the most part, lands on one engine. Um, <clears throat> one engine that can deep throttle is not, you're not going to get the TWR that you want. Basically the RD-170, even at deep throttling would need to deep throttle to like 2% throttle to get that Zenit booster to land correctly. And you can't maintain combustion. You can't maintain, you can't maintain combustion stability like that at that low of a throttle. It doesn't work that way. Um... RD-120 in future, in which, eh. No, not 120s. I don't like... Mio to show RD-120. No, 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 no. We zero 120. 
Yeah. Got the auto show. It's good. I like that one. I want more of those. Can we have more of the yeah, yeah, we don't need we don't need more of those. We got BE4s. We got BE4s now, but that's a good motor. It's good for the time. Yeah, and Aqualux, exactly. It uses one engine out of nine. So one engine deep throttling is going to get you a way different TWR. One engine out of nine deep throttling as opposed to one engine out of one engine deep throttling. You wouldn't have been able to do it. Yeah, and, yeah, we got B4 and Raptor. That's right. Did you guys see the... Um, here. I haven't done a Space News in a little while, but... Look at this tall drink of water right here. Ooh! So strap four Falcon 9 rockets to enter a score stage and you're fine. I mean, Chief, I'd prefer... I'd prefer to attach four Falcon 9s to a uh, shuttle stack. Four Falcon 9s would, is enough power. It would do it. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. See potential. Nice. Oh. Please. That's that's happening soon, fellas. Any other pictures? Oh. Bro. Oh. What about strapping a fuel tank, a fuel shuttle belly to a cargo shuttle? I thought that would be, that would have to be scaled up a lot to work. Four Falcon 9's on Starship with a shuttle drool. <laughs> Red, that, that, would, that could work. That could work. Sure. Yeah. Why have a shuttle in an external tank when you could just make it one thing? Do you think a next generation shuttle would be reworked with methane? And what do you think it would look like? A smaller ET? I don't think Okay. Um So where I'm at where I'm at with that J Speed is uh Alright, so the shuttle's operating principle is built around the external tank. Like if you just switch this to methane, it would not work. That wouldn't work. Uh, you you would need like a Raptor engine back here to compensate. Now, with that being said, even if like, okay, so we brought the shuttle back and the external tank is, looks, let's say the external tank is like a depot starship, right? It's a, it's a starship here, but that's all fuel tank. There's no payload bay. You just have header tanks at the front and it's just a gigantic fuel tank. Um, even if you put Raptors back here and then put the SRBs on the side, I mean, I'm not going to lie. A shuttle engine with Raptors would be sweet. And believe it or not, like, I mean, that's an extraordinarily complicated thing to retrofit the shuttle with, with methane engines. But... Your LOX tank is not big enough. Your LOX tank isn't big enough. You'd have to put the LOX tank down here. Because methane... Methane has that carbon atom attached to it. And that, uh, that carbon is... The carbon is, makes methane a lot higher mass because carbon is heavy, but carbon also keeps methane stable, you know? From the last test, we are going to put this here. Um, we needed these to fire for a little bit longer. So... Any gains that you would get from switching to methane here, you would have to go redesigning the external tank. But even if you did redesign the external tank, it would have to be bigger. The external tank would have to be, well, actually, I don't know. You might be able to make a smaller.
You'd have to put methane up top and locks down here. And if you put the methane on the top, you would have to change that tank. And then the locks tank back here would definitely be different. The Long story short, the external tank might end up being bigger. But that does mean that your external tank would carry more fuel. J-Speed, right? So, like, say we put, like I said, we put Raptors back here instead of shuttle motors. Say we put three Vactors back here and put them on the 15-degree gimbal actuators that it has. It would work. It could work. But... Believe it or not, your external tank would have to be bigger. It would have to be bigger because... Because methane. Methane... Maybe you could store methane in the hydrogen tank, but I'm pretty sure the ET would have to be flipped. Because CH4 is more dense. There, there's more mass there than O2. It's not more dense. There's more mass in CH4 than there is with... With LOX, right? That carbon atom really weighs those hydrogen atoms down. But that, once again, that's what also keeps it stable. Hmm. You'd have to flip the external tank. Yeah. Either that or make the ET bigger. Now, <clears throat> you probably end up... Uh, my guess is that you'd have to make it a little bit bigger. The reason why you'd have to make it a little bit bigger is one of the biggest things why Methalox was kind of pushed over for Hydrolox back in the day. Um... Even with Raptor and Raptor 2 and how ridiculously good they are. They are, and they are. They are insane engines. These things are unbelievable. This is like, I, I know it's kind of weird to say it in the moment, and I ain't just trying to kiss SpaceX's butt either. That thing is, like I said, it's not pretty much, it's not anything new. There's This is stuff, these are concepts that we all knew existed. In fact, Raptor shares uh, its family tree with BE-4 because they all go back to the hydrostatic integrated powerhead demo that the Air Force ran in the mid-2000s. Raptor's turbo pumps are based off of an Air Force research laboratory project. So are the BE-4s. They're both based off of the same, the same turbo pump design. So BE-4 and Raptor are actually related on a family tree. They're cousins. Not a lot of people know that, right? <clears throat> but... Even though this is not anything that hasn't been tried before, right? Or, well, not anything that hasn't been tried before. It is, the full flow stage combustion cycle is something that, that's the big one. It's not anything we didn't know. It's not anything that couldn't be hypothetical. SpaceX is just the first ones to do it. And now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to undermine, you know, oh, well, they're just the first ones to do it. It's something that we already knew. No, 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 no. That's not how that works at all. That's a slap in the face to the people that actually did this. You know, it's not anything that we didn't know, but we did. Y yeah, th that's rocket science. It's not anything we didn't know. We know how to land on the moon. Go and freaking do it. It's really difficult. And that's what I mean. This thing right here, and I'm not trying to like... I'm not trying to be too much of like a butt kisser right now, right? Like, but that thing is unbelievable for what it does. We will look back at this moment, and you will look at this thing, and Raptors will be in... They will be remembered as like our F1 engines of their time or J2s or the shuttle main engines. These things are insane for what they do. But even though they're really insane what they do for what they do, check these numbers out. 363. The specific impulse is 363 seconds. And the sea level impulse is 327. At the end of the day, guess what? Specific impulse matters a lot. And even though Raptor and Raptor 2 are really pushing the envelope and they can get to a theoretical, uh, they can get to a theoretical 380, you're, that's not 450 seconds specific impulse. So guess what? You're going to need more thrust and you're going to need a bigger tank. Believe it or not, even with hydrogen being stored at a really, really low pressure, right? They have to keep it at low pressure because if you try to squeeze hydrogen inside of a tank, inside of a pressure vessel too much, it'll just leak out. It'll find a way to leak out because it's going to evaporate. <clears throat> it's going to boil. It's going to evaporate. It's going to turn to gas. And that gas will leak everywhere. I hate hydrogen. It's small, gaseous, and it gets everywhere. Now, hydrogen's pretty good. Long story short, J-Speed, you're probably not... You're, if we were going to do that, if we were going to take a shuttle and remake the shuttle, right with Raptor engines on it. Your external tank would end up having to be a lot bigger. 
And because your external tank has to be a lot bigger, you're gonna need a more, you're gonna need stronger boosters. You're gonna need way stronger boosters. You're gonna need massively stronger boosters. So you'd need maybe a five segment SRV or something. Five segs might do it, I don't know, but you're carrying an a lot of extra mass here because your external tank actually is way, way higher mass. Like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that'll work right. I, I really don't, I, yeah. I mean, guys, this is just napkin math off the top of my head and knowing my with my limited knowledge of rocket propellants. Your tank would actually be bigger and that's more mass. So what are you going to make it out of? Are you going to make it out of stainless? Like Starship, that's more mass. Yeah, are you reusing your external tank? Does your external tank belly flop back down and come come back down and land? If it does, well, guess what? Now you need now you now you're carrying more mass cuz you need thermal protection system, you need wings. So you're gonna need bigger boosters. And at this point, why don't you just combine the shuttle with your external tank if it's gonna be so much freaking heavier and you're bringing back your ET anyway, right? Like, why don't you just combine them? Why even go with it, a, 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 a expendable external tank? Why, why would we do this? Combine it into one vehicle, like Starship. Would Falcon 9 work as boosters, Ford? On a shuttle stack? You'd need four of them, but yeah, sure, why not? Well, <laughs> yeah, sure, why not? It, obviously, just like anything else, it's more complicated than that. So, there's a problem. The biggest single problem I've seen with trying to use... Um, with trying to use Falcon 9 boosters on the side of a shuttle stack is structural. It's a structural problem. Uh, and once again, this is just with limited analysis with the given data, so it's probably not right. <laughs> once again, just an armchair engineer, right? Like, uh, So the entire stack for the shuttle hangs on these SRBs. These SRB, the, why? Well, why are they hanging on the SRBs? They're hanging on the SRBs because the SRBs are carrying 80% of the load well, they're activated. They are the first stage, right? So now you have a structural problem. The you you have to hang the external tank on the SRBs. When they built shuttle stacks and well SLS too, when they build these stacks, they put the SRBs down first. So the SRBs have to be vertically integrated and they have to be able to carry load. Right? Now, the way the NASA and Boeing and Rockwell engineers at the time figured this is that, well, the SRBs can be stacked vertically. You can stack them vertically. Sure. Why not? Can you stack a Falcon 9 vertically? No. Can you hang stuff on a Falcon 9 when it's vertical? No. It needs the strong back. So, if you were going to do this, right? If you're going to do this, you would need four strongbacks to hold your Falcon 9s in place. This thing would have to have four strongbacks on either side to hold this whole thing in place. And those four strongbacks would have to peel off like Soyuz style, right? That's the only way you'd be able to hang the external tank on four Falcon 9s. Now, Falcon 9 carries an upper stage, carries the payload, payload and a payload fairing. Do you think the, f like, okay, so we have four Falcon 9s on the side now. What's the, what is the mass of Falcon 9 second stage with the highest payload that it can move? 22, 22, 22 metric tons. I think it's 22.8 metric tons. How much mass is that first stage? And how much mass is the payload fairing with the payload inside carrying the heaviest payload? And then times that by four. So let's say that the second stage when it's fully fueled is what, 30 tons? So you have 30 tons and 20 tons. It's about 50 tons, okay? Now you have four boosters, right? So let's just do 50 times four. That's 200 tons. Does the shuttle with its payload with a fully fueled external tank weigh more than 200 tons? Abso-freaking-lutely. There's no way. It weighs probably like 
2,000 tons or something. Uh, there's no, there's no way you can carry the load. So there is another solution to that problem. Falcon Heavy Center Cores, they can carry more load. They are overbuilt on purpose to be able to take the extra weight or the extra force from the two side boosters. So if you're gonna do this, you would need Falcon Heavy Center Cores. They would need, you would need four Falcon Heavy Center Cores because they can, they can handle the extra load. But even then, I'm not sure that that extra load would be enough. You'd have to take Falcon Heavy's side booster nose cone and put it on a Falcon Heavy center core and then find a way to hang the external tank and shuttle from that. The only other way I can think of doing it is would be horizontal integration, just like Muran and Agia. And now maybe that'll work in that case, but now you need an insanely big transporter erector to, to fly this whole thing. See how complicated this can get? I'm getting into insane complication for shuttle stack and everything, just doing napkin math. The actual analysis on this would be insane and it would take years to get that right. <laughs> so more like Buran. There's a reason why Buran was horizontally integrated, Ford, sure. That the big one is because you're using liquid fuel boosters and that's what they had. That's what they had. The solids, the solids are the key to the whole shuttle design. The shuttle design doesn't work if you don't have solid rocket boosters. It does not work right. Those things right there, one of those things is the same size as a Zenit booster on Buran, but it produces the thrust of two Zenit boosters. The shuttle boosters, each SRB, each one of them produces 12,000 kilonewtons of thrust. That's like 2.5 million pounds of thrust per booster. There's two of them. And they're able to hold up 2,000 tons of external tank, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, and a 60-ton orbiter and 2,500 uh, 25 metric tons of payload inside of said orbiter. Without without that thing, without those, the shuttle doesn't work. It does not. It doesn't work. That's why they chose solids in the first place because it is a simplified solution to a very complicated problem. Yeah, it. See, you think that this is just, oh, it's just some boosters attached to it. No, no. The SRBs have to hold up the external tank. Now, why? Why did they hold up the external tank? Well, like I said, they have to hold up the external tank because that's the first stage. The shuttle engines are the second stage, technically. First stage is doing 80% of the work. Like, look at Falcon 9. Falcon 9 has... The first stage has nine Merlins in it. Second stage has one. See what I mean? Your first stage is usually doing about 80 to 90%, has about 80 to 90% of the thrust, like a total thrust for your vehicle, right? Crazy, huh? So long story short, you could, four, you, you could do it. You could put four Falcon Heavy center cores on the sides of this. Sure, why not? And then have them land. You would need to really beef up those center cores. I'm not entirely sure that Falcon Heavy center cores would be able to hold up that ET. And like, guys, this is just, I'm just talking about integration. Never mind the dynamics that would be introduced during liftoff. Oof. You'd somehow need 36 Merlin engines to simultaneously ignite. Now, don't get me wrong. Falcon Heavy does 27, so I don't think that's too out of the realm of possibility. But it needs to be a near instantaneous ignition to time itself with the shuttle. Remember, the shuttle does that whole thwang maneuver at liftoff. And if the stack isn't pointed up, well, we've seen in Kerbal what happens when you try to light the SRBs when the stack isn't pointed straight up. It'll go off to the side. That would be a complicated ignition timing, dude. That would be really difficult to get that right. Once again, not out of the realm of possibility. Everything in rocket science is difficult. Even putting a shoebox sized payload into space is extraordinarily complicated. Like that, it, to the point where, like, dude, we messed with launch pads. You saw how, comp you saw how complicated that is when the game doesn't hold your hand like that because Kerbal was never designed for him, right? We saw how complicated, we got a taste of it, of how complicated this, complicated this actually is. We got a taste of that in Kerbal by making launch pads where we had to do our own engineering and not just, you know, that that has the propulsion solved for you already. I don't need to worry about an engine shutting off, right? Unless we get a mod, right? That's with all the propulsion dynamics figured out. Oh boy. 
people don't realize how ridiculous this thing actually is. That, and this is why I sit here and talk about it. The shuttle was insane. It still is insane, even by today's standards, for what it does. And that's just one launch vehicle. You want to get into Saturn V dynamics, Starship, N1, Buran Energia, they're all that complicated. Because building big stuff to fly into space is really, really difficult. The bigger you go with your rocket in rocket science, the exponentially... The, the difficulty scales exponentially. So building a rocket that's, say, 10 meters tall, all right, <clears throat> that moves one ton into space. Building a rocket that's 20 meters tall, that moves two tons into space, is like three times as hard. Actually, I would say four times as difficult. Scale of rocket... The scale of the rocket is... Uh, which is like a linear scale. Like say we're just making one rocket that's two times the size, three times the size, four times the size. The difficulty is on a exponential increase. I think, what is that called, Jared? Logarithmic? It's logarithmic, I think. It's a logarithmic exponent. Log, no, ex well, exponential. Exponential would be fine. It's really hard to make a big rocket. It's just pretty dang hard to make a small one. Exponential is right. Logarithmic would be 10 times. Dude, you could even say it's logarithmic, man. It is hard to build a big rocket. How much more do you think the shuttle could carry if it was modernized to today's materials and avionics? Unstoppable, they could probably... You could probably get, I don't know, this is just based off of like, hey, phone sister, um, <laughs> exponential, which is why I'm glad my focus is aircraft. Well, Jared, I mean, this it's the same thing with building a bigger plane. People look at C5s and 747s flying around, not entirely realizing that in the case of like a 747, Boeing sank $2 billion into R&D in 1968. $2 billion in 1968 to redesign the 747's wing box to get it to do what it needed to do. It is it is extremely hard to build a bigger aircraft. Am I wrong? Right? So, Unstoppable, going back to this, if I was, like, say I hit the Powerball, right, which probably wouldn't be enough money. A billion dollars wouldn't be enough to, to resuscitate the shuttle program. You'd need, like, 10 or 11 billion dollars I would say 30 billion just to be absolutely sure to, to revive this program and get the whole supply chain figured out and redone. But say we, let's just say we did that. Say, you know, my last name is Deeds and I had a huge $30 billion inheritance, right? And I said, okay, screw it. We're bringing the shuttle program back. Honestly, I wouldn't change much in the shuttle's design. There are components that could be simplified in here with modern systems, but fuel cells are fuel cells, man. We could switch to li lithium batteries, or no, the shuttle doesn't have really look like lithium batteries. Figure that out. There's not much that you can change here. The, the propulsion would probably be the big one that you need that you would need to change. I honestly wouldn't change much. I'd go with a better tile adhesion system. That would be the big problem to figure out. The tiles coming off plagued the shuttle program till the end. Now, don't get me wrong. Not tiles coming off like during ascent or something. That's debris from your external tank. I'm talking about every time the shuttle came back down and landed at Kennedy Space Center, the tiles, which are silicate tiles, they're silicate based, so they're kind of they kind of have the consistency of like styrofoam, but they absorb moisture like sand, like sand on the beach would absorb moisture. That's the big problem. That was the big thing that they really didn't get exactly right all the time. Anybody live in Florida? What's that stuff that uh, that floats around in the air that makes it really, really oppressively hot? What, what is that? Humidity? Oh yeah, that's water vapor in the atmosphere. Every time the shuttle landed, those tiles would start absorbing water from the atmosphere. And you'd have to go over the 30,000 freaking tiles on the shuttle and make sure that the, that the glue that adhered the tile to the shuttle didn't, which was water soluble, 
didn't loosen up a tile or have the tile fall off completely. That was the one of the big things from the shuttle program. You'd have to go over every single tile. That's why towards the end of the shuttle program, dudes, if you look at some of these tiles, obviously some of them have been replaced. Obviously, you could definitely see that the, those tiles have been replaced, right? But if you look at some of them, some of them have dots in the center. See those? Those tiles are tiles that they had to, that got wet. They got wet and they had to evac, they had to evac all the moisture out of them and they had to re-inject the glue onto the tile. So anytime you see one of these tiles that has a dot on it, it's been re-injected, which means it's flown before. Last, please. What's up, John? How you doing, buddy? Uh, I heard a rumor about China's proposed Starship clone. Apparently, it's a fully reusable, but will drop boosters full of nitric acid in villagers in order to preserve cultural traditions. That's disgusting, and I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> nah, not for me. Check this out. Naval Research Lab is building a test bed for a geostationary for geostationary robotics servicing. Oh yes. Nice. Very good. How about a replaceable inflatable heat shield? Well, okay, Halsey, you gotta think about the stakeholder expectations of the shuttle. Alright, so what do yeah, see all the dots? You can very much see them in that picture. Look. Every single one of those had to be manually re-injected with adhesive. There's 30,000 of them. That took forever. That's the big one. But, Halsey, we, once again, we gotta think about what we want the shuttle to do. Aerospace engineering, like any form of engineering, really boils down to one question. What are you doing? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to make? With the shuttle, we're trying to make reusable transportation, right? So this thing should come back down, it should land, you should be able to drag it over to the hangar, service all the systems on it like an airplane, and then send it back to the VAB to be launched again, right? That was the, that's the stakeholder expectation of the shuttle. The point was to get away from flying rockets like Saturn V, which... They ended up using it exactly like Saturn V and then wondered why it had so many problems. Turns out... When you fly an airplane four times a year, the maintenance costs go up. And remember how difficult space flight is? Yeah, it turns out when you fly a space plane four times a year, the maintenance costs go up crazy, like really, really high. Even if you did this tile re-injection, if you had a big enough supply chain to be able to handle an orbiter flying once a week, yeah, the costs could go down because you'd figure out ways to optimize over time. But if I was gonna bring the shuttle back, dude, the big thing that I would do is figure that problem out. That's one of the big ones. Figure out a way for the tiles to A, not absorb water, and B, stay in, uh, well, actually, figure out a way for them not to absorb water. That's the big one. They absorb water, and getting water out of this, it would be like drying sand out. It's really, really difficult, because these are rocks. It's silicate-based. Those are rocks. They figured, they figured out a way to get the shuttle to fly better through the atmosphere at hypersonic speeds by gluing a bunch of rocks to the bottom of the orbiter. That's though that's what they are. They're silicate based. They are rocks. Rocks absorb heat really, really nicely, actually, so it actually works really, really well. How about Starship's tiles? Well, Nikita, that's that's my next thing. Starship is using an advanced tile that was actually developed during the end of the shuttle program called Tough Rock. It's not silicate based, it's a unifibrous composite. So there are tiles that are tough and unifibrous, reinforced oxidation resistant, corrosion resistant. Tough Rock is what it's called. Tough Rock tiles were designed at the end of the shuttle program and there is another vehicle. There is another vehicle that flies with them. One of the shuttle's cousins, believe it or not. The X-37B uses Tough Rock. Now check this out. You look at a picture of an X-37, right? Do you see any RCC on that? No reinforced carbon carbon on the wings. It's all tiles. The only thing that's made out of RCC on the X-37 is the V-stabs. Those vertical stabilizers are made out of reinforced carbon carbon. That's the same thing that the shuttle's wing leading edges are made out of. And the shuttle's nose cone. That's the most important part of the heat shield right there. Not the tiles. You can lose a couple of tiles. You lose that, you're screwed. You die. Yeah. That nose cone is the most important part. Even the shape. 
the reason, believe it or not, is when you start when you, you start having plasma accumulations on the outside, making your vehicle at hypersonic speeds more more in line with like hydrodynamic actually makes sense. That's why the shuttle is so bulky and so bulbous. It looks like it looks like a bulbous bow in the front of a ship, doesn't it? Because like a bulbous bow moving water out of the way of a ship and water being incompressible, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, plasma is incompressible as well. So when you're making stuff that goes hypersonic, it ends up looking a lot like it ends up looking a lot like a boat hull. Don't get me wrong, the shuttle doesn't float. Remember those tiles absorb the water? It doesn't float. It will not work as a boat. This vehicle cannot be used as a flotation device. Is RCC more brittle than Tough Rock? Well, keep in mind this is an entirely different vehicle, and this vehicle was engineered with Tough Rock from the start. Even the front of the X-37, the front of the dang thing, it, there's no RCC on it. The front is using Tough Rock tiles. So my guess is that they figured out a way to get these tiles to adhere better, because I know the X-37's made out of aluminum. It's an aluminum chassis. And they're using the Nomex from the shuttle program. Those are the fire blankets that the shuttle used. Those are Nomex. It's, li it's literally a fire blanket. On the leeward side of the X-37, yeah, you, you don't need as much thermal protection because this thing, and look, <laughs> that, that nose cone of Tough Rock tiles is a very similar shape to the shuttle. It should give you a clue as to how the X-37 re-enters. It's, it's very similar to the shuttle. And we know it doesn't float. We saw Pathfinder. Hey, Pathfinder floated. Wait a minute. Pathfinder floated. Shut up. So honestly, if we were gonna do this, if we we're gonna if we we're gonna build a new shuttle, I would build it with those tough rock tiles. Those tough rock tiles seem seem. <laughs> do not base anything off of opinion with engineering. Engineering without analysis is just an opinion, and opinions are irrelevant in engineering. Fact. It very much seems like these tiles have solved that problem. And if they have solved that problem, then something like the shuttle, even these tiles are stronger and they're lighter. Starship is using tough rock as well. They're using they're using unifibrous reinforced oxidation resistant tiles. That's what Starship's tiles are. And believe it or not, Starship has a cilia backing plate similar to this. You notice how Starship tiles look like an Oreo cookie? There you go. It has this behind the tile as a, another thermal medium between the stainless and the tile. Starship tiles are the same thing, Sun Temple. Yeah, and Starship doesn't seem to have a problem with tank pressurizing, getting really cold. We'll see if they get really hot. We'll see how it fares at hypersonic speed. There's also less safety stuff for the 37 as it's supposedly unmanned. It, it is unmanned, John. If they're launching people on this, that is a blatant disregard of safety. Um, uh, yeah, but I think you could see a lot, you could see a lot of what the X-37 could do, uh, of what the, uh, like a Mark II shuttle could do with the X-37, because the X-37 is basically a tinier Mark II shuttle. Now, don't get me wrong, if they rebuilt the shuttle, it wouldn't look exactly like this. It would still look like the regular space shuttle. But also, this seems to have solved those thermal protection system problems. It seems to have solved them pretty dang well, actually. That you see any reinjection marks on these things? No reinjection marks. They're not even heck. They're not even scorched that much. They're not like the shuttle, that's for sure. Look at how scorched the cilia tiles got. Those tiles look fine, and that's on a vehicle that just went through reentry. You could see that the nose cone area got really hot, but the rest of these shed off the heat really, really nicely. Really, like really nice. This thing does not scorch like the shuttle. But then again, the shuttle has a lot more momentum when it hits the atmosphere going Mach 25 than this thing does. So who knows? Hey, Vlam, what's going on? So if I was going to redo the shuttle, like, okay, I would use those tiles, but that's going to introduce a whole manner of crazy problems, dude. You know why? The shuttle wasn't designed for tough no rock. It wasn't designed for it. It's not designed to have something like that. So we, it might... If we were going to make a shuttle, it might not end up looking exactly like this, just with Tough Rock tiles. It probably would be different, because those Tough Rock tiles have a different mass. They have a different mass. They're supposedly lighter. 
Remember, lighter is not necessarily what you want with this. Because they're lighter, they could screw up the mass balance of the entire vehicle. Now you have to go redesigning all this. Once again, that's why I said at the beginning of this, hitting even hitting the Powerball wouldn't be enough. You would need $30 billion to bring this thing back at least. And I'd say, if I had to guess, this is a pretty conservative estimate. You'd need $10 billion just to get the shuttle running as it was at the end of 2011. You'd need $10 billion to do that. And that is a very conservative estimate. Like, it's probably more. And then you'd need... And this is why I say, like, oh, $30 billion would do it absolutely. Because $30 billion would be enough to re-engineer all the systems on the shuttle to, you know, use Tough Rock tiles to solve the tile problem, right? Solve the tile problem. Uh, the O-ring problem is already solved. The SR SRBs are super safe. I still don't understand why people have a stigma towards people flying on SRBs. They're great. SRBs are really simple. If anything, they're safer. SRBs have moved more people into space than anything. By a long shot. They're very safe. It's very predictable. Because it only has two moving parts. I would test the heck out of my SRBs just to absolutely prove that, though. Right? Right? Better to start from a clean slate? Yeah, John, I don't think starting from a clean slate would be that good of an idea. There's a lot of stuff that the shuttle program figured out that's frankly ingenious, dude. You know, like, the best ideas, even if they are a simple idea, right? The best ideas might take a long time to do. And with that being said, the way the shuttle addresses the problem of bringing your upper stage engines back and not making a vehicle that's the size of the external tank is quite frankly ingenious. That that is a good solution to a very that is a very simple solution to a very complicated problem. Remember how we were talking the other day about how fuel drain works and everything with the shuttle and how the differential pressure between hydrogen and oxygen makes it so the external tank kind of drains relatively uniform and the center of mass on the tank stays right around here. And then it's a lin more or less a linear center of mass drain. The center of mass, if the tank COM stays here and the shuttle COM stays here and the fuel tanks drain, your center of mass is going to move right back. And it's going to move right back in the exact same line that these shuttle engines are pointing at. The gimbal on the shuttle engines is there to compensate for fuel drain and also fuel drain is kind of a secondary thing. It's there to compensate for the differential mass inside of the payload bay. Because if you have more mass inside of the payload bay, right? If you have more mass inside of the payload bay, that center of mass drain is gonna be relatively similar, but it's just gonna be shifted up and the gimbals are there to compensate for that. Now, that whole idea, dude, is frankly ingenious. It's ingenious. It's, that to rocketry is what the bolt action rifle is to freaking, well, maybe not the bolt action rifle, is to, is to like fighting. Uh, maybe not the bolt, bolt action rifle. Maybe the Maxim gun. Like, that is so insanely smart. It, I'm amazed the shuttle flies. <laughs> what about going back to shorter wings of the original idea, since we don't need the DoD cross range? Honestly, Wisp, if I was going to build the shuttle and I was going to make it again, I would pitch it to the Department of Defense. Say, like, once again, say I came into money. I would pitch this. The shuttle is relevant. The shuttle would be extremely relevant in a commercial low Earth orbit market. Absolutely. abso freaking lutely Oh, yeah. It would... Dude, think about what this does. No one has this capability. Nobody. Not even now. Not even Elon. Pouring tens of billions of dollars into Starship has this capability. Elon might in the future. He's the closest one. He's the closest one. But no one can mimic this capability. Nobody. Not even close. Ten years down the road, we're still not even close to mimicking what this thing could do. Not even, not even, not even close. Oh, I will. Okay, speed. I'll name it after Eileen Collins, though, not Michael Collins. First female shuttle commander. This design is insanely smart. It's... It kind of kills me that it doesn't fly anymore because of how well thought out and how well contrived the shuttle's design actually is. It was just a couple of things here and there. Like, long story short, find a way to address that tile problem 
and then figure out a way to make your propulsion a little bit more reliable. Now, don't get me wrong. Those are two things, and those two those two problems that I said would probably cost about $10 billion worth of research and development to get that right. But if we were able to do it, if you're able to solve those two problems, those are the two biggest problems facing the shuttle. Most of the shuttle systems on board here really were really well thought out and worked really dang well on the first try. Think about that. Like, do you ever hear a problem? Do you ever hear a shuttle mission having a problem with an ohms pod? I mean, maybe there was one or two hiccups here and there. Never had a problem with it. Shuttle's fuel cells? Yeah, they had problems with those from time to time, but you have three of them. They're in triple redundancy for that exact purpose. Shuttle's radiators? Well, towards the end of the shuttle program, they switched it to a parallel, parallel circuitry. The radiators used to be plumbed in series, believe it or not, so the coolant would start up here, it would go down here, it would go around, and it'd go through there. There's four radiators on the shuttle on the inside of the payload bay doors to radiate heat away because you can't convect heat in space. It doesn't work like that. You're, you're in the vacuum. You need to expose fluid to the vacuum to keep it cool. And you need to radiate heat. You can't convect it. The shuttle's plumbing. They actually retrofitted the shuttle with a parallel cooling system. Now, the reason why they did that is because if you have your radiators if you have your fluid going from radiator one, radiator two, radiator three to radiator four, and a micrometeorite punctures it and you have a coolant leak, you do the space shuttle equivalent of jettisoning the sa saucer section. Immediate mission abort. The shuttle can't the shuttle will melt itself up in space if you if you don't have coolant to keep the fuel cells cool. Oh yeah, no way. There's no way that would work. Now another thing that you could do, I guess, is replace the fuel cells with solar panels, but you got to remember the original goals for the shuttle program. The original goals for the program were to go up and come right back down. Stay up there for like one to two days and then come right back down. So f switching to solar panels doesn't really make a whole lick of sense. And if so, even if you did do it, where the heck would you put them? On the inside here, your radiators are already there. Now, don't get me wrong, those radiators there aren't just for the fuel cells. They're there for the climate control systems in the in the, in the the crew tank. You don't want your... You don't want to basically broil your crew inside of a gigantic oven in space that would not the crew wouldn't like that they would get very upset just open a window to cool off i mean red you put the kappa there but ironically that would work you would cool off you would also die but it would work that would work hey tech Like I said, guys, and this is what I mean. If we were going to bring back the shuttle, there's not much I would change. I Like with the SRBs, I wouldn't change it at all. I'd go right to Northrop Grumman and be like, I need about 50 of those things a year. <laughs> and they'd be like, you want to give us money for SRBs? I'd be like, yeah, I want that. And they'd be like, okay. <laughs> so the shuttle actually switched to a parallel cooling system so they could get a micrometeorite and a coolant leak on one panel, and then they could cut it out of the system. It was it was plumbed in parallel after that. Retractable solar panels from the payload bay? You could do that, Kem. They did do it. There was a shuttle mission in the early 80s that was testing the ISS, uh, the ISS kind of screwjack solar panels, the big ones that are on the ISS now. They had a smaller demo one, and they did deploy it out of the payload bay, and it was wired into the shuttle's electrical systems, and it did generate power. But why? The shuttle's supposed to remember. Gotta remember, dude. That's not an RV, okay? It's a truck, right? Why would you, why would you do that? It's not designed to stay up there for long periods of time. It's only designed to go up for maybe 24 to 48 hours. That's what it really was designed for. And if something goes wrong, it could the fuel cells it could stay up there for a week, by itself. You know. There were shuttle missions in the 90s where they carried extra consumables inside of the payload bay, and then you could stay up there for two weeks. Just, once again, you're going camping in a semi. That doesn't make any sense. You don't want to do that. The shuttle's only supposed to be up there for two days. That was the original plan. They're only up there for a second. It's a truck. It's not an RV. You don't go camping in it. Right? Fixed price? They could handle a fixed price if you buy in bulk, Black. It's just, that's just economics. You know? And yeah, Kevin, the other thing is why would you waste space inside of the payload bay on solar panels? 
right? Fuel cells make sense for the shuttle because it's supposed to be like an airplane. An airplane just doesn't infinitely fly around. They tried that in the 50s in the U.S. by demoing a... Um, here, you want to see one of the stupid ideas that came out of the Cold War? The NB-36. See what's on the tail there? It ain't carrying bombs. Would you go to a five-second boost just to simplify production? No. John, the beauty of the segmented booster is that you could go with one, two, three, four, or five segments. Northrop Grumman proved that you could do that. That's one thing that I would do with the SRBs. On a side note, though. So check this out. It turns out that Northrop Grumman did some research, and they figured out that with these segmented SRBs, you could run a five segment, you could run a two segment, a single segment, or a four segment, whatever. Unfortunately, this vehicle got scrapped because they didn't win a contract. But dude, check this out. These boosters are very similar to the shuttle boosters, right? That's a two segment shuttle booster. That's a single segment shuttle booster as the second stage. And the Omega rocket could go up to, they were planning on going up to a four segment booster up here. See that one? And this is when it was still orbital ATK, but you could just stack the segments. Interesting, right? I thought that was a capability that really should have been made. And then uh, Northrop Grumman decided that they wanted to keep going with Antares 230. Oops. Should have gone with A. Can you go back? What was on the rear of that plane? I will in a second. So, John, you could stack segmented boosters as much as you want. Now, don't get me wrong. This wouldn't really work with our new shuttle. But the reason why I even bring this up is because Northrop Grumman and Omega came up with a breakthrough for segmented solid rocket booster design. The Air Force actually paid them to figure this out. It's called... Uh, it's Well, now it's it was part of Omega, but now it's part of the BOLE program for NASA. Read. Carbon wound SRB casings. Carbon composite SRB casings right there. Oh yeah. SLS is going to fly with these. Oh yeah. Carbon composite. So instead of the steel casing segments, these are carbon. They are lighter and they are stronger than the shuttle SRBs. And these five segs... The new five segments for the Booster Obsolescence and Life Exped Expectancy Program. Basically, when they run out of steel casings for the SLS program that were left over from the shuttle program, they're switching to that. Those things, John, probably take about five to 6,000 pounds, so about 3,000 kilos off of the booster design. They're stronger and they're lighter, more Delta V. My new shuttle would have those. It would have these, yep. Yeah, my new shuttle would have those. Are we going straight through to ULA? <laughs> I don't know, maybe. <laughs> but yeah, John, my... The segments... And guys, you know what the crazy part is? They've already made them. These segments, the, the BOLE stuff is being manufactured right now. Like, the, look, there it is. I mean, it's a blurred out picture. But yeah, they're basically making the SRBs like a giant COPV. Because it works. What's a COPV but a pressure vessel? And now don't get me wrong, pressure and volume don't scale exactly the same, but it's the same idea. Like the helium COPVs that are inside of a rocket, like that one. Right? Actually, that's an SRB, but same idea. They're actually making this stuff right now. Look at the mandrel. Dude. Oh. Is that nuts or what? Could you recover the boosters with the increased Delta V? Sure. Why not? So my new shuttle, if we were going to do it, if we were going to bring the shuttle back, like I said, I'd need 30, 30 billion would be absolutely sure to get this done. 
I would have the carbon composite boosters, right? The carbon, the carbon casings for the boosters. We would have tough rock tiles on the shuttle. And uh, honestly, RS-25E, the RS-25E engines being retrofitted back here would pretty much be my three big ones. Everything else on the shuttle works just fine. Uh, I really like, I wouldn't go changing the landing gear. I would just make new ones. The landing gear works. It, they never had a problem with it. Because in order for the landing gear to stop working, you need gravity to stop working. And I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Another thing lost to the Challenger disaster. They were looking at that tech for the shuttle at one point. Yep, that's right. The ASRB program. The ASRB program in the 80s was... Nope, that's not going to give us... The Advanced Solid Rocket Booster Program. No, that's not giving us any good results there. Um, let's see. Uh, shuttle Pathfinder. So, Shuttle Pathfinder at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. Right there in Huntsville. Which is one of the gnarliest space flight museums around. I've never been, but... Those boosters that are on this shuttle stack with the Shuttle Pathfinder, which was the... Uh, the mass simulator for the shuttle for testing the, all the shuttle equipment during the program. It's made out of wooden steel to mimic how heavy the shuttle was. And they used it to test all the brackets that would lift the shuttle up uh, is up here. But that external tank is a real external tank. That's a real one. And these boosters are the ASRBs. They abandoned them after Challenger because not safe. Those are carbon wound SRBs. Yeah, it's nothing new. So you could change your segment count based on payload. Uh, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that, John, because think about the differential dry mass. The payload only is 25 tons of a 2,000 ton vehicle. Now, don't get me wrong. I suppose if you put like a fuel tank inside of the shuttle and used it for some type of refueling, then yeah, sure. Or if you were carrying something super heavy, they did look into using five segment boosters for the shuttle program, but they never did it. Um, yeah, they never did it. Uh, but let's see why it wouldn't work. But the attachment points wouldn't work with the shorter ones. They, Mutter, they did look into it. They did look they did look into changing the attachment point and putting it on the second segment and then stacking another segment on top of it. So on a four segment booster that flew on the shuttle, you have your aft segment, you have your aft mid, your forward mid, and then your forward segment, and then your 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 nose cone and parachute system up at the top. What they would have done is aft segment, that's the one with the nozzle on it. Then you have a aft mid, uh, and then you have a middle section, or no, you have your aft mid, and then you have your forward, forward middle, and then you have your top segment that attaches into the ET. And then instead of the nose cone and parachutes on that segment, they would have stacked another segment and then the other, and the nose cones on top of that. The SRBs would have looked ridiculous. They would have looked as tall as the external tank, but it could work. It could work. The shuttle engines, the shuttle engines could throttle, and they could compensate for it. Especially if you squeezed them out to 109, like what they're doing now. Sure, why not? They looked, like I said, NASA looked into it. I've read PDFs about it. They were, they, it's doable. If not a little strange, but it's doable. Yeah, Direct had plans for the five segments as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it, like. That's what I would do with my shuttle program. I would I would get tough rock tiles on that thing. We would I would enter a raptor style testing regime for RS25s and SSMEs and literally squeeze all the performance that I could out of that design. Uh and make sure that they work without a doubt. They work as reliably as an aircraft engine. Like what basically what Elon's doing with Raptors. I would fire an RS25 every day on the test stand. They would be firing all the time. All the time. Like, do a full duration burn every single day. Do not change anything. Just do it. To see how well you could refurbish those engines. That was the problem with... That was one of the big problems with the shuttle program. They did not do enough testing. There was not enough validation. Because they... 
they're building a space plane. So they're trying to build something that flies like an airplane that goes into space, but they tested it like a rocket. How many hours does an aircraft need to fly around and be tested before it can carry people on it? With test pilots, right? How many times? Dude, an, air, an airframe needs to have like thousands of hours on it before the FAA even bothers certifying it for people. Thousands of hours, takeoff, landing, takeoff, landing, flying around, high altitude, low altitude, high altitude with the gear up, low altitude with the gear up, flaps, whatever. There is so much testing that needs to be done for an airplane for it to be certified to fly people, for it to be human rated. I, I don't know why if they were going to build a space plane, why they wouldn't test like that. But I actually, I actually do know why. It's because they didn't have enough money to do it. They certified the shuttle for operational capability after four flights. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Nope. Stop, stop. Yeah, Rev, we put modern avionics in that thing. I mean, the flight computer was coded in HAL S, which is not used by anything anymore. Um, yeah, modern avionics inside of the shuttle, you could probably save way more mass. Uh, yeah, you probably save a ton using modern modern rad shielded avionics, you know. And don't get me wrong, they did upgrade the avionics on the shuttle eventually. Uh, but yeah, I I would say that you know with all these modifications that we're making, and once again, guys, this it's not as linear as how we say like oh if we just upgrade the tiles to tough rock, oh if we just change the boosters to carbon composite, oh if we just make the shuttle engines reliable, those are not easy problems to solve. But if we did solve those problems, theoretically, I, dude, we could probably increase the shuttle's payload capacity by five, maybe 10 tons. Easy. Oh yeah. I would say five to 10 somewhere in there. So we could boost its performance up to 30. But here's the other question. Why? Why, why? You're not gonna need 30 tons. I don't think you could fit 30 tons of lead inside of the shuttle's payload bay. But it'd be cool to know that you could do it. All those other upgrades that I just talked about aren't really in the name of moving more payload into orbit. No, no. Those are there to make sure that the shuttle flies a lot. <laughs> That's why I would implement those, not to increase payload capacity, even though that would be one of the things that does happen, right? Why would you prefer them to test it as hard and as long as, as hard as long as they should have, but end up getting it banned for being too imperfect and dangerous? What, would you prefer them to test it as hard and as long as they should have, but end up getting it banned for being too imperfect and too dangerous? Um, no, nearly. I I think, and this is something that I think Buran got right. It needs an autopilot. It needs an autopilot all the way back down. At least for some of the missions, and then put people on it, and then have a redundant capability. An airliner nowadays can land itself. It can land itself. But you're not going to do that. You want pilots on board. I don't want to be on an aircraft where nobody's at the helm. Or nobody's at the yoke. It's not a ship, right? Like, I don't want that. Do you want that? I don't want that. They should have They should have designed it that way. They should have introduced autopilot upgrades to the shuttle so it could theoretically land itself. Like, how the shuttle worked was re-entry was automated and then they would transition the flight controls over. They basically shut the autopilot off and then go manually land it. With modern, and that's what I think Rev means with modern avionics, you can make the shuttle land by itself. Just like Starship lands by itself, right? Or Falcon 9, for instance. You could do that. The Russians, the, or not the Russians, the Soviets did it in the 80s. The X-37 does it. That would be the way to test the shuttle. To put that thing through its paces remote, remotely. And then use a, anthropomorphic test dummies, like what Dragon does, and what Starliner does, and what Orion does. To make sure that it's started after flight. But higher frequency of flight would be the key. Would an upgraded shuttle be able to handle more down mass? Uh, yes and no, zombie. The shuttle's primary, the shuttle's primary constriction for down mass payload is size. Believe it or not, the shuttle basically only has about half of the payload bay for down mass capability. The reason why is because the reason why is well the same reason why a seven thirty seven or an A three twenty, for instance, has a cargo bay at the front and a cargo bay at the back. Because when the shuttle comes in for landing, you ain't uh, not uh, all the thrust in the world ain't gonna save you from having a bad center of mass center of lift relationship. 
That ain't gonna save you, right? If this thing is carrying down mass over here, your center of mass is way off your center of lift, right? If you're carrying it in the forward segments of the payload bay, that ain't gonna work. There's only so much trim you can introduce to the body flap and the speed brake to compensate for having your center of lift and center of mass completely out of whack. So the shuttle either had really, really, if it was coming down with payloads up here, they were either really light, enough for the body flap to trim, trim that thing out and fly straight, like if shuttle carried the airlock for the space shuttle missions, the airlock was light enough to not throw it out of whack. But if you had like a fuel tank full of fuel up here and you're carrying that down, that would be enough to screw it up. It would just nosedive into the atmosphere and probably kill everyone on board. So to keep the center of mass in line and keep everything nice and copacetic, you really only have about half of the payload base volume, and that's the key, volume. You only have half of the payload base volume there at your disposal for down mass capability because, once again, you don't want your payload center of mass and the shuttle center of mass to be too far apart from each other. If the cargo COM and the payloads and the orbiter center of mass are too far apart, and you can't compensate for it by trimming it out, you're gonna, you, you won't land, you won't fly. You trust a plane to land itself? Well, sure, Josh, but, and don't get me wrong, most pilots are flying that thing, like if it's, if it's too, like if you're not flying, if you're flying instrument flight rules, it's basically autopilot to the last second where the pilots take control and then land it. And I don't know, but simultaneously, I wouldn't say that pilots are glorified bus drivers right now, but even though that's how we treat them, I think that's the stupidest thing in the world. You're trusting these people with your life. They should be paid for it, but I don't think that switching to all computers and taking humans out of the loop is a good idea at all. No way, because you never know, man. There's too many unknown unknowns with a flight. You know, you never know. What if there's a computer malfunction? I'd want a person at the helm to be, I keep saying helm, it's not a helm, it's not a, not a ship. Uh, I'd want a person at the controls to be able to recognize that and override that capability and take the thing down manually. I would prefer to have that actually. You trust Uber drivers with your life too, Kappa? Um, Yeah, I think the, the, the physics circumstances involved here, S, are a little different between an Uber driver and, you know, this thing that flies into space or an airplane. But, uh, yeah. Didn't a computer malfunction with the ISS docking and someone took over? As far as I can remember, J-Speed, no shuttle ISS docking was automatic. The shuttle had manual docking systems. They had manual docking systems all the way to the end because that's what worked. Oh, not shuttle. Yeah, Soyuz has had some weird problems with its docking system in the past. Yeah, and the cosmonaut, the command, the cosmonaut commander on board did take over. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's happened. Mm -hmm. I'd want humans in the loop just in case. Even Dragon, Dragon flies automatically to the, to the docking port. It it automatically aligns with the V bar on the station and it automatically docks using the Dragon eyes, a lidar based system. But humans are in the loop to override it just in case, and humans can perform a manual docking. They tested that during DM2. They didn't test a manual docking, but they did test manual control systems on Dragon just in case. Bob and Doug tested that right before they docked to the ISS on the, in May of 2020. Yeah, uh, on uh, Dragon Endeavor. Didn't Cygnus have issues on approach today too? I'm not 100% sure. I know that one of Cygnus' solar panels didn't go all the way, but yeah. Yeah, progress also crashed into Mir on a side note. Uh, yeah, that's a good enough reason for me to want humans in the loop because that you don't really want a ship crashing into your space station. That really doesn't end well. <laughs> Kaden, nice. Hey, Valex, ciao, come stai? Uh, bene. What are you doing today? Well, right now we're talking about upgrading shuttle systems, but we do need to dial these boosters in. But yeah, now now is a good time, I think, to segue into it. 
Starliner test, would it have been all right if there was a person on board? Yes, Biz. Actually, uh, Mike Fink said in the post uh, OFD1 press, the post OFD1 launch conference that if they said that him, if him and Nicole Mann were at the controls, they would have say, they would have recognized it and Starliner would have gotten to the station just fine. They did say that in the press interview. And I'd be hard pressed to, to think that a, a NASA astronaut saying that he could have saved the spacecraft would be wrong about that. Mike Fink, uh, isn't uh, isn't any uh, spring chicken when it comes to flying into space. He's a very, very distinguished NASA astronaut. He's flown a lot. They just put up an article about a video that I linked before. Cool. Yeah, satellite servicing, John. Satellite servicing is a big anticipated demand in the future, which is, once again, this thing... This thing has the market cornered on satellite servicing. You know why? It's the only thing to ever do it. Except for the mission extension vehicles that are made by Northrop Grumman. But they can't do what this thing can do. No way. Except you never went back to that plane. I actually kept this open for you, Element, just in case. So, they tried making a plane that could fly continuously for a long time. It's the NB-36. This thing has a nuclear reactor buried in the back of it. That's why it has a, a radiation or a fallout symbol. Well, not a fallout symbol, a radiation symbol on the on the tail note the intakes got to keep it cold before it melts yep they tried this in the mid 50s putting a nuclear reactor on this thing the idea element is that the b36 can just stay flying it'll just stay flying and the nuclear reactor will provide power right it'll provide power to all your systems and then you could swap these things out to an electric motor or something or jet engines with in-flight refueling or something, right? Uh, and this thing could literally just stay up there as long... It'll just stay up there. It'll always have power. Even if you had all your engines shut off, it'll just stay up there and generate power. And if you had an electrical... If you had an electric engine on this thing, tapping into the electrical power from the nuclear reactor, it is literally a miniature nuke that was into the back of this thing. If you, you tap that electrical energy, they could just stay on. It could stay flying indefinitely. You would, it would literally not have to land for decades. It's not a bad idea. But nuclear reactors that are down in here inside of the atmosphere need an insane amount of rad shielding. That's the problem. You are, you would, your, your crew is way too close to that nuclear reactor. And you would literally ghoulify your crew before they could figure out what's going on. They'd land the plane after 20 years of being up there to be like, oh, what's up with you, smooth skin? So how would you change crew? Same way you do in-flight refueling, Denny. But instead of a fuel, a fuel line, literally another plane would fly up and dock to said plane. That was the idea. They never did that. They never did anything like that. But that was where they wanted to go with it. Isn't that like a nuclear submarine? Yep, Alex. Yeah, that's the big that's the big one. But once again, nuclear submarines can be heavy enough where you can rad shield your reactor and you can always keep it cool. You can always keep the reactor cool by using the ocean, which is why nuclear submarines can stay down there. You can make them big enough. Building that type of rad shielding into an airframe like this means you would have a plane that would be bigger than like a spruce goose. It'd be bigger than a C5, bigger than a 747, bigger than an A380. I mean, a B36 is bigger than all of those planes. That's a B50 right there flying with it, or a B29. Uh, I think, yeah, yeah, that is a that is a B50. See the, see the underside thing, Majigger? The B29 isn't exactly a small plane by any means. The B36 was gigantic. It, it was huge. I mean, backward-facing engines. <laughs> but... Yeah, Motorman. Mm hmm. But see, that, there's therein lies the problem. So you're gonna make a plane that's the size of, that's like the size of Strato Launcher or even bigger. You okay? Where are you gonna land this thing? Where are you gonna land it? What uh, what are what ground facilities would be able to service a system like this? What if the plane has an emergency and has to land somewhere and there's no runway that's long enough? You're basically screwed. See what I mean? Six turning, four burning. Yep. One glowing, yeah. 
the B-36 was such a bad design that they had to retrofit it with jet engines just to get it to fly as advertised. Not, not, not kidding. That's why six turning, four burning. Turns out that if you have backward facing propellers with a radial piston engine, uh, that's air cooled, doesn't really work too well. Those radial piston engines on like V-29s had trouble, had problems with overheating. And that's with the engine flying basically first, getting laminar flow inside of it. Turns out if you take that same thing and you put it on the backside of a wing, and the wing is in the way, <laughs> they don't cool themselves very well. B-36s were notorious for catching on fire. Yeah, more than, more than a regular bomber. So why were they backwards? Convair thought they could get more performance by pushing, by facing the propellers backwards. More aerodynamic this way. But John, you're introducing another problem here. And this is what makes planes like the Rutan plane, or any other plane with backward-facing engines, that's what makes those planes pretty dang smart. But you still, the reason why is because you have a big problem to solve here. Your big problem is, okay, you have a propeller, and your propeller is constantly, when the propeller blade is on the bottom, it's getting really high-pressure air. But when it's on the top, you're getting you're getting uh, non-laminar flow. It's very low pressure over the top of a wing. So how do you make it so the engine doesn't overheat? Because the propeller's only pretty much doing work when, the, when it's in the downward position. Hard problem to solve. That's why you don't see many planes with the propellers facing backwards like this. Because turns out your propeller doesn't work too well when there's a wing in the way. Because the propeller is getting dirty air. That's why they retrofitted it with jet engines to get it to work right. Because this never worked with as this never worked as prescribed. Those propeller engines would have to work so freaking hard, they would overheat, and they would catch fire. And that's one thing you do not want your plane to do when it's flying around. You do not want it to catch fire. Because you know why? Aluminum, great rocket fuel. Very flammable. Oh yeah, yeah. Aluminum's very flammable. You get a nice even burn with aluminum. It's very good solid rocket fuel. Yeah, that's why. Like if there's a plane crash. And the plane catches on fire and everybody gets away. You know, the plane looks like it's relatively intact. If it catches on fire, the whole thing goes up like a tinderbox. In the case of a meltdown, you can dive a sub so the ocean can cover the blast. What if you have a meltdown in one of these? Yeah, yeah. They wrote off the idea as being really, really stupid. It's an interesting thing, though. It's not a bad... Like, that's actually kind of cool. I appreciate the idea, and it could be done. I think this could be made safe, but at what cost? Like, how long would it take to dial this thing in? Just like just like the shuttle. How long would it have taken to dial this thing in? And that's, once again, why I thought that, you know, why I think that the shuttle should have been able to land itself from the start. Now, don't get me wrong. They did, after Columbia, they did carry a hot wiring system on orbiters just in case an orbiter had to land itself. Yeah, they could have done it. it you needed to hot wire the flight deck to the avionics bay. But they did carry they did carry the wiring to be able to do it. You would literally need to take the thing apart on orbit. But they did it after Columbia just in case they needed to dispose of an orbiter. Okay, back to shuttle servicing. Could you get it to Geo? <clears throat> the shuttle? Oh hell no. No, 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 no. John, this wouldn't get out to Geo. Not by itself. But if you put an upper stage inside of this thing, and then you put a crew tank on in, in here, right? And that crew tank had that little RMS that you see in the in the things that you're linking. Sure, why not? Stage goes up there with the crew, with an airlock. They go out, service, they, they grab the satellite, they grapple it, they dock it to the front of the crew module, right? Do the satellite servicing, right? EVA out there, do the servicing. Then they come back down, right? Shuttle redocks, brings the payload back in, crew gets back onto the shuttle. Comes right back down. I know that that has that capability because that's what it was designed to do. Shuttle was designed to do that from the start. Discovery, go at throttle up. That's what it's supposed to do. They were, John, they were talking about, and you've probably seen me talk about this before, so I won't talk about it too much. They were gonna put a Centaur upper stage inside of the shuttle. That would literally give the shuttle basically SLS Block 1 capability. Yeah. 
If so, if the shuttle launched with the Centaur and an Orion inside of it and then deployed it and sent the Orion out to the moon, the shuttle could have done that. Why not? Of course it could. This was sacrificed on the altar of safety, though, because of Challenger. They actually built one. They were going to do the Galileo mission with it. They had a Centaur G Prime ready to go. It's sitting... That's at Glenn. It's at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. But yeah. Oh yeah, they were already doing that. There's a picture of them integrating the payload, integrating Galileo to it. Yeah, it was going to fly in 1986. Yep. There you go. Centaur stages. RL-10s have infinite restartability. You, as long as physics works, that you can restart an RL-10. As long as you have some tank head pressure, you're good to go. Ullage pressure. Your, your limit on a Centaur being able to restart is literally boil off and uh, helium tank. Ullage pressure. Hey, Black Raptor, 92 month resub. Did you see this that I sent to you on Discord? I don't know what to make of that, Panta. Speaking of history stuffs, Boeing is using reclining chairs like NASA to suit up. Sunny. Cool. You could get Ellis pressure with you. The Centaur, I mean, Tori Bruno has said, Tessa, the Centaur can be made. You, you can make it to mitigate boil off and having a vehicle that can go and dock and bring the thing back down after. Why do you think I wanted to get the shuttle ready to go? Anyway, good conversations, dude. Dudes. Yeah, NXN. What's up, dude? 25 month resub. Thank you. They were going to test it in late 1986, Kim. Yep. It, it was that, that, that stage was built for a mission, for the Galileo mission. And they ended up putting the Galileo mission on an IUS, which is a Titan solid rocket fuel upper stage. And that's the upper stage that the shuttle flew with in its payload bay for the rest of its career after they said Centaur was too dangerous. They said, you know, the hydrogen leaks, the, the reason why it was axed is because of the hydrogen leaking inside of the payload bay. So they didn't want hydrogen pooling inside of the payload bay. That could be dangerous. You know, there's no way to purge, there's no way to purge it, purge it out, right? I find that kind of funny. Two reasons. I, they were worried about hydrogen pooling inside of the shuttle, but there's these things that are literally right next to that. Those things do a lot of hydrogen things. Now, the aft shuttle segment on the real shuttle would have been purged out with helium or nitrogen. So if they were able to purge that out and do that in there, I don't know. I don't understand why they couldn't do that here, but it's none of my business. Also, there's this big thing that's flying like right next to the shuttle when it launches, that's full, also full of hydrogen. And that thing pumps hydrogen into... Now don't get me wrong, I know that there's a gigantic bulkhead here and hydrogen pooling in the payload bay is not hydrogen pooling in the engine section. I'm not smarter than NASA. But also at the same time, I'm pretty sure they just got cold feet and we're just like, nah, never mind. That system could have been made to work. I'm pretty dang sure. When are you planning to launch? Um, Kev, we have to get our boosters dialed in, and I'll do that now, uh, and then we'll launch in a, I don't know, a couple minutes. So, the problem that I'm having here, guys, is I'm getting the thrust curves on the boosters correct. They're not correct. So, we were at basically a dead end when we stopped this on Thursday last week. So, what I did was I, I put the boosters back in, and I reprogrammed them. I reprogrammed the thrust curve on the boosters for Jebstone, with the Jebstone floor, for Ascent Profile. Um... This gets the boosters pretty close to where we want. Um, but I had a buddy that uh, that sent me over a nice pediff here. And we'll see if we can start tweaking them right. Basically, what I'm trying to do, Kev, is dial these things in so they work like the real one and they get the point across and up. I'm basically trying to squeeze all the performance out of the booster that I possibly can. <clears throat> so, I had one of my buddies that, uh, <laughs> that 
that's uh, a little bit of a nerd help me figure this out and don't get me wrong chat was already doing that too um so let me read what he said I decided to do a bit of work on the SRBs for the shuttle and KSP. I found that the thrust curve for I found the thrust curve for the SDS-35 boosters on NASA Technical. NASA Technical is called NTRS or NTRS for short. Is a really good way to learn about NASA systems that are declassified. That's where I learn a lot of stuff. It's basically a repository of all the scientific stuff that NASA has done. And you can find a lot of good stuff in here if you really know what to look for. It's on page 29. Thiokol's logo is a banger. <laughs> I like that. Thiokol Corporation. I love old school logos, Loopy. Like the baseball text. That's cool, man. NTRS is dangerous. It's a rabbit hole and you can get lost in it. Absolutely. freaking -lutely. There we go. There we go. Oh, there we go. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I assumed a 100 to 110 second separation event, which is different than the in real life shuttle boosters, as well as being able to set every value in a cal controller. The burn is set. So you're ejecting the SRBs with some residual fuel left. It totally runs out of fuel. It, it totally runs out of fuel at approximately 137 seconds. I put some notes explaining what each column is for. I tried it out in KSP and had some decent success with the SRBs on the pad. The trouble I was running into was the cal controller lagging behind the values. That's the problem that we were having. The cal controller lagging behind values, so I, I set for some reason. Yeah, it, it doesn't ramp the thrust correctly if you try to smush it too much. I think if you have the thrust value um, go below the total impulse of the booster, it won't ramp the thrust down. At least that's what it, that's what I've been able to figure out. It's cool that my buddy figured that out too. It wasn't a crazy discrepancy for the duration and gets in the ballpark of the right thrust every time. You've got way more experience when K with KSP than I do, so maybe you know of a workaround. Feel free to use or disregard. Uh, feel free to use or disregard. I will use this, thank you very much. Adjusted KSP adjusted Clydesdale fuel flow versus time. Okay. I got to get this dialed in and then we'll fly it. Give me one second. I just needed to write my buddy and say thank you. TLDR, the two red column X and Y R E L are the coordinates to input into the cal controller. The premise is to find the area under the curve of the graph of fuel rate, kilograms a second, and time seconds, kilogram a second, time seconds to find the total fuel used. Yeah.
Column A, the original time values of the shuttle booster segments. Column B, the adjusted time values for KSP based approximately on a cutoff of 100 seconds. Column C is the shuttle thrust values, the adjusted values to input into the cow controller in KSP. Column E is the adjusted fuel, fro the adjusted fuel flow from a Clydesdale at the adjusted thrust values. Time, F is time intervals between each data point. Column G is the change in Y between a data point and the previous one. And column Where's column H? Oh, it's empty. Column I is partial area under the thrust curve for that time segment, and column J is the remaining area under that curve for time segment. Column K is the total area under each time segment. Sum is the total fuel used. Columns M through P are reference pulled from KSP and include a total fuel of the Clydesdale and fuel flow rate. Yeah, okay. Turns out that getting the thrust curve right to match the impulse of the booster is tough. So, what does this mean? What what is all that crap? If that if you're looking at that, you're like, <laughs> uh, yeah, EJ, that yeah, that sucks. Am I am I right? Long story short, uh, here let's just we'll make a uh, CTS five booster test stand. Master file for testing thrust curves on SRBs. Modified. 88. Yep. No, that's not how that keypad works. Okay. So there's this thing in rocket science called total impulse. All right. There's totals, there's total impulse, and then there's specific impulse, all right? So specific impulse is a little bit different. You use specific impulse for finding out how efficient, basically how efficiently a booster burns its fuel. But every booster does have a total impulse. What is that? Now, what's, to, okay, so what does that mean? All right, so long story short, there's only a certain amount of energy that this thing will use, no matter how you, no matter what you do with it. There's only a certain amount of fuel in here. Even if you burn a little bit less, a little bit more, whatever, you're still it's still going to expend the same amount of energy every time. Long story short, you're you're the amount of fuel that's plugged into this thing or the amount of fuel that's loaded into the Clydesdale is only going to get you a certain amount of delta V every time. Uh, it doesn't matter how long the booster burns for or how short the booster burns for you're always gonna get the same characteristic energy. You're always gonna get the same impulse of energy out of it every time, no matter what you do with the thrust curve. Right? You might get a longer burn time if you lower your thrust limiter over time, like what we're doing with the cow controllers, right? But at the end of the day, this thing is always gonna put out the same amount of energy. The only way you're gonna put out more energy is if you put more fuel in it. Enter, the fi enter a five segment booster, right? That's the only way. You're only gonna get so much so much explosion out of a certain amount of solid rocket fuel. It doesn't matter how you cut it. So that's what total impulse is, right? Uh, the booster is only going to have a certain amount of total impulse. It's only going to have a certain amount of characteristic energy. Basically, there's only so much explosion that this thing can produce. So what I'm trying to do is we're trying to time it. We're trying to time this so when my boosters need to separate from the shuttle stack, right? They're ta they're tailing off in thrust. Basically, I the real shuttle when it's when it separate when it separated its boosters, right? The boosters were still firing. They were still on technically. They were still on. But they were not the boosters were on, but they were not making enough TWR to be able to like separate and shoot past the shuttle like a missile, right? The shuttle with its three engines and the external tanks TWR was higher than the SRBs at separation. Basically, they would separate them when the SRBs are no longer providing useful thrust, right? They're not they're not providing useful thrust because they're because the chamber pressure is too low for them to basically they're not worth the weight anymore. But they're still firing. They're still producing some residual. I'm trying to time it so we can 
So we can come up with a thrust curve that makes it so the total impulse of the booster goes out slightly after booster separation. So I basically want my boosters to ramp down and stay off or stay on at like a, a linear thrust rate where just like the real shuttle, if I separated the boosters, their thrust to weight, right? is lower than the shuttle's three main engines at full power with the external tank. That will get us the right shuttle separation. It'll get us a separation that looks correct. Now, don't get me wrong, we do have one that, the, the program curve that I have from Jebstone 4 does work. It does work, but the boosters actually last a little bit too long. Thrust curve. All right, cool. So let's go over here and we will bind. There's this cool thing that you can do with with Cal controllers. These are axis fields. So they're dynamic fields for the Cal controller. We can bind our thrust limiter or I mean, heck we could do throttle too. I suppose it really doesn't matter, does it chat? We can bind the thrust limiter here. And so this right here. So what's the total burn time for a Clydesdale? Uh, if we go into the booster. So the booster producing 100, like with the throttle at maximum, you basically hit it. You hit space bar right now and it fires. That should give us a burn time. Uh, we can actually check over here. It should give us a burn time of 86 seconds. So you know what we're gonna do before we go and screw with this thing? We're gonna we're gonna test that right now. Let's get the timer out. Keep throttling SRBs. It is something that is doable, guys. Yep, that's doable in real life. You can deep throttle an SRB, absolutely. freaking lootly The reason why you can deep throttle an SRB is because its combustion chamber volume changes over time. So you can throttle them. The problem is, it's not real-time throttle. You can program them. Real SRBs do this, not via some type of an electronic or whatever. Real SRBs do this by how the fuel is physically packed inside of the segments on the shuttle booster. If each segment is packed in a different way, you're going to create different, you're going to make different amounts of thrust. Now, in these pictures, actually, you can tell right in this picture right here off of, oh, off of Pinterest. Mm -hmm, yes. Look, look at this picture right here. See, it's wider and then it tapers in and then it stays the same and then it tapers out. See what I mean? That will throttle, that will ramp the boosters. The boosters will throttle up at, at liftoff, right? They'll go basically up to maximum thrust, like right at liftoff, right? And then the boosters with their program thrust curve will throttle down with the shuttle engine for max Q. And then the boosters will pick up and thrust again. And the engine, the shuttle engines will throttle up to get past max Q, right? And then the boosters will eventually flame out over time. Hello, X37. That's what that thrust curve looks like. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to scale that into KSP to get it to tail off correctly. Are you aware of the throttle delay that this thing has? If I recall correctly, someone mentioned as to why it was throttling, as to why throttle was still decreasing the last time you had this on the shuttle as you were trying to dump them at the right time. If I were you, I'd get the thrust of this thing graphed out. Um, actually, that's the message that I was sending back to my buddy that helped me with those programmed curves. How much of a diameter change are we talking here? Well, Kirinov, depending on what you want, the shuttles have a... So it's a progressive, then regressive, then progressive, and then regressive thrust curve. Um, it's not so much like that view is kind of misleading a little bit with that taper. Um, in the industry, solid rocket boosters or solid rocket fuel is called grain. And how you pack the fuel inside depends on the shape different shapes will give you a different programmable thrust curve see what i mean that's a regressive thrust curve right thrust will go down as you increase chamber pressure geometry 
You gotta remember, when the SRB fires, this open area right there is its combustion chamber. SRBs, because you're burning the fuel, that all the fuel is stored inside of the combustion chamber because it's a solid rocket motor. Your combustion chamber geometry gets bigger over time. So, if your combustion chamber geometry is bigger, right, and your your surface area of propellant that's getting exposed to the, like, the inside of the combustion chamber, if that surface area gets bigger, right, the thrust can go up over time. It's a progressive thrust curve. Even though your combustion chamber geometry is increasing, you still have fuel to burn, so you can sustain a bigger explosion. Now, there are ways to pack the grain to get it to not do that, Right? So the taper, like tapering the segment, like if you looked at that view from the side, it looks like it's just this, right? But that's not entirely true. Some segments are packed like this with that star pattern to get you that increase in thrust. And then as it, you know, as it burns off these triangular points here, right? And then it, it start, it'll start to ramp up. And then once you're, once you start to tail, like you, once your combustion chamber geometry gets too big, uh, enough to the point where your chamber pressure goes down, they'll tail like that. See what I mean? The boat anchor is what the sh some of the shuttle segments can do. Actually, the shuttle segments are more this, but different segments can be packed with different shapes. One of the segments could be a star pattern. The other one, to get it to, t to taper off and thrust. The other one could be a progressive. That's the beauty of segmented solid rocket motors, and that's what makes the seg segmented SRB so dang safe. They'll throttle for you. They'll complete an ascent profile for you, just how you physically pack the fuel inside. And you can combine segments to make the safest ascent profile that you can think of. This is what I'm trying to figure out right now. Alex, I made up the measurements already. I got this to line up with Captain's data. Oh. Each segment was different, Josh, yeah. Because they would get the throttle to go up, they would get it to go down, they would get it to stay straight, and then get it to go up and then tail off again. Yeah, so it went up, down, like, up and down, like, uh, like that. So, that segment right there looks like it's pretty straight, and then it tails off, and then it plateaus and goes up a little bit, and then it tails off again. This is max Q right there, 50 seconds in. Shuttle throttle up. The shuttle throttle up command is pretty much issued at about little over a minute into the flight so right here right when the srbs hit their peak thrust and then they throttle up the engines as the srbs tail off and then because like you can physically see the segments right here that's the first segment right there right there's the second segment there's the third segment that's the fourth segment you can see the segments burning almost and it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that because you're not burning top to bottom the srbs burn fuel outwards but yeah, it's a there's a lot of math there because now we're you, you have to take geometry and combustion chamber volume and combustion chamber surface area and yeah, combine them all to make a, the right curve. It's actually really crazy how smart these things are. It's another thing about the shuttle program that's just so smart, dude. Show the SRB in that good NASA PDF. I I, I think I got the point across, dudes. Aglugs, I think I got it. We good. Oh yeah, that's the composite the animation that Hayes did. Yeah, that gets that drives the point across pretty dang well. Yeah, this is a Hayes Gray art video here. Watch. SRBs aren't smart themselves, but the chemical and mechanical pro programming that goes into them is. And City Robo, at the end of the day, that's what you want from rockets. You don't want the system to be complicated. You want it to be simple. You can complicate the stuff on the ground. That's fine, right? The engineering behind it is complicated, but operating principles sh principle should be simple, which is why I'll say to this day, the stigma that people think that SRBs aren't safe is stupid. It's one of the safest ways to get into space. Yeah, you can't shut it. You can't shut the thing off, right? Yeah, I get it. But 
and you're not really afforded engine out capability, even though you really could, you could just cluster a bunch of SRVs together and that would give you engine out capability just like you would with anything else. But if you have a scenario where your primary propulsion system does fail, you could still complete the mission, but that means your, your vehicle is not working as intended. That's bad engineering. Now, don't get me wrong, having engine out capability is probably for the better, but that's a lot of extra engineering just for that extra safety. I'd rather, I'd almost rather have a simpler system. A simpler system with less moving parts that's less likely to fail. That's actually a, that sounds right in my head. That sounds like what you should have with rockets, right? Not being able to shut down a, a controlled explosion is kind of a risk factor though. Sure enough, it, it's not though. Like that's the thing. How is it a risk factor? In what scenario, in what scenario with a liquid fuel rocket when your primary propulsion system fails, would you want the, oh, it's okay. It happened. Like I get it. Like there's Falcon 9 and there's engine out capability, but the, the, it really comes back to it. The problems are problems with rockets. You don't want your rocket to have a problem. That's bad engineering. You know, oh, well, what if it fails? Well, if it fails, that means you didn't do your homework good enough. And there's no C minus here when it comes to grades with rockets. C minus means someone's going to get killed, right? Liquid or solid, that doesn't matter. You really don't want to do that. That's frowned upon. So like, think about all the time it would take to get nine liquid fuel engines to work. And then all the time it would take to get that thing to work right the operating principle is simple there's two moving parts the gimbal and the igniter and that's it that's it two moving parts that's more time to make this safer there's a reason why the shuttle used srbs they because the stigma that they're not safe because of some based off of some o-ring failure is a man that's a management problem challenger was a management problem it wasn't an engineering problem that's why i hate the term design flaw Oh, it's a design flaw. Uh, I didn't intend it to do that. Well, if you didn't intend it to do that, you didn't do your homework good enough. The rockets, will, the stack will always tell you something. It'll tell you something, just like if you run code and it doesn't do what you want it to do. Is that okay? Anal anomalous code like that is not something that you want on release, right? <laughs> design flaw is design flaw means you suck at what you do. <laughs> I I don't I don't like I don't like that term. It doesn't make any sense. It, it's it's probably they probably coined that term as a way to explain it to people but in engineering constructs design flaws means your engineering was not good enough to get the thing to do what you wanted it to do it's doing something that you're not that it's not doing it's not a design flaw that's engineering deviance that's a different that's not the same thing but people conflate those terms all the time they are not the same exactly Kiranov. i'd rather have my first stage or my booster systems be really, really simple, right? Now, don't get me wrong. With this design, right? And this is what I mean about a management problem. With this booster design, right? With the twin O-ring design that they were working on, that they had during, up until basically Challenger, it's not that it was a bad design. The real problem with that is that well, they were using the booster in a scenario where the booster wasn't designed to work. That's like buying a Prius and then going off-roading with it and then complaining that it doesn't work right. Oh, my Prius is stuck in the mud. Well, it's stuck in the mud because it's really not designed to do that. Now, is it? Simultaneously, if you have like a tank and you go driving that around on roads, oh, my tank sank into the road and now it doesn't work. Well, tanks really aren't designed to drive on roads. You know what I'm saying? I mean, don't get me wrong. I know the armchair armchair generals are going to come out and be like, well, I know about the rubber treads. I, I, I know. I get it. I get it. I get it. In warfare, the roads are probably already wrecked anyway. So, yeah, that's why they transport tanks on trucks and stuff instead of just driving them over. You know? I think it's because I had that image in my head of the shuttle explosion where you see the SRBs flying off. Well, Kirinov, the Thiokol engineers at the time, 
Thigh engineers at the time freaking said don't launch it, and they did anyway. They they took their Prius off roading, and then it got stuck in the mud. And now everybody hates solid rocket boosters because of it. Be not because of solid rocket boosters being bad, but because they got somebody killed. But they didn't get they didn't get somebody killed because of their engineering. They got somebody killed because somebody had no idea what they were doing and had no business running a shuttle program was running a shuttle program. And that goes back to the original thing that I was saying. Engineering without analysis and numbers is an opinion. And opinions are irrelevant in rocket science. Opinions get people killed. It's cold hard facts, dude. I hate to be very straightforward about it, but that's that's pretty much how that works. Anyway, this thing should last how long? Let's see. We have an 86 second burn time. So, let me get my stopwatch out. This is just the default test wheat. I'm going to get my stopwatch out. Ready? One, this is with no programmable curve. Just, this is our basically control test. One, two, three. So it said 86 seconds. That That's one minute, 26, one minute, 26. Gee, I wonder where they got the idea for that from, Forge. SRBs are a great idea. I, I will say this to this day. In fact, I will say if somebody rolled around with a design that was like Ares 1, you could corner the market on low Earth orbit. You could potentially even beat Falcon 9 because your SRBs are recoverable. But the fact that they're so ridiculously easy to manufacture and they can be reused, the segments can be reused over time, you could theoretically, if employed in scale, even expend your boosters and make something that gets more payload to space than Falcon 9 for less price. Yep. Okay, that's right. They knew the O-rings would blow out. They almost they almost always did, and they were made to weld themselves together. But when you have the coldest launch and two high upper level winds, they couldn't weld themselves properly. Yeah, whoever said welding it is a good solution, is a triple redundancy, needs to be slapped. Jared, like, slapped. And then never be allowed near a spacecraft or anything to do with spaceflight ever again. Yeah. Yeah, like slap chop slap wheat. Yeah, that whoever whoever thought that that was a good idea, basically they knew the Jared's right. They knew the O rings were failing, dude. And what they did when the O rings failed, the SRB gases went into the the cavity where the O rings would were, and they superheated the steel segments and they basically welded them together. That's not something that was intended in the original design, but some bonehead looked at that and said, instead of fixing the S the O-rings, and this was before Challenger, some bonehead said like, oh, look, it welds itself together. It's great. So even if the O-rings do fail, it's fine. I'm not going to bother testing this to be sure. Look, there's our testing data right there. All right, so now let's get into what my buddy had here. The two red column X and Y REL are coordinates to input into the cal controller. The premise is to find the area under the curve of the graph of fuel rate kilograms a second in time. Okay, so. All right, let's get this cal controller. Hey, Urban, thanks for the raid. Let's get this cow controller up and running, right? And no, uh, okay. let's make sure that, okay.
Yeah, Aqualex, there's ways to do it. What I'm saying is, uh, honestly, if you really want to know, trying to implement the systems on an SRB to make it shut off, in my, this is my opinion, and I get it. Engineering without numbers is a bad idea. Uh, this is EJ's armchair rocket scientist opinion. I think that trying to implement a system on an SRB to shut the SRB off in the event of uh, some weird catastrophic scenario during launch actually takes all the things about an SRB and makes it worse. You're weighing down your booster. You're adding more systems to it. So the simplicity of the design is now compromised because it's more complicated, right? Because you're adding more systems, more systems into the booster, right? So your booster's heavier, more systems into the booster, less Delta V. That takes everything that's good about an SRB and ruins it. I'd prefer to just get the thrust curve right so we know that it's going to do the right thing every time and consolidate and simplify operations around the booster to make sure that it does the same thing freaking every time. And that the only way to do that would be to test the trash out of it all the time, just like the shuttle engines. But once again, just my opinion. To be fair, they were thick enough that it was a redundancy, but when you have something freshly welded and then bend the crap out of it with a ton of upper level winds, which can be at 100 plus mile an hour at times, they snap like crayons. Yeah, that element analysis was being tested during operations with people on board, Jared. That is quite literally the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Dude, why, why are you rolling the dice like that? That is the, dude. Like, look, I'm pretty laissez-faire about risk aversion. Rocket science is difficult. And, you know, it's tough to do. Some people will get hurt. It happens. And I don't want them to get hurt, and I will do everything in my power to make sure that my system is reliable enough to bring that crew home every single time. But stuff does happen. But why, oh, why would you do that on the test stand? For frick's sake. Do it on the test stand. That's what the test stand is there for. Holy crap, you guys are dense. Not, not you guys, but it's so, it's so frustrating, dude, knowing all the potential that the shuttle program could have had that, but didn't because of basically the entire thing was impinged by some bonehead analysis. That's really frustrating, man. Did NASA change the grain structure thrust curve based off of mission payloads? I don't think they did J-Speed. I think it was the same thing every time. The shuttle engine's throttle ability will compensate for that. Yeah. Uh, and the gimbal, obviously. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think they were the same thing every time. Yeah, Kiranov, that's right. But in this case, you know, it didn't, which is really freaking annoying. Anyway, let's plot these points here. So zero, we're at 96.29. So let's go in here. Take the booter. Actually, what we'll do here is this. I got an idea. So here's what we do. Take the booters. And do this. We'll make a double test stand so we can test the control. Next to... We'll test the control right next to the programmed one. There we go. I have a question about the rocket. Where do they put the cargo, like food and stuff? Which one, Bryce? On the space shuttle? It's on the third deck. Uh, well, part of it's on the third deck, and part of it is uh, actually in lockers. There are lockers up at the front. I think that's not going to get me the picture that I exactly want. So the, sh okay, that gets me what I'm looking for. So the shuttle had three areas, dude. Uh, three primary areas where the crew can mess around, right? So you have the flight deck. I don't think I need to say what happens up there. That's where the controls are. That's where you fly the shuttle from. And then right behind the flight deck, there was a payload bay area that that's where they operate like the uh the crane and stuff and you can look into the payload bay and you have windows here for docking etc etc then you have the mid deck the mid deck is where the stuff that you're talking about is see these gym lockers right here well not gym lockers space gym lockers 
That's where the crew carries all their clothes, all their food, etc., etc. And then the shuttle on the port side, right next to the hatch, right? Um, on the port side, right next to the hatch, you have the galley. Uh, so you walk in the kitchens right there. And then there are more lockers on the side. And then there's control systems over here. Uh, so you can control some systems up on the flight deck from right here. There's a control panel right there. And then there's the pantry, so to speak. And then the right here... Uh, between where it says mid deck and lower deck is where the stove and the microwave was not not a stove and a microwave they had special equipment you don't want to light a flame inside of a spacecraft that's not a good idea um so that whatever there's some system in here to heat this heat how their food i think they used induction or something if i'm remembering right and then you go into the hatch to the right and the lavatory that the head is there and then the rest of the mid deck is wide open space here uh for people to sleep the beds are on the starboard side, and the beds are basically just, think a sleeping bag with Velcro on one side, and then the shuttle had Velcro all over these, the storage containers, the mid-deck, everything. And then on the on the wall of the orbiter here, you literally put yourself in a sleeping bag and then Velcro yourself to the wall, and you just kind of sit there like this and sleep. Yeah, exactly, banana time. And then, what a lot of people don't know is that the shuttle actually had a third deck called the lower deck. Cargo storage. Uh, shuttle's water tanks there are down there. The potable water is down there. Um, you know, plumbing recycling systems in there. Uh, the shuttle does have an open loop plumbing system, so they do dump wastewater out the back of the shuttle. There's a plumbing line that goes all the way back to the end of the orbiter. Um... And you can actually see where they dump the pee. It's right there. Yeah, waste vent. It's on both sides. Yeah, wastewater vent. Now, why would they be not recycling water? Well, the fuel cells on board, the fuel cells that they use to generate electrical power on the shuttle generate water. They're, they're hydrogen and oxygen fuel cells. They use them to generate electricity. That creates three things. Electricity, heat, and water. You get electricity from the energy from the reaction. You get some of the reaction manifests itself as heat energy, which is why they have these radiators here. And then the byproduct is water. And that they use that, the fuel cells will fill the water tanks. Yep. They, now don't get me wrong, you can recycle water on it, but if your water tanks are full, you have a dump. Actually, you wanna, you wanna hear a messed up story? During one of the first shuttle missions where they tested the dump system to make sure that it works, it worked. Uh, the problem is when you take a liquid and introduce it into vacuum too fast, it uh, solidifies. Um, Peacicles. Peacicles. Yeah. 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 Frozen snow cones for everybody. There was a shuttle mission. I forget which one it was off the top of my head. There was the shuttle. There was a shuttle mission where they had to take the ar the robotic arm, which in this picture that robotic arm is way too small. They had to take the robotic arm and scrape pee off of that. True story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That happened. Yeah, it was on Challenger. That's right. Yeah, they had to use the RMS to scrape pee off of the urine dump. Turns out that basic human needs, like going to the bathroom, get really, really, really complicated when you go into space. <laughs> it gets pretty complicated, man. But yeah, that should be that's a pretty pretty good baseline for the shuttles for the shuttle systems and how they work. This whole thing is huge, man. Um, this shuttle flight deck is like as big as a small two story house. Yeah, it's a, there's a lot of space in there. Uh, it gets a little crowded with seven to eight people. This drawing is not to scale. I know it's not to scale because I've stood in a shuttle trainer before and my head's touching the ceiling on the mid deck. I'm six four, about 193 centimeters. And if I'm standing on the mid deck, my head is touching the top, touching the bottom of the flight deck. So that's not really to scale. It looks like there's a lot of room in there, but uh, let's just say comparatively to capsules, there's a lot of space in there. 
Can that frozen P be a risk to hit a satellite? No. I mean, yeah, of course, James B, but not in the if they're in a parking orbit, getting ready to come back down before they deorbit because they don't want P attached to the thermal tiles during re-entry. That's probably not a good idea. Um, yeah, it, it just decays. One hundred and ninety-three centimeters, pray. I am big boy. Anyway, let's program this thrust curve, dudes. We're not releasing any of the clamps, though. Give them the clamps. Give them the clamps! So one of these will be our control, and the other one will have a programmed thrust curve. Bikes! Hey, Alucard. Yeah, Aqualex. Yeah, I, I'm kind of surprised that the arm can reach all the way back there. Yeah, it was a, that's a little surprising. I think they might have had an extension on it or something. Like, something like Dexter on the ISS, because, yeah, I was surprised it could reach back there as well. But, yeah, apparently it can. Alright. So, let's take this booster over here. And we're gonna select the cow controller, and then select the rocket and go thrust limiter. Alright, so I'm gonna program the things that my buddy gave me. So, I think... 137 seconds for the length there is what we're looking for. We want the timer on the cow controller to be correlative to our total burn time. Right? So let's start plugging these numbers in. Caspi adjusted Clydesdale fuel flow versus time. Oh. thought that I had. When you copy the values from, from a cow, you can paste that into a text editor to finely tune it. Okay. So, these things start off at 96, if I saw that right. 96.3. I don't know if we can tune it to that. Yes, you can. Okay, cool. So, that's going to ramp our thrust controller down over time. So, we will. this will slowly give us a tail off, but that's not exactly what we're looking for. We need it to go up. What's this chart about? It's the, basically, the red up here style is the programmable thrust curve. I had a buddy do some work for me off stream. Uh, actually, he just, my buddy, let's just say I have a friend that uh, likes crunching numbers. <laughs> 8.4 seconds in, we're at 100% thrust. So let's go over here, plus in a point at 8.4, and then put that at 100. And then 16.9, we're still at 100. So plus in another point at 16.9, still at 100. And then 25.38, we're at 88 .8. 25.38, 88.8. This is what Captain, to, to be fair, this is what Captain Crash was trying to show me with his calculus plots that we looked at in the, other, the last time we were working on this, so last Thursday. Uh, this is basically what he was trying to show me, and my brain wasn't doing it. But I don't think Crash is here today. Uh, so, but yeah, this, is, this isn't this is something that chat wasn't trying to help me out, help me figure out before. It's just, yeah, this is what I'm using. So, 40 seconds in... Or no, uh, what was the last one we did? 25.38, so 33.84 on this point right here. 33.84, plus that point in. Yeah, weed, it's more like my stupid butt can't figure it out. Ah, uh, 77.7. So 
So what this is, guys, is it it's the actual shuttle boosters thrust, but adjusted for the burn time that I'm looking for with the Clydesdale. So we're taking the actual thrust profile from the space shuttle SRBs and we're adjusting it to the numbers with the Clydesdale. So that's what I'm trying to do. The problem is, is guys, I'm actually kind of worried. Our liftoff thrust is not very high. Yeah, Aqualex. That's why I kind of wanted to put it on the test stand because the, the thrust that we were using before goes way up here and then way down. But if... We might need to make some adjustments to this controller. But I kind of want to put this in. I want my control. So the control is a non-program booster. And then I want this one. And I want to see what the numbers are. So 42.30 at 70.3. Plus another one in. 42.30 at 70.3. And then 50.769 at 74 on the dot. 74.07. There's the throttle down. That's the throttle bucket right here for max Q. And then it's going to go up and then it's going to go back down again. So plus in another point here. 59.23 at 77. Sixty-seven point six nine at seventy-four. Fifty-nine point two. Get wait, I didn't do that right. Sixty-seven sixty-nine. At 74. There we go. The next one is 76.15. It's 66.6. The shuttle's SRBs are regressive, right? Or is it a non-regressive curve? It's... Progressive, then regressive, then progressive again, then regressive, and then regressive a lot. It's actually kind of a hybrid, and that comes from all the different segments, T-Man. Each segment burns a little bit more, then burns a little bit less, and then burns a little bit more, and a little bit less. That gives you a ramp thrust curve like that, that ramps up and then ramps down. The SRBs do throttle for max Q, but it's pre-programmed. See? And I'm trying to take the thrust profile from the real booster and scale it into KSP. Hey, Kuro. 84.61.59.25. So, 84.61.59.25. Go. 90.07.51.85. Plus in another point. 90.0 or 57, I think. 93.07. And then 51.85. 51.85. Five. 101.5. And then, wow, this thing really, so see right here? 101.05 or 101.53 excuse me 101.53 at 7 kilonewtons of thrust 7.4 there's your thrust tail off see that's the tail off right there and then at 110 seconds it should be 0 
You input 90.7. Oh. Yeah, 93. Thank you. Ah, uh, yeah. That would... Shutsy, that would have ended... <laughs> that would have ended poorly. All right. Okay. Let's see if this is right. I'm going to read what my buddy said here. Oh, you were asking if you could copy and paste it. Oh, I got you, Mutter. Um, you can copy and paste from Cal to Cal, but I'm not sure about Cal to anything else. Because the nature is the SRBs, is there any source that has charted the consistency of the thrust created by all the SRBs during the shuttle service? I'm sure NASA has that information, Hellfish. Yeah, absolutely. No, you tested it. Thank you. Will the thrust curve give a performance increase, or is it just for realism? Phaedra, this is a little bit of an abstract concept to understand here, but... Yeah, I, I'm gonna. Tr I'll try to explain it as best as I can, if that makes any sense. Um, so, yes and no. Okay, so you're not. I I started explaining this at the beginning when we were testing. The long story short is that the booster. You're only going to get so much energy out of so much solid rocket fuel, right? So like one kilogram of solid rocket fuel is going to give you a certain amount of energy. Let's, I'm going to make up numbers, okay? These are, these numbers are entirely made up. Say you have one kilogram of solid rocket propellant and that gives you one joule of energy, okay? And why, why is energy important? I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So. It's a linear correlation. So let's say one kilogram is one joule, right? So if you have a thousand kilograms, right? That's a thousand joules, right? And then if you have 5,000 kilograms, that's 5,000 joules of energy, right? You're only going to get certain amounts of energy out of this. Now, why is that important? That right there, the total amount of energy that a booster releases is called total impulse, right? You're only going to get so much energy out of your quantity of solid rocket fuel. So... Here's the thing. Will that... Can we squeeze more performance out of the booster? Yes and no. Well, energy is always going to stay the same. The only way to increase the energy of the booster, to give it more delta V, right, would be to add more fuel. But what is a dynamic condition? Think about it here for a second. What's a dynamic condition when a rocket is going up? Think throttling the engines. Air pressure, aerodynamics, bingo, bingo. We can optimize around that, right? Because at a certain point when you're inside of the atmosphere, the SRBs can only move the air out of the way so much. And then you, the, if the SRB can't move the air out of the way fast enough, what happens? You get gases compressing on the top of the booster, right? And that gives you a compression load. You're basically pushing against a brick wall at this point. That's why rocket engines throttle back to keep the dynamic pressure that's, uh, that's, that is forming on the front of the booster from that air being compressed. That's why they throttle down for it. Because at, at a certain point, you're just gonna, all you're gonna do is introduce compression load on your booster. You're not gonna go faster, you're not gonna go slower. You're just introducing more dynamic compression on the booster. This is why, this is why, and rockets throttle back. So if what I'm trying to do, one, realism, yeah, absolutely. Two, I do it this way so I can have conversations like this and teach people about thrust curves and why you throttle back for max Q. And three, I'm trying to squeeze just a little bit more performance out of the booster. Because if you think about it, if you think about it, you'd only want to use as much solid rocket fuel down here as you absolutely have to, to get you enough out of the atmosphere, right? And then, you'd want to get, 
you you kind of don't want to use up all the all the energy from the SRB because remember SRB the, the fuel is linear. The X amount of fuel is going to give you X amount of imp of of impulse, X amount of energy, right? That's linear, but the aerodynamic conditions change. But since it's kind of a diminishing return, always pushing against the arrow, you want the boosters to be able to produce enough thrust just to get you out of there, right? And then if the boosters spend less time pushing against air, you can squeeze more delta V out because the air the, the aerodynamic conditions are just that. They're a dynamic condition. They change over time. So there are points where your SRB can use more of its more of that energy, that total impulse out of the atmosphere and actually accelerate you more. This is why despite like okay so if you play real solar system right if you play rss which is basically just earth in ksp you have earth and you have the moon and you have the real delta v conditions that you need to get into orbit this is the reason why you need to have nine kilometers a second change in velocity in your rocket but orbital velocity is 7600 meters a second in low earth orbit there's a 1400 meter a second discrepancy there right that's no, not a discrepancy it's taking into account aerodynamics because it down here the rocket is going to have to push it it's going to have to fly through the atmosphere at some point right so i'm trying to optimize around that for ksp to try and squeeze as much performance out of this booster as i possibly can basically i'm trying to get it to use the energy at a spot where it has less stuff to push against and it's only focusing solely on pushing that shuttle stack up into space so yes and no you cannot there are slight optimizations and honestly in stock ksp it probably doesn't make too big of a difference but i like doing stuff like this because i can use this to teach you guys about rockets that's the big part does that make sense dude push less air so you push more cargo bingo that's why i'm really obsessed with getting these thrust curves right because you know like i said i just said it might not make too big of a difference but honestly i don't know that for sure which is why I'm implementing these test stands. This is why I want to see what this thing does. So what we're going to do is instead of hitting the stage button here, I'm going to go to action group zero and I'm going to play the sequence on the cow controller and then use that to activate this engine. So, and then we'll use it to activate this one as well, activate the engine. So to activate the engine, it'll play the sequence at the same time. So take this, move this back all the way over to here. Let's go. Yeah, it'd be cool to see if there's a delta V difference in KSP. I think if we optimize the curve correctly, there could be. But I mean, the performance is not going to be that much. It's not going to be that much, but you won't know until you try. It's the old scientific saying, frick around and find out. So I'm going to find out. Frick around and find out. All right, so let's, I'm gonna keep these windows up so we can see the booster thrust here. Hey, Roro. It's crazy that I'm getting a hurricane in November. Tail end of the season, but it's still the season. Okay, three, two, one, one and a half, one and three quarters and, and just let me get this up here and go. You see how our booster? This one is just producing 100% of thrust the entire time. But ours ramped up to 29.53. And now ours is throttling back for max Q. See how our booster, because we ramped it down, it has it has more fuel. More of that energy is going to get used where you're not pushing against air. And once again, I don't think that it might make a difference in KSP, maybe, but I'm not 100% sure. We'll, we're trying to find out. So this one should go out at 86 seconds. Uh, the met time didn't go because I didn't separate from the clamps. 
kind of needed that. Yeah, Rev. It's kind of strange. So that's 86 seconds in, right? Yep. Okay. Let's see if this ramps like I think it's going to. Hey, Arona Space. Bonjour. We already did some math previously, and we know that the magic number that we're looking for with the booster is somewhere below 300 kilonewtons. But that actually might do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Perfect. That actually is pretty much exactly what we want. Yeah. Oh, I didn't... S yeah, we needed the timer for the test. But that did look promising. I need... I forgot that the met timer doesn't go when you uh, do this, so I'm going to have to get my stopwatch out. See, I think if we take this curve and we just tweak it a little bit, and we tweak it a little bit to give us a little bit more thrust getting off the pad, then I think we'll be okay. Do the SRBs burn top to bottom or vice versa? They burn out, radial, upwards. The igniter starts at the top, and that the flame does start burning at the top a little bit more, serious, but the flames get shot down here and then go into the throat. When those flames get shot down here, they are burning the grain off as it flies past it. It's ablated, it'll ablate the grain right off. And when you burn SRB fuel, it burns, ex when you ablate it, it burns extremely hot. And that, yeah, it burns kind of, it starts up here and then the explosion goes down here and then it burns radial out from there. All right, let's try this again. Ready? T minus 10, nine, eight. Gotta get the windows up. Seven and three quarters. Seven and a half. Seven and one quarter. Seven. Six and three quarters. Six and a half. Six and one quarter. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Ignition. Okay. Right here is where we should throttle down for max Q. That's at 40, about 40 seconds. Okay, crash. I have them open. Give me one second. Let me finish this test. Novus actually gave me some scaled numbers too, and they pretty much uh, correlate yours. That's my buddy. It's Novus in chat. Uh, he's. He basically gave me the numbers that you gave me. I kind of compared them off stream and we're testing those those original numbers right now. This is without my increased thrust. Should have an SRB race after this. Watch which one goes higher and faster. Well, yeah, I think that that one's gonna go faster. Yep, that flamed out at 126. That's Discovery. exactly what no we want. Up. That's tail off right 
there. 150. And then when's that booster gonna flame out? They would have. We would have separated by now. We would have separated at 150. Cal controller ended. Two minute thirty. Oh yeah, crash. Oh, there you go. Hey, metric fifty eight month resub. They burned for another 40 seconds almost. All right, Crash, what do you what do you got for me here, bud? There's Alex's. We got to the rate of change of the maximum thrust control. So if your cow controller commands a delta larger than the max rate, then you will follow the max rate thrust curve. Yeah. So if our cow controller's burn time is short and the booster has basically impulse left over, it won't ramp down, right? The max response curve is fine, but what gets really screwy is the throttle response. Second graph, it lags the command, but then will ramp up arbitrarily. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's very weird, man. I think once again, I think if if we if we command the booster to shut to turn the thrust limiter to zero, and it's still in an activated state, and it has fuel left over, it will not ramp that thrust down. It'll just burn it off. That, that I think that because once again, the cow wasn't really designed to do this. Yeah. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, I, I think I, that's what you're getting at, right? Yeah, okay, cool. Alex, did you give me the same thing? Look at this grab! We just gotta make sure the cow controller has the right amount of, has the thrust limiter programmed correctly, and that's what I'm trying to do. Where this gets difficult, dudes, is trying to get it to ramp correctly, making sure that our graph has the total impulse of the booster confined in this surface area right here. Right? Basically, okay, so like if you look at this, like the impulse of the booster, see this shape, like on this graph, you see the shape right here? This shape between X and Y in the blue line, geometrically, that shape, that, that geometric shape represents your total impulse on your booster, all right? Long story short, if there's a point, right? Say this line is, say this line is perfect. It's not perfect because the booster goes past 130 seconds at, at tail off, right? It's not exactly perfect, it's close. 
But say we start going down and the this blue line goes below the imaginary amount of surface area of surface area where you have fuel left over. It'll just follow that and it'll ramp off linear from there. Just like, and that's why I wanted to time this. Two minute, 29 second burn time, guys. On this cow controller, at time 110, I commanded the booster to have zero thrust. We tried to squeeze the total impulse. This geometric shape isn't perfect. It's not right. At 110, we should have zero thrust, but we had a booster that burned basically till two minute and 29 seconds. Two minute, 29 seconds is 160. 100. 60, 60 is 120 plus 30. 150. Excuse me. We had an extra 40 seconds of burn time, despite the booster being commanded to zero. This is what Crash and Alex and, and Novus are, are, t are saying. We can't... We have to find a shape that... Where if the, the total impulse of the booster is, is a geometric surface area, right? We have to make sure our curve equals the exact amount of surface area that correlates to total impulse. Crazy, right? Rocket science, man. Yep. Yeah, Crash, and I think it's happening because of what I just said. Yeah, I got you. Interesting. I mean, once again, we're pushing Kerbal to the limit. I don't think it was ever designed to do this, but whatever. I'm doing differential equations right now and trying to, to try and find the cow command shape. That should get you a linear thrust response. Actually, you know what? You know what, Alex? I got an idea. It might be a stupid idea, but I got an idea nonetheless. Let's take a cow controller, dude. Right? Take a cow controller. Ooh. All right. We'll take a cow and we will set this to 86, right? And then if we go in here and go to the plotter, right? And we set thrust limiter, right? Actually, we don't, I don't no, no, that's actually not gonna work, right? Like, theoretically, 86 seconds, that gives you your surface area. That's the plot. We don't need to test it, I don't think. I was gonna, what I was gonna do is put these engines out and fire them off. And then as we go through this, plot, plot thrust output, but we don't need to do that. We know what the thrust output stays the same. So it's 86 on the dot crash, 86 on the dot for, for this. Look, 86 second burn time. And it's interesting because this one over here reads at 89 because it starts at 96.3. So that's nothing we didn't know. 86 second burn time on a stock Clydesdale. That could actually... Okay, guys, am I wrong in assuming here that this could give us... This right here could give us the geometric surface area. That'll give you your surface area, right? You have a time value 0 to 100, and then you have an 86 second burn time, right? Are you accounting for the atmosphere here? No. No, not, not really. That's the other thing we got to think about. I wasn't, I wasn't going to get to that just yet. Adjust the curve a little bit higher to get tail off when you want. <laughs> if we figure out surface area here, right? And then we compare it to this surface area here, which is going to be a lot more difficult to figure out. <laughs> We'd have to use a lot of math to figure out that exact surface area. But these two surface areas need to match. Interesting. Yeah, so that plotter idea was a good one, but I don't think that's I don't think we need to do that. It's not any given information. Because we know what this thing is gonna do, because it does the same thing every time because it's Kerbal. Okay.
So here's what we'll do. I'm going to take a cow controller here. We'll take the original curve plot, right? Take this, take that curve, copy it. And then we'll go over here. Take that, take this, put thrust limiter in there, take that, paste that curve. That's the original curve. That's what we just tested. And we'll keep our trial booster over here, right? So this thing, right, is bound now, or is it? All I gotta do is take that Take that cow controller, unbind it, and then disable the cow controller. And now we have our, now we have these coordinates plotted and it's saved, saved that. So that's the active one that will fire. That one won't fire and it's disabled. So we can save our thrust profiles here. If you have a constant time increment between each thrust point, you can add up the total impulse fairly easily, I think. Mm -hmm. Test what happens if the cow commands negative thrust limit to drag the throttle response down. I don't think it'll, I, I don't think it'll, that will work, Aquilux. If we go into the negative, it'll just ramp the thrust down. We already go, we're already going into the negative doing this. So what I want to do, so we have our, we have our curve saved over here. First, thrust curve plot one. And then we'll go over here and name this one thrust curve. All right, so. A thirst curve is totally different. Fact. Control curve. All right. So now this curve right here, all right, this curve right here, the original plot curve is here and our our adjustment is here. So we can compare what we what we just did with this booster and we don't need the control anymore. I don't I don't need that. All right, so let's go in here and let's try something. Let me just blank that out and let me blank that one out. Let me try to find the high point here. No, it needs to be higher than that. But you know what? We'll we'll try it right there. Plus a point in at 112. Um I think that's the highest point of that curve. Yeah, 112. So we have a plot that's going off the graph. That's overclocking. We can make it go higher. So we can make the booster have more thrust. Okay, so now we have two different plots here, right? So let's watch. Let's see what happens. So basically I took some of that surface area that we have left over at the end and I applied it at the beginning. And we'll see if the amount of surface area that I took away from the end and added up here will get it to tail off at the right time. Because something that I do need out of these boosters is I, I need them to thrust. 
I need them to push the shuttle and the tank off the ground. The problem that we've always been wrestling with, and the reason my hesitancy for using solid rocket boosters is that they're... Well, the hesitancy originally was that I didn't think they have enough thrust, but after trying it, we figured out that they barely have enough thrust. Now, would it, I think they have the right amount of impulse, but I don't think we're, they'd have the right amount of thrust. So if we just tweak this thrust curve in, we can get this thing working excellent. And that's what today is all about, trying to get this right. Yeah, J-Speed, exactly. So is the thought that this game applies the limit at a constant speed, or does dropping the limit quickly drop the thrust quicker, like a ratio? Urban, if you think about the total impulse of a booster represented in as a surface area, right? So... If I set a cow controller to 86, right, at 100% throttle the entire time, that gives you a rectangle of sur surface area on the cow controller, right? That gives you a certain certain surface area. That surface area represents the total impulse of the booster, how much energy it has, right? So, obviously, ours is cutting into that a little bit, right? We have a thrust curve that's progressive, regressive, progressive, regressive, right? So that's cutting that rectangle in half. So if you cut that rectangle in half, you need to increase the burn time, right? Because you're essentially taking that original surface area, you're cutting it like this with that curve, right? So you're going to end up having a longer rectangle, so to speak, right? It'll end up looking more like an elongated right triangle. This is getting into calc and differential equations and stuff, but it's cool. It's cool. Basically, I'm trying to find what the right surface area is to get the boosters to tail off at the right time for my shuttle stack. And if we dial this in, I mean, we we dial this in, yeah. Instead of using up all the fuel, that could be the difference between using up all the fuel to get 36 tons into space and then not having enough to come back down and getting 36 tons of fuel into space outright and then having enough fuel to come back down. It's a couple hundred meters a second delta V difference if we dial it in correctly. Oh, geez. Okay, I crunch the numbers and I may have a cow controller fix for you. Here's the paper trail, but this is best explained in live voice, not gonna lie. Oh. I'd prefer to do the trial and error method, Alex. Is there any way you can kind of sum it up? Okay. Okay, so here's our original, and there's what we have now. This thing needs to be set to 137. That'll give me the right plots. Yeah, okay, cool. 137. All right, ready? T minus 10, 9. We don't need this for the 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. Hang on to your butts. I'm going to pause it here a couple of times. Yeah, 33. Maybe it's because they didn't expect anybody to ever throttle them, Aqualux. So... At this tail off point, the left side booster from this view, this one should have, it should have less fuel and it should be making relatively similar similar amounts of thrust. 38, 2338, 2367, 8100 versus 86. That's right. Okay, so it is doing what we think it's going to do. That was the road trip. Excellent. It was fun, Sile. Great wedding. Yeah, exactly, Urban. The reason, yeah, that's what we were trying to figure out here. Yeah, 
if you just split this in half, it's not the, it will it'll it'll lag. It'll lag because remember that surface area, you're cutting into that surface area. And if the game doesn't understand that if you cut into that surface area, you're going to need to extend the time because your burn time is going to change. So what the game will do is adjust your thrust curve so it ends right when flame out happens. And it'll ignore it. And, and I had I have some folks in chat trying to figure the differential equations out to get this correlation and I'm pretty sure like this dude this is beyond me. Some folks Captain Crash, Novus, Alex, a couple other people in chat figured this all out. Look, there's your correlation right there. It's gonna be tough like fighting with a PID. Bingo. Now this tail off is where I'm really curious here. Because so theoretically these two things should be making very similar amounts of thrust. 2218, 2218. But did you see over here? Right here? They were slightly different. Looks like I went into the surface area a little bit. That's not really the right way to say that, but we we exceeded minimum value here for a second. It's just all math. Yep. And thank you for the raid, dude. Sorry, I I, I appreciate it, man. I was I'm kind of super focused on getting this dialed in. <laughs> I do appreciate the raid, guys. If you guys like you guys like other, uh, if you want to see other Kerbal streamers, Urban does a pretty damn good job with with his playthroughs. Get the fuel amount. How goes it? It's pretty good, Novus. Yeah. Yep. Yep. See, we exceeded it because we should be commanding it to 2.47, but because we used up more of the impulse of the booster over here, we're getting a discrepancy. That one shut off at um, 1 minute 37. Almost on the... Well, not 1 minute 37. The time is 107. So 1 minute 37 seconds, not 137 seconds. Interesting. So this thing had a flame out 107. Not at all, Buzzy. I was in the same mindset today. You know when you get into it, dude, it's like, it's not that I don't want to, you know, I'm afraid sometimes where I'm just like, hey, thanks for the raid. Okay, back to what I'm doing that, uh, you know, I'm pissing people off like, like I don't appreciate it or something. That's not what's going on in the least. I just really, I want, I don't want to lose my train of thought. <laughs> So Novus, this this one down here, the control curve, is the curve that you you gave. And it turns out that there's like a minimal threshold, dude. There's a what I've been calling it is like a mean surface area here. And I'm sure there's a mathematical way of to say this. So like So, guys, basically what we're talking about here is that if you have a graph, right, and this is, that's time, and this is thrust, kind of went off page here. Let's just use a capital T for thrust, right? If we keep thrust at 100%, over the entire burn time of the booster, it gets to 86 seconds, right? This area right here. That area right there, if we just kind of made a surface area out of it, that surface area here, so 86 at 100 represents, right? the 
It represents the total impulse of the booster. Right? That represents the total impulse. So capital T I. Capital T is thrust, lowercase t is time, right? Now, here's what happens. If we program a thrust curve and the thrust curve goes down like that, what the game is going to do, right? It will not throttle down the SRB and shut the SRB off at 86 seconds. No, no. It won't do that. What the game will do with the SRB thrust over time is if we break into the surface area, all this area up here is impulse that the booster still has. It's solid rocket fuel that's left over. So what the game will do is this. It will not follow your instructions here. It will just take, oh, okay. You told me to ramp down and thrust, but we're going into the surface area here, right? So, you know, if it did this right here, right? That's that means at 86 seconds you're gonna have a half, you're gonna have half of your fuel left over. So what it'll do is it'll take this time and it'll extend it out whether you like it or not, because if we cut this in half, right, you, it's gonna give you a triangle that has double the length on one side, right? Double the length here, a longer hypotenuse, and the same, like side A here is the same. Side B will be double the length, and the hypotenuse will be just will be this. It'll follow the blue. I'll give you a more straight line. It'll do that Discovery, instead. No and there's nothing you can do about it. Even if I commanded to tell it to shut down here. This is what I mean about that surface area. If you try to command it to do something, well, and you violate this kind of surface area right here, the game will just say, well, screw you. It still has fuel left over. And it'll just extend the timer for you. And then it'll ramp down at a linear rate to when your fuel and thrust equals zero. Does that make sense? This is this is some calc stuff, dude. This is hard. Difficult. Hey, Dutch guy, thanks for the raid. Ramp down and thrust step, bro. No, it does not. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it does, dude, but I'm sure you have I'm sure here here it comes. Here it comes. What 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 does it do? Here, let, let's see. Let's see. Here it comes, Aqualux. Yeah, yeah, here we go. Now, is this the part where you say it does exactly what I said, but because I didn't say it in the proper mathematical terms, I'm wrong? Is this the part? Is the, Are we at that part of the stream yet? Please let me know. <laughs> Mickey, yeah, no, I'm... I'm a nerd, just don't tell nobody, okay? No, as I said, it'll happily go to zero with fuel remaining, just as long as it satisfies its input lag. Well, this graph says otherwise. Ah, the annexation of Puerto Rico. We don't have enough people to run that play, though. I understand what you're saying, Aqualex. It'll ramp it to zero, but it'll still produce thrust. There's input lag on it. That's what I'm trying to explain here. You can't fight that. Oh, well, this graph says otherwise. Let the sink in, bro. No, I, I get it. I understand what you said. Um, yeah, it's just what it's doing is strange. I'm trying to say it the right way. It, it'll tell it to go to zero and it'll try to go to zero, but it'll still be producing thrust. Basically, it'll just extend the timer out. We see that. We see that right here. We saw it right here with this graph because Novus' original editor has, even though it commands the SRB at 110 seconds to go to throttle input of zero, the thing will still throttle and it ends up burning out at two minute 26 seconds or two minute 29 seconds right so it's going to try to extend that triangle so to speak and we we're, we can't violate that surface area right you if you try to squeeze if you try to squeeze the total the impulse of the booster it doesn't you know the game will say no i guess if that makes sense 
The other one here uh, shut off over here, which is interesting. It, it shut off at 106. That's the one with the ramped up curve here. See, we moved some of that, that we knew we had leftover surface area. I'm not saying this correct. Bear with me. I'm trying to keep it layman's, in layman's terms. Not that I know the actual calculus terms, but bear with me. Are you redoing a shuttle? We're trying to figure out the programmable thrust curves. Uh, we're trying to program a thrust curve Dutch guy on the SRB with a cal controller that uh, will give me the most efficient ascent with the shuttle. Basically ramping the SRB on a progressive, regressive, progressive, regressive thrust curve to get <coughs> to throttle for max Q and whatnot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Basically, crunching the number says that in order to correct for the inertia, the uh, inertia the SRB seems to have on thrust ramp downs. The open KSB isn't hiding any other hard mechanics. So you could get a linear thrust on the SRB by introducing a negative spike when you order a ramp down with the cal. Interesting. That that is what Aqualux said a little bit ago. Discovery. Here's an example of transforming the cal command into something that should work better. Uh, Aglex, now to be fair, you did say to do that, if I'm remembering right. Dutch guy, 47 months, thank you. Yeah, John, you'd have to go negative to get it to do what you want. Basically, you'd have to put some of that surface area into negative thrust, and I... I think I know what this is going to do. And I'm not I'm not sure we're ready for what I think this thing is going to do. Um for entertainment purposes, I will uh keep this off of the the test stand. Yeah, yeah, okay. Novus, when you tested it, if you pull the points to a more extreme, high to higher or low to lower, it quickens the rate the booster tries to hit that point. I really didn't understand the reason for why. Also, the booster has having residual fuel remaining will give you the same look as the real, in real life shuttle at separation, even if you're leaving small delta V on the table. Small amounts of delta V on the table, yeah. I know it should be for like a split second, Alex, but I, I, negative, negative thrust limiter is, I, if I'm understanding this right, this thing should go up. Oh. Yeah, see, there's our ramp. I didn't set this right, so...
Um, no, it won't make negative thrust, Aqualux. It'll invert the thrust transform. And if it inverts the thrust transform, it should create a decelerative force. And it it should create fuel. I think people have messed with this before. We should actually go up here and it'll generate fuel. Either that or it'll just generate fuel and it won't go up. No, KSB just zeroes the thrust. This has been tested. Well, it's been tested. And guess what, buddy? We're going to test it again. <laughs> it's generating fuel. <laughs> it's so stupid. Oh god, that's a good laugh. I need it. Okay. It's free fuel for you, Jim. Now we can reuse SRBs. Yeah, mother, yeah.
Yeah, Novus. Yeah, yeah, I got you, I got you. What happens if you release it? Yeah, you do know that experimenting, experimenting with encabulators is illegal. Well, don't tell anybody! No, it, yeah, Metroid, no it, no, it is. It's not generating thrust, no. It, negative thrust doesn't do anything. I thought it would invert the thrust transform and it would go up, but it doesn't. It just generates fuel until the, you're full. And then... cool. So, let me... Yeah, J Speed. Little bit little bit of a side thing here. Okay. Battle him. Seven month resub. Thank you. This means that the SRBs never shut down, though, so we'd have we still would have trouble. We would have to basically.
Who thought you could even RTLS these bad boys? Discovery, go at throttle up. Now I really want to make a freaking pad for this, but I'll mit up. We'll make it so it could do it. That's all. What I would do, guys, is I would have these empty within the activated condition on the pad, right? And then we would have the cow controller as an arming system. I would, though, so if you disable the cow controller, right? Actually, I, I need to see it one more time. Let me let me let me look at this. We got. I got to see it again. Like, basically, what what I'm doing here is proving a use case for SRB reuse. I just this is just a little bit of a side thing that we kind of figured out from doing this. That does happen. You would have to have a nerding procedures for the SRBs. Yeah. Yes. Yes, we would. We'll let that tail off here. I actually got an idea. The curve right here. So if we set uh, the refueling cow controller here, if we set, go in here and set the throttle, the individual throttle control. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm not sure if that would work. That's what I mean, Blue Flare. It keeps happening. We got one, Loopy, but we're trying something. Once again, this isn't anything that it's that's been that particularly hasn't been known before but I got an idea would be the refueling rig ordon these things would be much easier to stack when they're not done when they're not full of fuel interesting yeah we could reuse srbs fish them out bring them back reuse them No, Aqualux, the key here is to... So, uh, is the one up top. Curve is the activator. See, we still activated that cow controller. Move that thrust curve back over there. set the activation to there and set the refueling to there.
So shut that off. Reverse it. Right? Enabled. Three, two, one. Ignition. Yep. Yep, we can repack and create a safing condition for the booster. Yeah, you can do it. Totally doable. Wow. That's really cool, actually. That's really freaking neat. Dude, we could get the nose cones. Reintegrate the nose cones on the boosters with the chutes. Repack the chutes. Repack the booster. Totally doable. You could even make the refueler dump locks at the right ratio to mean that you could... mean you pay the correct funds for the new solid fuel. Why do you have the charity tag? I was doing, I did a charity stream a couple of weeks ago, Ivan. We can remove it. We don't really need that tag in there anymore. I removed it. Yeah, I did a fundraiser with Private Division for uh, No Kid Hungry. Yeah, we raised like I don't know, five, four or five grand for school lunches for kids. Yeah, it was something that Private Division and the Kerbal Devs were working on, dude. And I did that, yeah. Basically the day that where the KSP2 stuff came out. It's cool that this works. Dude, we could fish the SRBs out. We could fish them out. Yeah. I mean, if we had more time, we still have the problem with this. Uh, we still have the problem with it. Like, if we were going to integrate a shuttle stack, we would have a problem with putting the stack together. Uh, because SRBs would need to be docked to pad and then you'd have to hang the ET on it. And if you hang the ET on it, then, then yeah, it's, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna be okay. Disable, reset, enable AG9. And the boosters being repacked. Weed, I'm not planning on doing any of that. I'm planning on just hitting the recovery button right now. I watched that awkward interview back from 2017. You look like you're out of your wheelhouse. Oh, Twitch Science Week. Yeah. Yeah, Sawyer, they, they were... Yeah, they were basically like, okay, we need you to do this. And I'm like, that's... So you want me to do everything that makes me unique as a person, as a streamer, all the cool stuff, sunglasses, hats, stuff like that, all of my redeeming qualities, uh, all of my opinions about space flight, and you want me to throw all that out, out the window and ask what you want to ask. Okay. Okay. Just freaking mouthpiece, dude. I hate it. I hate it. Never doing that again. Ever. No, oh, thanks, weed. Negative thrust, Tybot, is refueling my is refueling my SRB right now. Yeah. Inverted thrust. And then that cow controller will cease. We disable that cow controller. We reset it. Then we re-enable the cow controller over here. And boop. Yeah, we can reuse SRBs if we put them on a repacking stand with the right cow controller. Yeah. All 
I don't like studio, like a traditional studio setting weed where somebody is just whispering in your ear everything that you should say. It really, really aggravates me. Can you reignite them? No. No puedo. Yeah, weed, I don't... One thing I'm very, very clear about, I, it, I, like, everything here is my own opinion. I don't regurgitate other people's takes on things. I don't regurgitate other people's opinions. I hate people that do that very much. Uh, I'll never do it. And if I do, I will tell you that I'm parroting somebody or, you know, this is a good idea from this person. I will give credit where credit is due because I'm not taking credit for somebody else's opinion on something. I have very strict rules about that. Internal strict rules. It's kind of, it's company, company policy. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Hot flex. Yeah, wait, wait, I'm up in here. I'm up in here making this. Right? And he's up there making... Making that. You know what I'm saying? They put googly eyes on it? Nah, this is alright. He's just... <clears throat> a troll. And I borderline want to hit him in the face. But nah, he's, he's a good kid. He's alright. But also... And S, if you're watching this, well, frick you. Okay? If you're watching this VOD, piss off. I don't like you. Or do I? <laughs> I mean, if you can fire them again using staging. No. Uh. Uh. Tienes cal controller. Tienes usar cal. You have to use. You have to use the cal. I was to understand there would be propane. Now we sell shuttle and shuttle accessories here, boy. Uh. So what I have to do is we have to go into a safing condition. So disable the curve. Reset the we set the program thrust, and then re-enable the controller, and then re and then trigger the controller with the action group. Like, oops, I did that wrong. Uh, stop. So now what we need to do is enable this one, and then yeah, now it should refuel. In this case, usar el controlador entendido. Sí. Yeah, you had to use the cow. Because you can't shut off the SRB. It's Even if I have a shutdown command issued for it, the shutdown command doesn't work. It just doesn't. I even tried binding it to an action group. Yeah, and when the booster is fueled, it'll just give you some residuals here but you would need to use the cow controllers so what would be cool and blue flare you were talking about this so the saving condition for these srbs would basically be manually binding the curve sequence controllers back onto the shuttle's avionics so on our shuttle if we were doing like a reintegratable shuttle i would have a set of cow controllers that are designed to sequence all the events external tank separation srb separation uh, srb basically SRB controllers, right? And that cow controller, the main sequencer in the shuttle's avionics, right? If we were going to do reintegration, would have the activator. It would it would it would have a, a trigger for this cow controller for these cow controllers to start. And as a safe condition, you would not put those into the main sequencer until you're ready to launch. Literally a safing procedure for the SRB. Yeah, and it would work too. So, check this out. Disable that. 
reset that controller, enable this, and now this is the part where we take the I would take a sequencer controller on the shuttle and rebind this cal controller's activation to to that, and then three, two, one, booster ignition, and lift off. That's pretty cool, man. That's pretty freaking cool. We could refuel SRBs. That's pretty neat. Uh, that This can be abused, though. A lot. <laughs> if we did it, I would have... Uh, I would... The way I would do it and keep the game balance right is I would have an SRB repacking stand. Or I would just refuel them right on the pad before integration. I would put the SRBs in the empty... In the safe condition, empty, on the pad... Fuel them, and then inert the booster. So inert the cow controllers, and then just leave them there, and then stack the rest of the stack. But how can you recover them from the from the ascent? Parachutes? Like just like the real ones, just use parachutes. All right, so let's load up this, guys. This thrust controller over here had a shutdown. The one with the high point right there. That had a shutdown at 110 seconds, so it was right... There 107 seconds, it was right there. So if we separate at 90, 90 seconds, or no, 100 seconds in. Yeah, 100 seconds. We separate at 1 minute... Rain, 60, so 1 minute 40. They'll tail off to get the right right thrust. That'll give us... Actually, that, that would be okay. Here, how about I zap that point out right there? And we just do that. Let me see what that does. Let me see where our flame-out condition is. You would lose them at a certain distance, I mean, unloaded from the game. Um, no, not not really. If you separated them at the with the right ballistic arc, Dutch guy, you, they'll they'll be there as long as they stay above 25 kilometers. If their altitude goes below 25 kilometers, yeah, the Kraken will eat them. But on their ballistic arc, if we can make it so the shuttle gets into space or at least gets to the point of main engine cutoff, right uh, before the SRBs go below 25 kilometers, I can get up circularize or circularize more or less with the shuttle, right? switch from the shuttle to the SRBs, parachute the SRBs down into the water, and then switch back to the shuttle, set the external tank, and circularize. You can do it. Oh yeah. I'm, part of the reason why I want to optimize this ascent trajectory is so we can do that. I can, the SRBs will come back down and we could just recover them. It, but we're also creating a scenario here with the SRB refueling where maybe down the road we can go make something that can go and get them and bring them back, which would be pretty cool. All right, so let's open up this cow controller here, reset that to over there, go over here like this. So we have left side SRB thrust right here, the cow controller position, and then the window sequence here. I'll fire both here, but this is just the one that has the boosted thrust here a little bit. So let's see, ready? I don't need to see the other one, that's my control. This one will burn to two minute, 29 seconds. I want to see where this one flames out. It's juggling, Urban. That's how I get my stages to boost back and land. Could you please check the craft file at some point to see if input lag for the SRVs is saved there? Um... Uh, yeah, but that's... Uh, Aqualex, I'll be honest, that's kind of low on my priority list. Nominal Wiggles on 1067. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see it, Yeah, the game's very confused. Yeah, 
Yeah, you have to have high TWR upper stages, Urban. All of my vehicles do. Even my shuttle. My shuttle is pretty overpowered for TWR comparatively to the real shuttle, but that's Kerbin versus real life, you know? I just think that if it's safe there, you could drastically reduce the complexity of the whole thrust curve. I'd rather just do the trial and error approach, dude. This is these curves that are like the real one are pretty freaking close. We had a 107 second flame out there. Dead crew, links in the chat. Andrew. There you go. Yeah, the cow controller wasn't configured right, Luke. That's the reason. So 107 second flame out time is how long? Um, that's one minute thirty-seven seconds. Or one minute. Yeah, 1 minute 47. Yeah, because it's 40. Okay, so... Yeah, dead here. No, no problem. Hey, baby. Yeah, one hundred and ten zero. Novus, your yeah, Novus' stuff is pretty much in line. Oh. Come on, you. 
I'm trying to get at the control curves. Thank you. You know what? Screw it. Don't save. Hold on. tank here. All right, let me see this again. So booster thrust, booster thrust, cow controller position, cow controller position, open the window, open the window. Okay, ready? Three, two, one, fire. I'm just trying to see when we get a flame out here because I think this top curve, the, the slight modification to the original control curve with, go, with a slight overclock should be what we're looking for. Throttle up. Let me just pause for a second. Twenty one seventy five, twenty one seventy five. They're in line. I still think less fuel would be better than the overclock to keep it within the graph. had some spicy news DMs uh, if it doesn't have a source I don't really care yeah it'll be on the way up this should be fine I mean if the boosters aren't yeah I mean they're flexing heat through the the mounts but I think we're okay Discovery. hey answer two two seventy months yeah see See how long that one burned for a little bit longer, but it doesn't produce as much thrust up here at the beginning. But this one over here gives me the thrust that I want. But this burns out at 107 seconds. So one minute 47. And I'm not sure it's gonna tail the thrust like I like how I want. Um, we'd have to separate the SRBs at one minute thirty. 
So if I bring this back over here... Um... I need to see the thrust output right after tail off when we get to that little bottom part right there because separation should be post should be post tail off but pre flame out right so if i could just get the upper the upper boosters are almost flaming out at the same time the control group is flaming out way too way too late right i need this one i need this one to basically flame out right here like right at 115 and it's flaming out at 108. So it's super freaking close. Didn't do it, Loopy. I tried that already. I tried it and it flamed out. It flamed out around 110. It didn't make that much of a difference. My suggestion is to make the throttle go down more aggressively by having the thrust input on the 91 second node. that all right we'll try it g minus 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 having it not zeroing it out well we're here we might as well do the test Dutch guy, I would really, I'm really looking for a little bit more than that, but it's okay. No math, just feel. Well, you were using different reference points from our tests, so you were using inertial loopy math. It's called ILM. Yep. The loopy knows where it is. It knows this because it knows where it isn't. It's a true story. It's science. Yeah, Aqualux, that would be... I mean, we could plot points, dude. But, yeah. Hold on a second, Mutter. I gotta see where the flame out ends up. Yeah, we're below the triangle, guys. It's not gonna com it's not gonna take that command. There's your input lag. That would be a good separator. That would give us a separate a separation at about one minute thirty. No, one minute forty. And then they, we got a flame out with this at 115. Okay. 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 Okay.
Yeah, of course, John, yes. Dead reckoning. That that was bad, even for you. That was that was bad. Don't do that. Don't don't do that again. You deleting the node made the thrust go down. I mean that's pretty much the same curve. So Mutter, what were you saying? What about removing the 137 node? Setting the duration to 110 and then scaling it to 115. To adjust all the points and then setting it back to 137. Oh, you're talking about scale. Yeah, we could scale the graph if we scale resize it. How far have you overclocked them? These ones get up to 112% rated with this curve. I think this curve is it. I want to try this. Let's try this one. Blood Demon, the source of mods. No, seriously, is that a mod or a new feature? The cow controller? Oh, that's that's been in the that's been in the game for a while, dude. Yeah, no, that's not mods. The only mods that I have installed right now are visual ones, dude. But it's still the same same old KSP. That's part of the breaking breaking ground. Well, KRPC as well. Yeah. All right, we don't need this one up. I just need this one. We need the booster thrust. All right, T minus 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Yeah, the Blood Demon, I just decided to make Kerbal look like it was a game that didn't come out 10 years ago. So we have nice clouds and stuff. It looks good, man. I, I think it looks great. We'll see, Alex. It's not going to take much. And once again, there's something to be said about using the real-life data. That's right, Mike. One fifteen. Should do it, dudes. That's the curve. The other one was the original. Yeah, just made a couple of tweaks here and there, and that, uh... I think that's what we're looking for.
So what we're gonna do now is store that curve in memory here as a backup. So I'm gonna take the final curve backup. We, we'll store it in a Separatron. Our separat we're using Separatrons as RAM. Well, hard drive, don't tell anybody. There's your thrust curve. That's the final one. 37, set. I'm happy with this curve. Let's put it on the real shuttle. We'll see. Kim looks so awesome, but it's very hard after the first orbit mission. I hope there's a better tutorial in the sequel. They're working on the tutorials. I have that right from the lead developer, Battleship. I, I'm, I'm friends with him. Uh, yeah, he's a good dude. His name's Nate. The guy that's in the trailer videos for KSP2. There will be better tutorials. That's confirmed. But, if the tutorials ain't doing nothing for you, or you have a question for KSP1, that's part of the reason why the stream is successful, because I teach people how to play. This is into pretty hard advanced stuff here. I will say that. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's go over here, take what we learned from the booter test stand here. Booter, go into stack prototype four. Nate's a good dude, Moto. Yeah, Nate's cool. He's one of us. Believe me, I... I may or may not have sized the dude up. Like, when, I, when we first met and I first talked to him about Kerbal and whatnot, I was like, and you better love this game as much as I do, man. You better love this, you better love this game as much as I do or I'm gonna be pissed. I didn't say, I didn't say that though, but it's kind of sizing him up, nah. He's cool. He's cool. He's the right man for the job. Trust me. The, it's It says something when the creative director for KSP2 has like 3,000 hours in KSP1. Yeah, Nate, Nate's a Kerbal player. He's That's what I mean when I say he's one of us. He is one of us. Now, he's probably not doing this. He's probably not 15,000 hours in, but oh, he is one of us. Absolutely. freaking lutely Oh, yeah. I mean, he don't get paid to play it. He get he's, he gets paid to make it. <laughs> you know. All right. So the new thrust controllers are teed in. We are the controllers are in there, and we're looking at a. Well, watching you from Playa del Carmen, Carmen, Mexico today. Ah, buenos dias. Qué pasa, amigo? Um, okay, there is something that I want to check here. So I'm just going to go back into the no you craft file here for a moment. And I need to see thrust weight. What's our TWR looking like here? I'm just trying to calculate the right separator time. Uh, when we're at one of 100 seconds, we need to see how much fuel that SRB has. So we need to go back over to the test stand real quick. Two point, what was it with the shuttle guys? 1.25 or was it 2.25? I think it was 2.25 if, if my memory is serving me right. Let's go put this out on a test again. I 
think it was 1.25. Nice, Barak. All right. One more, one more test here to make sure that this is working correctly. Uh, or not make sure it's working correctly. I basically just got to see what's the opportune time. When do the boosters TWR go below the shuttles TWR? Yeah, a little bit. I don't know. 2.25 is the number that's ringing in my head. That could be wrong. All right. Should be the last test of the day until, and then we should go actually build the damn thing. Ready? One, two, three, send it. watching this all working from home. Right on, man. I'm using separatrons as a memory device. I have the thrust limiter curve programmed onto that separatron, but I have the separatron not doing anything. That cal controller is bound into that. That's memory right there. It's just hard drive. Because you can't program, you can't put the curve in a cal controller by itself. The cal controller is a processor. You have to load mem. You have to load it in. And I'm not gonna. This is to store it. So if I got rid of this SRB. This cow controller is picking up on that SRB thrust curve. Hold on. So it's just kind of stored in memory. If I want to, if I take this SRB off, it'll delete that thrust curve on that cow controller because the thrust curve for the SRB that it's attached to doesn't exist anymore. So I'm using the separatron to store the thrust curve. It's literally memory. That could be useful. If we were going to do a reintegratable shuttle and we wanted to tweak our thrust curves, right? I could program the thrust curve in memory, like, well, hard, basically hard code the me hard code that curve onto a separatron that's on the shuttle that's designed to never fire, right? Because the th why a separatron? Separatron has a thrust limiter. You could do it with a liquid fuel rocket engine. Uh, I, I, w w what I would probably end up doing is using that thrust curve and putting it on a liquid fuel rocket engine that's physicsless, so we don't get the part lag, right? And we could program that in memory. Right, And then if we wanted to upload a new thrust curve or we recovered our SRBs because they separated, they don't have the thrust curve bound to them anymore, I could rebind the thrust curve to a new SRB. Make sense? Heck, you can make a cartridge out of this. Put this on a panel, right, with a docking port and dock that to an SRB, right? You could dock that to an SRB that's been recovered and program the new thrust curve in outside of the SPH. All you got, all you need is just to attach the new chip to it. All right, so at 103, we're we're at 862 kilonewtons with 400. We're at 862 kilonewtons with 400 fuel. Basically, yeah, it, it's like using ROMs, Kinder. Yeah, basically, you could use cal controllers like that. Sure, why not? I find that if you separate something and your cow controller is controlling it, right? If it separates from the vehicle, it'll delete the cow controller's information. It'll remove it from, from memory, so to speak. So think about the, the Separatron is acting as our hard drive. The cow controller is the processor. And what's in the cow controller is the memory. This is this being loaded in this curve being loaded into the cow controller is RAM. Does that make sense? Well, doesn't that analogy doesn't work exactly, but it's the same idea.
This whole thing is basically a storage device. I'm just using, I'm storing the thrust curve in memory on a Separatron. We could just give the Separatron no fuel and then it doesn't matter. Yeah, we won't ever have to worry about it firing. And as long as we have it, don't have it bound to staging or activation or anything, it's, it'll work. But 862 at 400 is not ideal. Now, what we need to see, guys, and this is this is where this gets a little wonky, is if if that thrust never goes below 748 at 3... If the thrust never goes to zero before we run out of fuel, we're going to run out of fuel before that ramps off, huh? So that would be a guaranteed separator point, 407 at 7375 which get, would give us a separation at about 110. Yeah. Okay. Separatron Legacy. Now we gotta go back over into the no you. So this gives us a, separa a separation time at 110 seconds, which is 1 minute 50. Use the cow, it'll be more accurate. So right there. Pretty much battle. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm just optimizing the ascent to get the maximum amount of impulse. Long story short, I want the SRV to be pushing my space shuttle up more than pushing against the air. Less, less pushing against the air. So if we give it a big, big kick right when it goes off, that's not the right thrust curve, by the way. That's the right one. If we give it, if we give it a big kick when it goes off, it gets out of the atmosphere quickly. Gets into the upper atmosphere, or throttles down for when the atmosphere is still thick, and then throttles back up, and then tails off. Basically, see this over here? We spend less time pushing against the air, and then more time pushing the shuttle higher into space. We're using more of the booster's energy at a higher altitude, and that'll make it a little bit more efficient. That, and I want my shuttle separation to look like the real one. So part of that is programming the thrust curves like the real one, which is exactly what you're doing.
Yeah, Thomas. Mm -hmm. That's correct, Hip. That's what an overclock does. Yep. The booster will produce more than 100% of rated thrust. Real rocket engines do that. Gotta be careful, though. Can't just do it unlimited in KSB. You'll probably overheat apart. Careful. Careful with that. And once again, you gotta remember, your booster's still limited to total impulse. Think of an atom bomb versus a nuclear power plant. An atom bomb lets out all the freedom all at once. A nuclear power plant lets it off over the same amount of time. But depending on how much nuclear fuel you use in each, you're using the same amount. Say that, say that both of them are using the same amount of nuclear fuel. That's only a certain amount of energy. One of them lets all the energy go off at once, and the other one slow trickles it over time so you can power cities instead of destroying them. See what I mean? You're, you're all, everything, certain amount of fuel only gives out a certain amount of energy. So even if I made the cow controller go up there, and I set the first cow controller position to like 100,000, it would instantly drain your SRB fuel and probably explode from pressure limits. There's still physics limitations in the game, which is why the developers don't mind if you can over, if you overclock this stuff, which I think is really cool. They left it in the game, which is really neat. Hey, Ice King. Antonov, Privet, what's up, dude? When the curve... Yeah, the Saturn V CWR off the pad was not very high, Ben. Yeah. Ice King, thanks for the raid, man. How'd that sound effect go again? Oh, it's really easy. It went like this. <clears throat> yeah, really good. Really cool sound effect. That IKOS raid hype. What's going on, guys? Thanks for the raid. Ice King, were you playing Kerbal or what? It actually looks like bumping that down right here, guys, gave us more room to screw with the uh, the nodes up here. We might be able to do exactly what I'm looking for and squeeze a little bit more power out of this. One seventeen. Copy this curve. You're doing some testing on a Luna multiplayer server. Really cool. I'm doing Rust tail off programming on my SRBs. So take this. Open the editor. Go in here. Paste that new curve. There we go. Now this one has that original curve in it. I'm gonna make some tweaks to it. Remember, that's loaded in the Separatron as memory. I wanna see what this curve does, guys. Let's do it. Shut the other test stand off. Hey, Scott Manley just made a video about deep space missions of the shuttle. Timing seemed odd. Mamsy, he, he watches the stream, dude. Scott's a good buddy of mine, actually. Yeah. I haven't actually talked to him in a little while, but yeah. No, Scott's cool, man. Good dude.
He pops in from time to time. He doesn't say anything, though. He lurks. But I know... I know that he pops in because when I've raided him before, he's talked about the stuff that I've done on the stream. I'm like, is this, yo, this guy's low-key lurking my stream. <laughs> All right. Tweak thrust curve. Ready? One, two, three. Yeah, 3,500 kilonewtons. Nice. Yeah, Scott's good people. Cherokee. Let's see if we... So I decreased circus, surface... Circus? I decreased surface area over here, and then we increased it over here, which is where I need it. This should get our thrust curve to be way more in line here. Can your SRB set up deflect this hurricane headed your way? Um, Gandalf, I, I don't think adding heat to a hurricane is a good idea. Um, just a thought. Yeah, atom bombs would just make hurricanes worse. No good. Aqualux, you really want me to go and mess with the cow controller in the craft file, huh? Why don't you do that, dude? To make sure that it works. I, I told you I, w I would prefer to do the testing this way. Nah, that's no good. That's not what we want. We had flame out at 103. Okay. Alright, I saw what I wanted to see. So see, now that I have this curve program, the original one programmed here, we could just copy it, right? And we can just, that curve is no good. We could just reapply it here. See? The real question is how powerful of a rocket motor do you need to unspin a tornado? You'd need a pretty strong one. Tornadoes are strong enough to move the air around to lift houses off the ground. Thrust tail off, bone sister. Yep. Okay. I think we're ready to go, guys. Let's test it out on a stack. Stack prototype four. There we go. Our thrust profiles programmed in. Let's do this.
Yeah, Hammernails. She's nice. Good vehicle. Just gotta get it tweaked. Okay. D minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition. Lift off. Roll program complete. Roger roll. Everything's looking good here. Getting throttle back here for maximum dynamic pressure. We have max Q. Stand by for the throttle up. Go at throttle up. Go at throttle up. Everything looking good. Supersonic. Everything's still looking good here on the stack. I'm going to try to separate the SRBs where the cow controller. Uh, we're aiming for a 1 minute 10 second separation, so that's 1 minute 40. Not a hundred percent sure that that is going to be enough. Discovery, go at throttle up. We're not going fast enough. Chris, happy 74 month. Thanks, man. Yeah, that was not good. Um, the SRPs have to be more powerful than that. Um, yeah, they have to be. Mutter, we gotta scale that curve. Our TWR was terrible. Uh, also, 1.25 was right, Luffy. Yeah, that was really bad, actually. We were not going nearly fast enough. Yeah, that's very bad. 
Yeah, I'm aborting this flight. Abort that simulation. Freeze the tank. That was terrible. Yeah, that thrust curve sucked. That was really not good. That curve's horrid. These weren't scaled to 137, so that wasn't as tested. Ah, that may have had something to do with it. I, I was looking at those numbers, I'm like, those numbers aren't right, because that one's supposed to be 93. Yeah. Total time of the cow was set to 100. We gotta try again. That, yeah, that was a bad, that was a bad test. Try again. Overlap. Oh, of course, I don't. I I don't want to use four boosters here. Um, I don't want to do that. Uh, I will say this though. Uh, we did look. We did. I, I thought that you would need four SRBs, but you don't. We there's a way to squeeze the performance out of the SRB to get this to work right. I'm just trying to figure out what the heck that is. T minus ten, nine. Eight, seven. Hold. I want the cow controller up. Make sure that it's playing. T minus ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Yeah, I hit the wrong button. Abort! <laughs> that would have been even worse. I hit the staging instead of shuttle engines. That was dumb. Whoops. This is why in real life they have a sequencer. And once we get this figured out, I'll probably program all of this into a cow, into a sequencer, into a launch sequencer, and then go from there. The first wallops launch of Electron is net December 7th. Cool. We got an anomaly. We got to secure the area. Monster fish? I don't know, not relevant. T minus. Hold on. Yeah, there we go. I want I want this stuff up so we can see it. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, booster ignition. Acceleration and liftoff. Shuttle's doing a roll program. Roll program complete. Roger roll. Shuttle throttling back for maximum dynamic pressure. We have max Q. Oh, nope, hold on. Yeah, it was higher this time. 16.3 pas uh, thousand pascals. 16.6. We have max Q. 
exactly when it should have happened. Perfect. Stand by for the throttle up command. Go at throttle up. Roger, go at throttle up. That was really good. Much better. Much better. Oh, yes. I'm really happy that we found, we figured out that it wasn't set right because I was, I was like, wait a minute. The math says that that should work right. Why isn't it doing it? Cross tailing off and SRB standing by for separation. They never got below. Yeah. Okay. That ascent was cherry. It was perfect. Um, but they didn't ramp off and thrust how I wanted them to. Also, I noticed that these back things... Oh, they're at 50%. Oh, yeah. Those don't need to fire as long. Because they're at 50% throttle. Yeah, those, those burned for twice as long. So if we give them half the fuel of the ones up top, they'll it'll push the boosters. The boosters will go back, push out, and then turn. But we need to we need to separate them while they're still firing. That's really important. Maybe just tweak the tail end of that curve now. Guys, I want to try something, and I'm not sure if it's going to work, because that's basically the same. I don't think it'll ramp that quickly, Alex. I don't think it'll do it.
5185. Ninety three oh seven. Alright, well, Alex, here's what we're doing then. We're doing that. Alex, if I'm looking at this right, and based off of what I've seen from the math that you guys are doing, right? If we have the thrust curve go from here to here, down to here like this, and then over, and then down again, the SRB is going to do something like this. The throttle on the SRB. Like that, right? Am I wrong? Either that, or it's gonna hit a sharp ramp like this and then do that instead. It's a spline. It's a spline. Wait, does that mean it would... Does that mean it's gonna do this? Not quite a spline, it's exponent. No, it won't do that. Because there's a threshold. If it's too much of a corner, right? It's, it's, it's exponent, yeah. But it's, that's, dude, this is kind of like IK handles in, in rigging. Or building roads in cities. Same idea. I see what you're saying, Alex. Let's try it. Oh, make sure that both SRBs are using that curve. All right, let's see if, let's see what spiking that curve does. We need to separate these things at 300. They need to have 300 kilonewtons of thrust. If they're making, if they're, if they have more than 300 kilonewtons of thrust at separation, they'll stay there. They'll stay stuck. You're a spline, got him. <laughs> Think NASA used this to build Artemis? Yes. There's separate rates for throttle up and down. Exponential reduction in change as it approaches commanded thrust. Interesting. It's weird. Okay. Does anybody else think it's really strange that this logic already exists in KSP for a feature that was never intended to be in KSP? Like, what's governing it to do that? Why would it... Why would it do that and have it not be in KSP? It should behave like this. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's working like a spline. I did write a quick dirty KRPC script that can plot the actual thrust. I have no way of testing it though, so I don't know if it works. Oh, okay. Well, we'll just do it this way then. Let me get that cow controller up. Pin the cow controller. Pin the booter. Open the editor. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Got acceleration and a liftoff. Roll program complete. Roger roll, orbiter. Control now in command of this flight. T 
Jeb's having a good time. What's the view look like? Very nice. He's he's having fun. Any plans for orbiter names yet? Uh, I'm thinking about it internally. It's, an, it's a company internal thing right now, Joe. Okay, throttling back for Max Q. KS-25 throttling back to 60%, 66% of rated. Stand by for the throttle up command here. Orbiter, go at throttle up. Copy, go, throttle up. Orbiter engines throttling back up here. Discovery, go at throttle up. As we work on this simulated ascent trajectory to prepare for, to test for our SRB separations, working correctly. Yeah, Alex, it's it's dialed. It's amazing that the... Can I just say that it's ridiculous that we actually took the actual shuttle booster's booster profile and literally, with some tweaks, plugged that in. Novus did the math for it. Plugged that in into KSP and it works. Like, that's a little weird. But it works, so it's not very weird. Yeah, we actually did it. It's freaking, it's freaking doing it, which is really, really cool. All right, and what I'm gonna do here, guys, is instead of separating at Instead of separating at the um, at a certain time, I'm going to see if we can separate the boosters. I'm, I'm going to find the opportune time, and we'll see where it ends up. Yeah. This really isn't going to give us the tail off that we're looking for. Well, it might. Hold on. There it is. All right, ready? And... No. Well, that's not ideal. Yeah, the boosters just wanted to meet each other. PWR was right, but they didn't detach properly. The thru the shuttle at separation is making like 1.2 TWR, dude. We... Maybe give the Separatrons a little bit more kick. 1.2, you need to aim for 250 kilonewtons at separation. Alright. Let's, let's try that. No. 
No, we're gonna need another holding point right here. So it knows. All right. Let's go again. It's very strange. We're so close to getting this right. We're very close. I might, Alex, I might make it so the boosters produce a little more kick on the, on the, at the beginning. No springy like push off and away. It uses separator motors, Kuro. Oh, cow controller. Thanks, Black. Yeah, appreciate it, man. Um, all right. Okay. T minus ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We have ignition. And that lift off wasn't exactly what I wanted, but that's okay. That's a little bit quick on the roll program, but it's okay. We really just need to watch the booster thrust. back for max Q. We have max Q. Go at throttle up. Copy, go at throttle up. Vehicle's not supersonic. Tail off on SRB should be coming up on separation real soon. Something like that, Lewis. Yeah. Oof. We're our thrust is going down lower than our fuel though, which is good which means we're gonna have some fuel left over when we hit the 250 kilonewton mark, which is good. Stand by for separation. Yes. Perfect.
That was it. We got to tweak the separation event a little bit. That one had that one actually had too much rotation. Um, the boosters had too much rotation, but that was right. We'll ride this one into space because this one worked. Damn, boy, you really got this dialed in. Yep. Some quick maths. Okay, Orbiter, you are two engine Tal. Yeah, we gotta, I gotta mess with the separator motors, dude. Are the SRBs still gonna be recoverable? Yeah. Yeah, that should be. Um, but I don't think I had the separators. The separators weren't the same from one left one booster to the other. See, look at that. Look at the trajectory difference. Hmm. Okay. Single engine towel. Go for the pitch. Press 109. Vehicles pitching over for acquisition through Tidris. Apogee is too high again. Stand by, press for Miko. Mark it, press for Miko. Where the SRB is at. Yeah, we could ride them down. Sure, easily recoverable. Do you ever think you would use the abort modes like RTLS on real missions if something happens? Um, I would know what to do, yeah. Uh, but we don't really have to worry about an engine shutting off. Unless I catastrophically mess something up, spaceophobic. But yeah, I could. And we could use them. Actually, that's really, really good. Yeah, that's perfect. This is perfect. So now I could separate the shuttle. Then have it move away from the external tank. And then the shuttle, when it gets to Apogee, right? When it gets to AP, then we could circularize. The external tank would come back down. But while the shuttle's coasting to Apogee, we could switch back over to the SRBs ride them down, and have them deploy the parachutes. The last week for those would be to increase takeoff thrust a tad just to burn a little bit excess fuel. So it's at 112.91. Uh, here's what I'll do. This is not going to affect the performance of the vehicle in any way, so. I'm going to take a panel right here. Make a cow controller. And then we just need something that produces thrust. This is fine. That's saved. So we have that. We can revert to it if we need it. Hey, Jim, what's going on? So now let's go over here like this. Go back in here. So the first thing we need to do is delete that.
115.72 at the arc of the curve. That should do it. Okay, let's back this up. Open the editor. Copy this to the second booster. Thanks, Black Suit. Appreciate it, man. And now that controller has my original thrust curve if we want to go back to it. Those are a couple of physics parts in a panel. It's not going to screw with the design too much. Did you fix the booster separation? We got it dialed in 95, or at least we're trying to dial it in right now. We should have it. I'm failing to get them to kind of slip out, but oh yeah, the other thing after those tweaks, I want to set this back to 1.6. You forgot to click linear on those last nodes. Uh, to do that, I have to plus in a node right there, and then do that, and then do that. Copy that. Paste it there. There we go. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. 150 or around 150 should be the burn time. How's it looking, Novus? With a little bit of tweaks here and there, it's looking good, but it's just pretty much the curve that you gave me. I just needed to get the tail off a little bit more in line with where I wanted it. Uh, but dude, this the SRBs throttle down right and they hit they hit the bottom of the first thrust curve after the first tail off right at max q it's it is perfect like if i throttle the shuttle engines down at 30 seconds we go into the throttle bucket and right at 40 seconds you hit max q and then at 50 you throttle it back up dude it, it actually works it's pretty crazy how well this actually works i'm good 95 I'm good, my dude. Okay. But yeah, Novus, that's pretty much the same thrust curve. We figured out that this thing kind of does an exponential curve. If these turns are too drastic, it'll do an exponential. Like, almost like, almost like how, like, think how you make the roads in city skylines. Like that. It will do that. Sounds like the booster engineers knew what they were doing. The fact that we can translate this into KSP and it pretty much works is actually really, really cool. That's really cool, man. <laughs> That's really cool. T minus 10, nine, eight, seven, go for main engine start. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Booster ignition. And we got a lift off. program complete oh look at that thing right on that tank man that's damn cool all systems looking good shuttle throttle a should be entering the throttle bucket here for max q Throttling down for maximum dynamic pressure. Look. Look. Did 
dude. That's that's really good. We have that pretty we have that pretty much dialed, man. It's perfect. How does that even happen? Oh my gosh, I can't believe Kerbal understood what the heck is going on here. That's like it's really good. It's freaking perfect, man. Oh my goodness. Go at throttle up. Got me go throttle up. Okay, now we just need to get this tail off right, and then this thing is dialed, and then we work on direct. Come on, SRBs, don't fail me now. Rust is staying below fuel, which is right. Automated shuttle launch systems? No, I'm not doing that. I'm flying it. I'm very much flying it. This is the thrust curve. Thrust uh, on the SRBs is beginning tail off, standing by for separation. I don't know, Jay, maybe. That thrust needs to go below fuel or else we're not going to be able to separate, right? It's doing it. It's doing it. The thrust is below fuel. Come on, baby. Perfect. That was perfect, man. That was it. That was it. That was it. That's it. We're good. We don't need to do nothing no more. That is exactly how those... That is exactly how they separate. Oh, that was... That was beautiful. That was beautiful. That that gave me a little warm, fuzzy feeling inside. I'm not gonna lie. I, that feels great. Yep. Feels great, man. That was perfect. Oh, oh, that was nice. Oh, yeah, that, that, that was good. That was really good. That was perfect. Oh, it was so good. Oh, my goodness. Hey, Angry, what's going on? Wow. Yeah, six, right? <laughs> Nut. Lost N N N. What? How long does the shuttle fly with that huge tank form for attached to it? It the tank and the shuttle make it about ninety eight percent of the way there, dude. Oh, they're perfectly parallel? That's freaking sweet, dude. You don't know how good that is. Okay, stand by for the pitch over. Shuttle, stand by, press for Miko. I pushed the Apogee a little bit too high again that time. We have main engine shut down. Oh, 
Ohms 1 not required. Orbiter, welcome to space. That's right, Hip. Mm hmm And now, what's the time till Apogee? Time to Apogee is seven minutes. Oh, yeah. We could ride those boosters down in seven minutes. Easy peasy. Pretty, pretty freaking sweet. Yeah, plenty of time. Yeah, it's that's very strange, Aqualex. Yeah, you separated just after 150 or at 110 seconds. That's right where I wanted it, man. It's perfect. No, because I needed to make a little bit of tweaks here and there for the for Max Q and everything, but that's for the most part the it's for the most part the four segments curve. Like, it is the exact curve that you gave me, dude. Discovery. No, not no, that one. Up. Um, it's that. That's it. I made some tweaks on mark on node 110 and then i made some tweaks on node 10. node 10 goes to 115 and then it goes back down to 100. and then 2030 so i i just basically added more at the beginning and took a little bit more away from the end works works freaking great dude maybe owens look superb seems like you have it squared away now got to see what a difference payloads will make though yep that's the next test Could we even put that separate? We could put the separation into the cal. Could you bind undock to a cal controller? Yes, you can, but it doesn't work all the time. That's why I'm prefer it. I'm preferring. I'd prefer to use an action group. But we could do a master sequencer, yeah. But before we do that, I, I will manually sequence this stuff for now. We'll do 18 tons and we'll see how she flies. I'll I'll admit, guys, I did see something that I wasn't too big of a fan of. It looks like there are certain points where the shuttle engines right at SRB tail off overpower it and the center of thrust moves way, way out of whack. But I could be wrong. Maybe putting payload on it will fix it. But yeah, there are points where the SRBs dip where I really don't like them dipping like that. For selfish regions, can we get a full mission test launch and landing? If this does what I think it's going to do, Max, I'll think about it, okay? Glad I helped. I figured it needed some tweaks with the stack, but that inflict lag was really throwing me for a loop. Try to keep all the points 100 per, under 100% so you could have control over every point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, Yukerman. Good to see you back. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate that. I'm glad. Good to see you here, man. Yuke, you, you, you gotta check this out. This is... The way she saps is... Pretty much perfect. Hey, Natch. What's up, dude? It's funny how you earlier in the stream were, were showing about the deep space payload that was supposed to go on the shuttle, and now Scott just brought a, a YouTube video about deep space shuttle missions. Dude, I, Scott watches the stream, Karanov. He just lurks in here. I know he watches the stream, though. He, he's told me. I know him. I, I know Scott. He's a good buddy of mine, actually. Like, I just don't really like to tell people about that because it's weird. Like, oh yeah, I know him. He's my bro. I'm down with Will Gates. He calls me money for short. He helps me with my tax support. It's all about the Pentiums. He doesn't watch the stream very often. And if he does, I know he lurks. He doesn't, he doesn't bother talking. That's fair. I do that. I do that all the time. I sign out of my Twitch account and I go and watch other people's streams sometimes. Emma, wait, can stream telemetry on Discord again if you want to for a flight or two? Good morning, by the way. That's kind of tempting. And yuck, thank you for the 92 months, man. Can you believe that? 
sometime next year we're going to be there's gonna be people with three figure resub that's strange I don't uh, dude how did we make it this far I hope not hitting 140% doesn't mess with the launch launch profile when loaded. What do you mean? Hard work, man. See? Yeah, dude. Love what I do. 2016? Dutch guy, I've been streaming since 2012. April 11th, 2015 is when I got partnered. September 19th, 2015 is when I went full-time. I've been doing this as my job since 2015. I've been streaming since 2012. Okay. Sound suppression water sequencer is activated. D minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Go for main engine start. 5, 4, 3, Two, one, booster ignition. And we got a lift off. Yep. TWR is in line for 18 tons of payload. That's pretty much where we'd be at. Shuttle's cleared the tower. Go for roll program. Roll program complete. Roger roll. Mission Control now in control of the flight here. All systems looking good. Dude, that looks, that looks right. That looks really right. Oh my goodness. Okay, engine throttling back to 66% of rated for max Q. We have max Q at T plus 41. Stand by for the throttle up command. Orbiter, go at throttle up. Copy, go at throttle up. Throttle up command being issued to the orbiter. Jet reporting good throttle up on the orbiter. It's 18 tons and four crew take aim into low carbon orbit. Yeah, see. See, this is what I mean. We're getting into a gimbal lock scenario with the SRBs here. Next step in the flight, we thrust the tail off on the SRBs. Standing by for separation. Separation should occur at 1 minute 50 seconds into the flight. All systems still looking good on the vehicle. SRBs have entered tail off thrust. Fifteen seconds to separation. Ten seconds. Good separation on the boosters. A little close to the wings, we should probably mess with that. Orbiters onboard computers commanding the main engine nozzles to swivel, aiming the shuttle for its precise targeted space for main engine cutoff. Clock two minute ten seconds. Orbiter now seventy 
46 kilometers in altitude, about 40 kilometers downrange. Thanks, Sarah. Weird how the tumble isn't consistent. Yeah. They rotated too much. We needed... They rotated a little too much, dude. We might need to tweak the thrust down on the rotation. It was the right amount of... Right amount of impulse, I think. Is the fuel in the payload bay locked out? Yes. Okay, orbiter, go for the pitch. That's PIO right there. This is me doing that. Too much yaw. There we go. She's dialed in. Stand by. Press for Miko. Why do you call the heads up maneuver the pitch? That's what they call it. At least could be recollecting wrong. That was way too much. Ah, uh, trash messed me up. Damn it, man. It's way too high. Yeah, we're much too high. back and forth so much. Stop doing that. short line. The commentary that I do, guys, especially after booster separation, is just kind of for fun. Uh, there's no Talibort here with this thing, or ATO. It's just really me trying to not get the AP to go to 150. That's, see, that's much too high. This, that's very, very, that's a, I was aiming for 100, and we went, I was aiming for 100 by 20. We're at 150 by 28. That's terrible. That's, that's really bad. And for whatever stupid reason, the SAS was overcompensating, so we our separation from the tank was bad too. If I want to, we're gonna fly this as much as I, as much as I want to fly this, this. That isn't gonna do that. It's not gonna work. That's that's sloppy. That's bad. Can you shoot for a shallower ascent? Yeah, I just gotta fly it better. Fire. Yeah. with that anyway um okay so the srv's kind of over rotated there so what i'm gonna do these are set to 0.8 at 50 and what are these set to 1.6 at 100 
I'm going to set these to 1.6. Do you ever think you'll ever try to Python the Ascent? I really don't want to. But maybe as a fun challenge someday. Not 100% thrust. I'm worried about giving the booster too much TWR, Alex. If we separate these things, the thrust of the separatrons combined with the separation thrust could... Uh, put the boosters TWR higher than 250, right? Like, we don't want to do that. Right now... Yeah, that's not really what we were looking for. It can take 36 into space, guys, but you'll use up all you'll use up near all of the ohms fuel. I would say that maximum, like maximum payload with this thing is probably round 25, which is pretty much in line with the shuttle. What about parachutes on the SRBs? Like those? I got you, man. Wait, why aren't the shoots on both sides? Oh. Oh, we must have overwrote the wrong craft file. Hmm. Please hold. I think we can get rid of the stored curve that we have there. We don't need that anymore because this curve works fine. So I'll just dump the stork, the stored curve, stork curve, and change this to eleven nine. Okay. And then what we'll do to separator group four. set the drogues to deploy hopefully at separation the drogues don't pop out because then yeah that would be bad but if i believe if we set them to when safe deploy when safe it should be good you like the white et yeah we didn't really setting it to the orange thing doesn't really look right because it's not all orange. And I can't use flags to cover it up either because the external tank is a custom diameter. So we're rolling with the white external tank for a little while. Okay. I got. I should probably put the fuel lines on the ET as well. We have ways to do it, but... I can do it with physicsless parts and make it look really nice. You'll do a wubbo... Ockle, shout out to Space Lab. Hell yeah. Used ecstatic to see Collins again. Right on, man. All right. Am I missing anything?
I think we're good, dudes. All right, so here's what we'll do. We'll see if we can ride those SRBs back down. And what I'll do is I'll do something I haven't done in a long time. I'll put a quick save. I'll put a quick save right when we load onto the pad so we don't have to do the whole mission. I want, I would like to do a, a, an entire mission here, fellas, but um, I really just want to make sure we have this completely dialed in with the shuttle. And who knows, maybe this one will be a full mission. I don't know. Uh, we don't have a way to jettison the payload, so we this would technically be a payload down mass test, which I don't know if we can take 18 tons back down, dude. I know it'll do half, but whatever. So maybe we won't do this one as the first flight, you know? Gotta say, that shuttle's great. Good job. Thanks, man. Saw the flags inside of the bay? Yeah, I put flags in, and then we put a payload bay fabric texture on them to make it look like the shuttle's payload bay. And then I put all the, I used some of the new lights in KSP to put those into the right spots. Uh, the, the lights in the payload bay are exactly where they are in the real shuttle's payload bay. Timberborn is too addictive. Yes. All right. Drop the quick save. Yeah, yeah, 95. I mean, I think it, yeah, probably, eh, yeah, it, might, it might be fine. Who knows? T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Mission. And lift off. Orbit is underway, you got a roll program. Roger roll. Roll program complete. Engines on the shuttle throttling back for max Q. That is what fixed it, 95. The SRBs on the real shuttle have eight degrees of gimbal. And you know what, man? I'm not usually one for modifying that, but I wasn't I wanted the SRBs to do what they should. I wanted the, I wanted them to do what they do in real life. Roast is ready. We're past max Q. Go at throttle up. Copy, go at throttle up. I just, yeah, 95, I said screw it. I wanted that, I wanted them to work. Oh, dude, look at that with waterfall. It looks so good, man. Oh my goodness. That looks so right. It looks, it, oh. Man. My right ear loves this. See? See this? That's not, that's not good. That means we're using the gimbal to fly straight, which is not ideal. Go for roast. Do you wish to use mods sooner? No, not at all. Thrust tailing off at SRB, standing by for separation. Close. 
close. Showing good separation. They're in perfect synchronicity, which is good. That's not what that's not how you say that at all. I just wanted to synchronicity because many miles away there's a shadow on the door of a cottage on the shore of a dark Scottish lake. True story. I'm watching it, Alex. We're not gonna be near it just yet. I agree. I, I'm. I like syn well, synchronicity too. It's a good song, man. But yes, very good police album. Hey, flip up. Thirteen months. Thanks, buddy. And every single meeting with this so-called superior is a humiliating kick in the crotch. <laughs> Just visual mods, Kopi. That's all. Looking good. Stand by. We're pressing for Miko. We have Miko confirmed. Much better. 93 by 13. No ohms one required, orbiter. Stand by for ET separation and welcome to space. We'll see if the drugs pop, Novus. One of the boosters may have gotten eaten by the Kraken. I don't think I, I may have, I may have messed it up. So we'll see if we get both of them. Hello? Well then, where's the other one? Out of physics. We're way out of physics range. Damn! They're too far away from each other. That one's not getting physically simulated. And it's about to obliterate itself. Um, hello, drug shoot? Well, that's good.
Damn. I saw it again. Yeah, can't deploy it well stowed. Interesting. Uh, because we pretty much all but confirmed that you could absolutely do that. But uh, it's an open fairing. It's not closed. You know what I'm saying? Oops. Banana time, the only thing that I can think of is when we reload, like when we reload the thing into the editor, the game is closing the fairing on the nose cone instead of being a deleted fairing. They do do that. He said doo-doo. <laughs> it's okay, passing. Yeah, we'll get it. If I tweak that separation and get the boosters to not fly out and away from each other so much, uh... Yeah, if we take the if we tweak the sap to not do that, they'll fall next to each other. As long as the boosters are near each other, as long as they're within 20 kilometers of each other, they will they will fall next to each other and it will simulate the shoot. You gotta remember, physics simulation range when you're flying through the air is 21 kilometers. To contrast that, when you're on the ground, physics simulation range between a stationary object on the ground and whatever you are, like a rover going towards a base, is 180 meters. It's 21 kilometers when you're flying. As long as the boosters can separate and they're within 20 kilometers of each other, both of the chutes will deploy. It will work. We're just going to hit recover for now, Ian, but the way I have these boosters deploy and pop open, we could we could do that. We could, yeah, we could do it. Heck, we found a way to refuel them outside of the VAB. No, I did not mean 2.1 kilometers, Alucard. I meant 21. Yep. Discovery, go at throttle up. You'd be helped by having a control point on a hinge you can set to follow prograde. You can't set SAS remotely like that, dude. That doesn't work. Wait, how? The refueling. Skills. Oh. I... Control point to follow program. You've already made these suggestions, dude. You've already made the suggestion. I already have that. I have a control point for the ohms and a control point for booster engine separation. Roast is getting cold. Give me a freaking second, dude. But also, you're a dick for mentioning it. But also, thank you. And you're not, you're not, a, you're not, you're not as much of a dick as previously thought of. But also, I am hungry. But also, I want to finish this. And you're distracting me. But also, I want roast. I'm so confused. Oh, Mr. Krabs. I am so confused. Refueling, 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 refueling. Welcome to the No You crap file. As you can see here, we have a very nice booter. And I'll just put that booter on our updated thrust profile because that was the last thing that was copy and pasted. But if you notice, this booter has no fuel in it. There's no fuel in this booter. We gotta put fuel in it. We gotta pack, we gotta pack the grain. We have to boot the booter. I like calling them booters. Booster is cool, but booter sounds better. The roast! <laughs> yeah, we discovered this when we were messing with thrust curves in the cow controller. If you set the if you set the thrust to inverse inverse thrust, it'll make fuel. 
So I could put my SRB on a repacking stand after we fished them out and brought them back. I could put it on a repacking stand and tow that back to the pad, put it on the pad, refuel them, and reuse them. We could do that. Now, cringe. Yeah, look at me. Can you refuel it in space? Sure, why not? Look, take this SRV. Peaceful, serene, a boring. But if it is... Uh, but if it is refueled... Oh, look at all these little things. So busy now. You can generate fuel. I, I, We knew that you could do this. I knew that negative thrust on a cal controller... Like, see how the thrust the thrust curve goes down here. Negative thrust on a cal controller does generate fuel. We know that. We we knew that. I didn't know it generated solid rocket fuel. I we knew it generated liquid fuel and oxidizer, but I didn't think it generated us the, the solid rocket fuel. But look, you want to repack the SRV? Use it again. And now the excess fuel that's being generated gets burned off with negative thrust. Do real SRBs do this too? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Jerry. Release the clamps. It doesn't do anything. You'd think it would shoot backwards that way. Flame me in first. Pointy in back. But it doesn't. Negative thrust doesn't do anything. It just generates fuel. So wait for this cow controller to finish. Actually, we could just pause it and just move it over there. That's fine. So now we're not generating fuel anymore. Disable that cow controller. Now, the SRB is already in an activated state, so if I take this with our updated thrust curve that we just made for the shuttle, and we hit play, boop! There's the thrust curve that the shuttle just used to fly. <laughs> it works! No, it wouldn't. It just generates fuel, Ren. I tried it. But I'm gonna give this sub to roast? To roast? Why? Is this because I overcooked the roast? Now release the clamps. Uh, okay, yeah, I'll do that right now. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Do it? No. Yeah, guys, you can use this to generate fuel. It's kind of lame if you do it, but I think it would be cool to have like a SRB repacking stand, right? And then repack the SRB and then reuse it. That's cool. We could do it. Hey, Ish. What's up, man? 27 month resub. Do not touch that button, Didi, Didi, no, no, Didi, no. It's a good show. Ha ha ha. Ha 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 Can it generate fuel while burning? Uh, yeah. Just moved to Texas, so things have been very busy. Huh. Huh. No, I, no, 2020, it can't, no. Now the big question, can you do repack them using KRPC? I don't see why not. Anything, you could do anything in KRPC that you can do with a cow controller. I actually noticed that we had 340 resi we had some residual fuel you know what we could do with this curve we could uh we could get that uh we might be able to push it up a little bit more up there because look it has burn time on that goes forever 
But you know what? We dialed it in and it works, but I'm just worried about these things landing with some residual solid rocket fuel in them. But then again, that... That is pretty much what uh, real SRB does. Real SRBs do have some residual fuel left over. That absolutely does happen. So disable this cow controller, reset its position, go over here, reset that position, re-enable, play, and now it's just regenerating fuel for us. Yeah, it makes sense. It was still firing under parachute last flight. Yeah, I mean, that's what the real ones did, Ian. They, that's what they do. They make really, really small amounts of thrust, but that is what they do. Um, uh, here we go. See? She's still burning, even on the way down. No need for supersonic retro propulsion here, dudes. Believe it or not, what's going on is that air is getting compressed inside of the booster. Yeah, that's why you're getting that pulsing effect. But yeah, these things just kind of yeet themselves right back down. We could, Ren, we could repack them. Like I said, I built I'm building this shuttle to be uh I'm building the shuttle to be reintegratable, but we're not going to make the pad for it. But I am building it to be reintegratable. Yeah, there's not... Ian, long story short, because of calculus and how the booster is hard-coded, there's not really a good way to do that. Eve. What? nozzle jettison right there the SRB is having a blade of nozzle it's a one time use they just put a new nozzle on it how else are you going to keep that thing cool speeve okay and then when the SRB comes back down the water actually gets forced inside of the combustion chamber and actually the, the SRB turns into a gigantic shock absorber no need for crush cores here. Seriously. Think about it. It's a hydropneumatic shock absorber. The entire SRB cushions its own landing. Parachutes aren't enough to get that thing to fall correctly. Yep. And then when it goes in, see? All the air gets stuck in the top of the SRB and the water compresses the air and that dampens the impact. It's a gigantic hydropneumatic shock absorber. And that air that gets stuck in there actually makes it so the SRB will right itself. But it didn't show it. How the SRB lands in the water, how it ends up settling is like that. Pretty cool, huh? I doubt you could even you could even say if you did know from contacts, but will will KSP one craft files work in KSP two? No. Uh, confirmed. Hard no. And then the, the boats actually reel them in and they pull them over. And then divers divers actually go down there and they plug the booster. They, they have a booster plug. It's a FOD cover, right? To make sure that, you know, like fish don't go in there. I mean, there might be some fish in there. Like, oh, this kind of sucks if there is. But they, uh, they put the plugs on them. They dive down, right? And they install the plug. See? And that keeps the booster buoyant. It keeps it from sinking. See? And then they tow it back. 
And it comes through Port Canaveral. There's Jetty Park right there. Yep, there they are. Look. Think Falcon Heavy was the first thing to do two booster landings? Nah, son. NASA's been doing it since 1981. Oh. Oh. Slowly. Firmly grasp it. Firmly grasp it. Firmly grasp it. Oh. Cool. Yep. Oh. Now that I didn't, I had never noticed before. That plug has a bilge pump on it. Ah, that's a bilge pump. Neat. Well, that's pretty neat. It's got a bilge pump on it. I never noticed that. A what now? A bilge pump. There's a water pump on it, Kirinov. So, ships have water pumps on them. The water, it's called a bilge. The bilge is the part of the ship that's like at the very bottom of the boat. Right? Think about it. You know, ships go over, they have waves splashing on them, it rains, water does collect in the bottom of the hull. It absolutely will. You don't want it you don't want it to stay there. Because then your boat will eventually just get filled with water and you'll lose that whole buoyancy thing and then So ships have a pump. You've probably seen it. You probably see a boat that's just kind of chilling, and then you see like water being poured out the side, that's the bilge pump. So the SRB has a bilge pump so they can keep the water out of it. Or they can pump the remaining water out of it. So it, well, becomes more buoyant. Water in 10 mil sockets. Yep, yep. It's probably just letting the water get pushed out by compressed air. That does sound right until you see the actual pumping mechanism on the side. Does that include the drone ships? Absolutely. Yeah, passing him and make me want to play Stormworks, dude. And then if we were going to recover the SRBs, I would just make this in Kerbal. Just make that. Just lift the damn thing up. Back from the restaurant and still streaming. Nice. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, our SRB refueled itself, by the way. So we can just shut that off, reset its position, go over here, enable this, and hit play. And oh, look. Now we got a. Now, now it's refueled. Yeah, the bilge pump is also connected to, let's see, what else? What else is on a, a typical ship? You have, uh, there's, there's a fuel pump that you can pump overboard if you really wanted to, but, uh, that's kind of frowned upon. Actually dumping the bilge in, in, dumping the bilge in harbor is also frowned upon. Yeah, you don't want to do that. That's very illegal. Uh, you have the ballast pumps, cross-feeding system, so you can... You can make sure that if you're carrying something heavy on the back, you flood the forward tank so the ship is on an even keel, literally. Um, but you don't want to go too much. If you go too much, your draft will get too low and the ship will sink. We learned all that from Stormworks. Yeah. They should have put a bilge pump in the Mercury capsule. Yeah. Yeah, they should have. This is a certified Gus Grissom moment. What's next on the shuttle to-do list? Um... Ever think of returning to Stormworks someday? Dude, they've added a lot, haven't they? Let's 
so we got to tweak the SRB separation. That's what we got to do. We got to mess with it. We got to mess with the SRB separator. Um, the boosters did push themselves way too far apart and they were rotating too much. So if they're rotating too much, we could use less thrust here. Because these are the things that get them to rotate. These, these, this cluster of separatrons. We could set that one to 50 and 0.8. and see where this gets us for separation. It'll give me some good seat time for the shuttle. And then we'll leave that at 50 at 1.6. We'll see what those do. All right, cool. Let's give her another launch. Not gonna lie, the go searcher that you made in Stormworks was awesome. Was awesome. We could go finish it. I never finished the stupid thing because I didn't know how to code all the systems to get the automation correct. Should have probably just handed that off to somebody. Uh, yeah, maybe yes. Get that whole thing working. That'd be pretty cool. That was a that was a hell of a hell of a ship, dude. We. It was designed pretty dang well. I mean, I just copied the Go Searcher, but whatever. I mean, guys, if you want to see more Stormworks, I suppose we could do it. But I, I really just, I really just want to play KSP. Go figure. I love doing this stuff again, and I'm kind of annoyed at myself that we didn't go back to doing this sooner. But I really wanted to get the other stuff figured out, you know. Yes, I've seen it. Okay. Let's test our separation event again. I'm going to quick save, and then... Let's just check something here. The min pressure was set to 0.7 or something. I'm going to set it up here. To 0.5. So, 50 kPa, 50.5 kPa is the deploy. And that should make it so those things don't deploy right away. Okay, here we go. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition. Good acceleration and liftoff. Go for roll program. Roll program complete. Roger roll. Just aim camera at the control points, dude. Or aim, aim camera at the hold down points. That's all. Throttling back for maximum dynamic pressure here. Shuttle still have 18 tons in there? Yes, it does. 
Yeah, I think, right. Max Q, 16.7 pascals, or kilopascals. Just above one bar right there. Everything's looking good. Go ahead, throttle up. Gimbal, Ivan. Thrust vector control on the SRVs, just like the real one. I did what the real shuttle does, and I coded these to have eight degrees of gimbal just like the real ones. And the shuttle works excellent. It's perfect. We're just dialing in the SRB separation here. This should have less rotation, guys, and more outward force. And that should get the SRBs to kind of stay near each other. Tailing off with SRB standing by for separation. We got about 20 seconds actually. I thought the SRVs didn't have gimbal. Why didn't you enable it before? Because I needed to modify the craft file. I needed to do some slight tweaks to the craft file. Does KRPC allow you to bypass crack and eating unattended re entering ships? No. No, not really. Okay, standing by for separation. Here we go, moment of truth. And that was not what I want. No good. Yeah, it bumped the wing, Kiranov. It was a real treat seeing the return of the auto streams. Hopefully that stupid GoPro behaves in the future. Can't figure out what's going on with that thing, man. It must be overheating. Uh, or something. Okay. All right, I'm gonna set these back up to 100. We need more rotation too. I'm gonna keep these at 50. But I'll have them burn a little bit longer. What are the thrust values on the separator motors? The bottom ones are 100 at 1.6, and then the top ones are 50 at 1.6. So these ones should give it more of an oomph. When it separates, it should push them out a little bit more, and the top ones should give it a little bit more rotation, but not at high thrust. So they need to go, they need to go backwards, out, and then rotate. It, it all happens kind of really, really fast.
Okay. If you have overheating issues with a GoPro while streaming from it, take out the battery and plug in the USB-C cable. It did... that fixed it for you, no more overheating. Excuse me for one second. Food. Oh yeah, we gotta get the roast. So here. So like this. Tepidrons are too far from the center of gravity. Uh, I don't know. I might have to do some dynamics with it and see, because. Might not be out of the woods with the separation mechanism. We got the tail off for us to be right. That's only half the battle, though. Um, I'll be right back.
So, fellas, the GoPro ain't turning on. With no battery in it, it's not turning on at all. Yeah, hook it up to a USB and let the battery door open. Leave the battery door open? Huh. You have to leave the battery door open? Hey, Jackal. 15 eggs and one shuttle. What? Yeah, sure. Rocket Wolves, what are you trying to do? You can offer second, second confirmation. Okay. Is anyone here to help me with a KRPC issue? Oh, dude. Okay, so hold on. I... I want to make sure I didn't screw with the staging. Easy peasy. Um, so there's a thing with the libraries, dude, uh, that you have to mess with. Add at the very top. Put this right there. That one. Line eight and nine. Import space collections. Collections dot iterable equals collections dot abc dot iterable. Yeah, d uh, v a user named Devious Fusion in chat helped me figure this out uh, because that this basically will make KRPC uh, an older version of KRPC work with the newest version of KSP. I guarantee you that that's what's going on. Yeah, that's a weird one, and I have no idea why that works. I'm not smart enough to figure that one out. Tachometer equals one. I don't think that, you know what, it's probably not that's probably not the right syntax. That explanation is correct. Oh, hey, Devious. What's up, man? You forgot the... Oh, yeah. Sorry, guys. Syntax is wrong. <laughs> yeah. I have the GoPro Black 8 and a USB-C connector behind it. But it's behind the battery door, so it can only connect USB cable if it's open. Don't think it's necessary. Oh, I'm on a Hero 5. Thanks, brother. We good to go now. I got you, man. Actually, thank, like I said, thank Devious Fusion in chat. He's the one that helped me out with that. Also, hi, Discovery. Also, hi, SRB. Also, hi, Shuttle. Yeah. On a Hero 5, dude. If you power the camera from an external source via USB-C, whether that's a wall adapter, USB power brick, computer, or car adapter, you can remove the internal battery. Maybe I, maybe my GoPro is just broken. Maybe it's just broken. Hmm. Anyway. I found a Hero 5 the other day with drum still attached to it. Uh, my Go the GoPro, the problem that we were having yesterday, Jackal, is that the GoPro keeps overheating. Go figure. So I took the battery out and it should work, but it doesn't. Which is strange.
So here it is. Here's the GoPro. There's no battery in it, because right, the battery's out. You guys saw me take it out, so. Let me go here. And let me plug this sucker into the computer. Yeah, she's DOA, nothing. I don't know if this thing can do 4K. Yes, I'm not sure, man. Try a different cable. Ah, oh, dude, I don't know where my GoPro USB-C cable is. Now, I know that that one is a GoPro cable, which, now see, that's interesting. If this cable is not giving me power, then how the heck did this thing stay on for so long the other day? If this cable isn't charging, then the battery would go, but it did say that it was charging on the screen. This is the USB-C cable I've been using to charge the microphones. All right, it's not long enough for you guys to see. Let me, let me. Nope, still dead. You're connected to the same USB port that you just tried now. Yep. Same USB port, both of those. Maybe it's not getting the right voltage. I don't know. Yeah, AFD. Because I swear some of it is word for word. <laughs> Dude, even if it isn't, it's good to know that Scott has the same conclusions about that. Does it still turn on with the battery? I don't know. Let me check. Yeah. Now, what if we plug this in and put it, plug that into a USB port on my keyboard? It does not show the battery is charging. And it just shut off. Okay, she's on now, and now I will pull the battery, shut off, try getting a different battery, I don't have another battery. Hmm. Yeah, thermal, I don't know man. Put it into a wall charger, okay. We're into a wall now. Oh. It's getting power. It's getting power guys, the light's turning on, but I don't think anybody's behind the wheel. really weird that's very strange dudes hmm. maybe I need like an actual GoPro cable for it you know who knows 
this back in its case. I think the GoPro is donezo. Why? It works. It works with the battery in it. We're probably just not getting the right power through this cable. I don't even know what this cable is for. But sometimes they engineer the cables to be proprietary to whatever they're working on, so. You know. GoPro is hold pro. Interesting. All right, well, we'll mess with that another time. Anyway, guys, I'm probably gonna take a second here. Uh, we had the tweaks for this, didn't we? Yeah, sorry for sending you on a goose chase, but that helped you. It's all, it's all good, Sim. D dude, see, here's the thing. Th that actually helps me, cause I, dude, I was drawing a blank. That actually helps me a lot. Because if that GoPro doesn't run, if it doesn't run with power, that means I had it plugged into the wall and it was never charging the battery. But that's kind of strange because it did say it was at some point, so it might, might be, who knows. But either, either way, that tells me that what's going on there is something is weird with the charging system. So that means it was using the battery, right? But that also tells me that the battery's junk. The battery's, the battery's probably toast. Probably get a new battery. If it's gonna overheat in f like five minutes, get a new battery, right? I think the battery's toast on that thing. And I also think because we were not using the right cables that it wasn't getting the right power, it's not getting the right amount of power to be able to stay on constant. So that means it would need the battery and power. And if we were doing that, it may have been overpowering it. Ooh. Yeah, that GoPro battery is probably junk. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and say that this this battery is toast. What type of battery is this? It's gotta be a lithium. If it's lithium, yeah, we should never put this in anything ever again. Yeah, yeah, if it's lithium, oh. Is it supposed to be like that? Fellas. Is it supposed to be like that? Look at the ridge. Yeah, it's tapered out at both ends. I'll just leave that right there. Yeah, it's tapered. Look, look, it's fat at the top. Do you see that? Yeah, this battery's toast. So Simon, you, you ended up helping me. Gosh. Yeah, this battery's, this battery's, uh, this battery is a fire risk. I'm really happy that that didn't happen. It's really nice that GoPro, the GoPro automatically shut off. Uh, or else, yeah, this thing definitely would have caught fire. This th the GoPro was hot to the touch the other day. Like it was, it was, it wasn't like burn your hand hot, but it was hot. Put it in the microwave to even it back out. You can do that on your own time. No, I know, I know, Tessa. If a lithium battery starts to swell and it cracks, and the lithium gets exposed to oxygen, well. <laughs> You can make rocket engines out of that.
don't know where to put this, guys. Uh, put it in front of the space heater. Yeah, if you're using it as a webcam. Yep. No? Don't put it in front of the space heater, Weave? Really? I got a microwave over there. You want to put it in that? Um... Fireproof. I'm just gonna keep this sucker on my desk because I know that that this room is climate controlled. I'll keep it there for the night, and I'll take it inside and we'll put it in a can or something. I've seen like yeah, I've seen, lithium. Lithium is very lithium really likes to react with oxygen. Yeah. To the point where I, I think it would, you know, chemists, correct me if I'm wrong, if there's any chemistry people watching this, but is lithium pyrophoric with oxygen? Yeah, I think it's pyrophoric, if I'm remembering correctly. Should probably put it in some rice. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, I'll leave that there. Uh, actually, you know what? I'll just go put it outside. I'll go put it outside. My driveway's gravel. I'll put it out there. Okay, it's outside and it's on a rock. Uh, it's sitting on a big slab of granite outside. Hero 5 manual says 5 volt 1 amp charger. It also says you, can, you can't record and charge the battery when you're powered off of a computer. Did you get the cluster in the truck working yesterday? No, Miller. But chat tipped the stream and got me a cluster. That we bought a cluster that's, work, that's going to work. I got in contact with the seller, guys. He said, yeah, he'll ship it to my house, which is good. And my fuel selector switch came in today, too. I would show you, but the, the whole GoPro thing is... Anyway, let's go back... Guys, I want to get, I want to get some of the roast that Brimo cooked while it's still hot. Would you guys uh, mind if I just put something on about the shuttle and took like a little break here? <laughs> 